Okay. Um, well, I guess not. Unless I unmuted it, but um, I'll go mute that, and then when we have everybody on, we'll do a little mic check. Sure.
a lot because it got a ton. Hi, can you hear us okay? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, and I can Sorry. go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then I'll go uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We Thank did you. it. We're done. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for coming to our talk. We can count to ten. <laughs> yeah. We are done.
Yeah. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our session around improving iteration in geo-distributed scenarios. Um, and special hello to everybody on the live stream today. We're so excited to be here. I'm Grace, I'm one of the senior product managers on the Unreal Engine team. And with me today I have Joachim, who's one of our senior programmers, also on the Unreal Engine team, as well as Phil TD from the Coalition. Um, here's a brief overview of some of the topics we're gonna cover in our talk today. So between making UE4 to UE5, we noticed some trends in how game development was changing. Um, on one end, we saw that pro uh, projects were getting bigger, so that's not only in the number of assets that were coming in, also the quality of the assets that were coming in. Um, then there was a set of challenges with this. Um, it was taking people more time to sync to these projects. Um, your team members were often running out of disk drive space and having to make hard decisions if you had multiple work streams going, maybe like a feature branch, and you also had maybe a release branch, you would get to a point where you were almost out of space and might have to unsync an entire workspace to make room for another one. Um, and this was very wasteful. Um, on the other side too, we also saw that teams were getting more distributed. So we had studios spinning up in multiple locations with people sometimes working from home or fully working from home. And of course, when the pandemic hit, we all turned into remote workers overnight. 
Um, so we too saw some of these challenges with the projects that we had here over at Epic. Um, there was no easy way to share work that you were doing amongst your other team members. So things like cooking content and having really good access to shared network caches, um, that wasn't really working very well anymore. So with UE5, we really sought out to fix some of these things and address them. On the side of projects getting bigger, we really want to find a way to allow people to sync to projects with much smaller data syncs so they could get that done faster. Um, and on the part of people getting more distributed and having people working from home, we really want to ensure that regardless of where you were, that uh, you would have a really good experience, whether you were working from home or in an office, and to be able to leverage the work of people around you. Part of my role as a product manager is I'm here for everyone in this room. I'm here to connect with you, to hear your feedback about what's working, what challenges you have, and bring that back to our dev team so that we could really make a roadmap that will address a lot of these things. Um, so here I've put a little sampling of some of the feedback I've heard when I was engaging with licensees and asking them what their challenges were, what they were thinking about their data sizes. Very unofficial poll here, but we also asked a few years out, where do you think your team members will be working? Are they gonna be in the office, a blend of the two, or fully from home? Um, and you, you can see here, it's very unofficial, but uh, you know, I think what we've seen is that hybrid and work from home is here to stay. So any investment we put into this space is really gonna help take us forward into the future. Um, so on the problem of projects getting bigger, what can we do about sync times? So we talked about some of the challenges that we're facing here. What we're introducing is something we're calling virtual assets. Um, what you can think of this as is um, it's an opt-in feature that you could choose to take on for your projects. We're taking U assets, which um, traditionally have kind of multiple parts of data in them, and we're splitting that up into two pieces. The first piece is gonna be the structured data piece, which is kind of that core metadata. It's usually quite small. And these are the things that the editor needs to represent that data. So you could think of things like thumbnails, properties that you would see in the editor. Um, and the point with virtual assets is most of your team will ever only need to sync to this very small piece and probably nothing more than that. Um, the part that we defer syncing on is what we're calling kind of that bulk unstructured data. Um, this is the part that generally is things like you can think of as pixel data, or if you're working with sound assets, it would be things like dot .wav files. Um, and we essentially don't sync to this unless if you actually need to update that bulk data. That's the only time that you'll actually retrieve it. Um, so that's about virtual assets. And the other thing to mention that's a benefit of this is we reference that bulk data through a hash key that's of the contents of the bulk data. So that means if you have multiple work streams and you have that same use asset that's appearing in multiple places unchanged, you're not gonna collect up multiple copies of that. It'll just be that one. So on the problem we had of teams getting more distributed, in the UE4 model, this is kind of what we had roughly. So you would have a studio somewhere, you'd set up a network drive probably, and share your cooked content amongst those team members. If you had another studio spin up somewhere else, they too would then have their own network share with also that DDC access there. Um, and if you had somebody working from home, unfortunately, um, although they could connect to one of those network shares, depending on how far they were and how good their network connection was, this wasn't great and it was probably slower than if you built actually and cooked the content yourself. Um, so that was not efficient. So the way that we're gonna address this is we're um, releasing something we're calling the Unreal Cloud DDC. Um, and I'll walk through this a little bit. So the way that it works is you're able to set up these cloud regions, kind of nodes that are closest to where your team members are. Um, and it allows anyone working from anywhere, even if you're working from home, to have a really quick connection to your DDC. Um, so what happens is if you're working fully from home, you'll find a region that's closest to you. That's where you could retrieve and also push up content for the rest of your team to share from. And that gets auto-replicated between the regions kind of behind the scenes. So if you're somewhere over in Europe, you're doing some work there, eventually someone over on North America will be able to access that. Um, a few things to kind of point out with this system is this too also um, benefits from this kind of deduplication of data that we're talking about because our DDC content is also referenced through a hash of the contents itself. You're also not carrying multiple copies of that content. Um, also, if you're still in a studio, you're probably gonna have a faster connection probably to your network drive, so this doesn't take away any of that. You could still leverage that first before then looking through to the Unreal Cloud DDC for content. So piecing it together, what does this look like when all of these pieces are working together? Um, so here's a little example of a workflow. 
Um, as a user, you would first sync up, let's say, to an asset. Uh, so again, you're syncing to a very small piece of that metadata we talked about, so this would be very quick. Next, let's say if you want to preview your project, you want to run it and see what the game looks like, you would then attempt to cook this asset. Um, at this point, you're going to try really hard to not have to do any work locally, so you're going to do a series of lookups, and we like to order these caches. You can configure them, um, but they're going to go from fastest access cache to slowest. So first, you're going to look locally to see if you have that available already. If you don't, you're going to then go to your office DDC, and then from there, then fall back to the UE Cloud DDC. Um, so something to note here is that uh, we do do a test on kind of trying to access these caches. So if you have a worker who's sometimes at home, sometimes in the office, and they're at office for that or at home for that day, um, when they go to look for things in the office DDC, they're the, our code's going to realize that uh, you don't have a good connection speed there, and then it's going to skip past that and go up. Um, from there, let's just say you know you've seen the game, you want to make some updates. Maybe you want to make that island a different uh, tint of green. Um, you would then proceed to check out the asset like you normally would, um, and then from there make the updates that you want to. At that point, you're going to go and attempt to cook that asset to get it ready for your target platforms. Um, so at this point in time, this is where you need uh, the bulk data that's coming in because you're actually manipulating and updating kind of what the asset looks like. Um, and we do something very similar here. You have a series of caches where you're going to go and look for that bulk data, um, starting with the local one and then working your way through to the Office DDC, the Unreal Cloud DDC, and really noting here that in most use cases, if you have an active project with an active team working on it, you're gonna have a pretty warm to hot cache. So this will actually be most of the use cases. You should be able to find content and bulk data um, through this series of caches. But as a last fallback, your data will always be stored in your source control, something like Perforce. Um, so if that bulk data is not there, you would then actually go to Perforce and retrieve that. Um, from there, now because you've actually made updates to the content, you're going to actually cook that. Um, and once that is done, if you're happy with, let's say, what's there, when you go to the commit step, you're going to push that bulk data that you made updates to back into source control, and then also back through, kind of in the background, um, it'll get submitted back through those series of caches so that it can be shared um, with the rest of the team. So quick recap, um, you know, I think we get the question a lot, like what should we actually use? Should our team, uh, you know, enable, take this? Um, so we have some notes here just around kind of um, the statuses of these pieces of tech and when you'd want to deploy them. Um, so for virtual assets, this is coming in in beta status for 5.1. That means that we've actually turned it on um, internally on projects here at Epic and uh, we're quite happy with the results, and it's ready for, I think, users and teams who want to try to dabble in this to turn it on and see how it could work for you. Um, with our Unreal Cloud DDC solution, um, we're putting this at experimental status for 5.1, which means if you're interested in having a look at it, experimenting and trying it out for your projects, um, you're free to go ahead and do that, and we have some light readme notes for that. Um, so some scenarios to help you decide whether or not you want to turn this on. Um, you know, on one end of the side here, we have scenario one, which is if you have a very small project, you have small assets, you know, not a lot of people working on, you know, something, these solutions are probably a little bit too much overhead for your project to have it all set up and some of the infrastructure you would need to get going. Um, in that case, we probably recommend, um, you know, getting the best hardware you can and then looking in other areas to improve uh, developer workflows. Um, on the other hand, uh, hand, kind of between scenarios two and three, this is where you get into places where some of your asset sizes might be getting bigger. So maybe you have a small team working in one studio uh, and you're starting to use Nanite and really generating larger assets. In that case, we think if you're all in one studio, having the cloud DDC wouldn't be as helpful. The network share probably would do a really good job there. Um, but virtual assets in that case would help users on your team get smaller data syncs. Um, and then moving on, if you have then team members that are distributed across different locations um, and uh, some people working from home for sure and in hybrid scenarios, Cloud DDC, Unreal Cloud DDC is what we would recommend there, but you might not have to turn on virtual assets if you think your data size is quite small and the assets are small. Um, and then lastly here, if you have multiple studios going, work from home and really big projects with lots of assets, you'll probably want to turn both of these on together. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Phil, who's going to tell us a little bit about the coalition uh, journey. Perfect. Thank you, Grace. Yes. Hey, everybody. So yeah, I'm going to go through a bit of a case study here at the coalition. Um, I'm going to give you a brief background of what the coalition is and who we are. 
Um, go through a bit of a history of kind of some of the development we did on Gears 5 to kind of really set the scene in the context around why we were so excited to kind of see this technology come online from Epic around virtual assets and the cloud DDC. And then go through some results actually of us actually adopting it, having running it in the studio right now, and kind of say share with that, share that with you folks today. So, brief intro about me. Um, I'm Phil. Uh, this is Debbie, our basset hound. I like this picture. When they ask me for a picture, I like this one because it's got our dog in it, which is cool. Um, I'm the engine technical director at the coalition. Um, I've worked at Xbox for over 15 years. Oh, um, uh, at three different game studios. And I've got about 10 years of kind of professional experience with Unreal, mainly around UE4 and now UE5, a bit of UE2 back in the day. So, so who are we at the Coalition? So we are uh, Microsoft First Party Development Studio located in Vancouver, Canada. We're the official home of the Gears of War franchise, you probably know this. Um, and our objective is really to forge the future of the IP and to push the limits um, of Microsoft's entertainment platforms and devices. Um, and our team is comprised of like a deep creative uh, set of folks of lots of technical talents, um, and we really just basically cohesively try to pull all these great talents together to really delight our customers and really surpass our expectations of what it is to make a game like Gears of War. So developing with Unreal, so look, looking back, like we have a long history of using Unreal as a studio. Um, we've shipped a lot of titles like Gears Ultimate, Gears 4, Gears 5, Gears Tactics. Um, and we have like say a deep knowledge of using UE4 and now into UE5. Um, we have just generally the way that we work, we've always engaged with external partners to kind of like, you know, augment the talent that we have at our studio. So we're kind of very, you know, akin to kind of like, how do we get Unreal to work outside of our studio? And because of this, our, our, our engine team that I manage um, are really good at kind of making our tools and workflows work with external partners. And that kind of sets the ground for a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about today. Um, but however, like most of us, I think, you know, these things work very good when you're on-prem on the main site and they always kind of work best in that scenario, regardless of like how hard we try to kind of make these things work for our external partners. So going kind of through to Gears 5 developments, again, just to set some context here. So the coalition roughly had about 350 people on-prem up in Vancouver, and we worked with roughly 12 external partners all around the world, like basically any time zone you can think of, we covered quite a few of them. Um, we're definitely, from what Grace talked about, we're definitely a Scenario 4 studio. We have a lot of folks working on the project. We probably had about roughly 1,500 people in total uh, working on Gears 5 over the full course of the development. Um, we had massive content sizes. Um, going through some stats here, which are really interesting. We had roughly 23 terabytes of raw content per branch, which is kind of insane. We're talking things like, you know, PSDs, ZBrush files, FBXs, a lot of stuff that goes in there. Um, our content fold was about 2.1 terabytes on disk. Um, and we also then had a lot of branches. Obviously, when you're shipping a AAA game, you're gonna have your dev branches, your release branches, your, you know, going into CERT, your retail branches, things like that. Um, you know, we did that for a lot of our release pipeline um, and a lot of hardening branches as well as we went through development. Um, we created a lot of branches for things like, you know, title updates or DLC, again, just to isolate the team to make sure that we can kind of do this, do this work and not affect the folks who are working in, uh, you know, things like the main branch. Um, and then, you know, when we did things like major system overhauls, again, we branched again, and thinking about these, like, content sizes and these raw sizes, all of this was duplicated, essentially, on disk when people had to go and sync one of those branches. Um, and then looking at kind of our infrastructure, and it's a little small, I apologize, but um, what we did on Gears 5 is we actually didn't have a really good way of distributing content or, um, or sorry, we didn't have a good way of distributing all of our, all of our information to our partners, so we actually used Perforce as our, my, our primary way of getting information to our partners. So they didn't necessarily just always take, you know, things like code and content from Perforce. We actually put all of our tooling in there, all of our, um, you know, things they would have to use from a day-to-day -day basis. And we even did weird things like take P4 labels and augment them with special information so that, you know, our primary external partners could really just use Perforce for lots of different things um, to basically make it as smooth as possible when they're working with us. So I'm um, gonna say a good picture of kind of where, how geo-distributed we were. Um, and this is kind of just a sneak peek of kind of how our infrastructure was set up internally. Like most of you, you probably have like an internal network if you're using Unreal. We had our internal users on a really fast network connecting to things like our P4 server, you know, applications and services, build a compute farms and things like that. And then for our external partners, unfortunately, the only path they had to get access to some of this information was through a P4 broker. Um, and a P4 proxy that they set up locally. So again, if you're on site, you had this amazing network with all this amazing content that you could use and services. And then for our partners, they really only had this one route to kind of get into, uh, 
to get access to our data. So, um, and then kind of like digging down a little bit further. So what this meant was that if a partner really wanted to work with us and have a good setup, they basically had to duplicate a lot of the same infrastructure that we set up locally, which you know was okay, but it did cause a few problems. So this is an example like at the coalition, we had our main peripheral server. We actually introduced something called Signient, which is actually like a file share replication system, which helped a little bit to kind of take a little bit of pressure off Perforce. But it meant that a lot of our external partners had to set up things like local compute for shader compiling, you know, derived data cache equivalent, um, you know, and their proxies and things like that. And then we tried to shuffle as much information as we could over to their site to really just keep them up and running and reduce the amount of local infrastructure that they actually needed to set up themselves. But as you might imagine, this actually caused a lot of pain points for us and our partners. Um, you know, the biggest one that we found uh, that was an issue for them was access to computes and a hot DDC. So, you know, you think of an example like, you know, one of your rendering engineers or maybe one of your tech artists goes through and makes a, a change to your base shader. That's gonna cause a lot of shader compiles across the board. Um, and what would happen is that we would submit that back to Perforce and if we couldn't get our partners a hot DDC, they'd spend a lot of time locally basically computing the same information again and again. Um, so that was definitely a pain point for a lot of our partners and it caused a lot of slowdowns. Another one, obviously we looked at our disk size or our branch sizes. Disk space was an issue for a lot of people. Like, you know, Unreal works very well if you're on an SSD or an NVMe drive. Um, but when we started kind of bleeding into multiple branches, we had to actually write our own little tool. We called it Mr. Junction. They don't let me name things anymore because that's an awful <laughs> name. Um, but basically it's a junction your your content across multiple drives purely because our, our branch sizes were so large. Um, and a lot of our partners really had to kind of fall back to spinning disks, which again is not ideal with Unreal. Uh, we had a lot of problems with geolocation. So like the, the you know, time zone differences and actually people setting up their own infrastructure locally really meant it was quite difficult for my team to actually support them. So we, we didn't really know like did they have a hot DDC, did they have like local compute working? And we had to spend a lot of time diagnosing these issues, which again, because we couldn't control or own that, that stuff, it was definitely a problem. Uh, and then bandwidth, you know, obviously we were submitting a lot of content. Sometimes we'd submit terabytes of content a day. And I think the, the, the worst I saw was about 500 gigs an hour. And so, you know, they were sinking down a lot of content just to work. And as we probably all aware, things like code data dependencies on real are a problem. And if you don't have the latest code and content, sometimes it's very, very difficult to actually work with the editor and it can cause things like crashing. So, you know, it definitely was an issue for, for a lot of our partners. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not all doom and gloom, I get it. Like, you know, we did actually ship a lot of uh, good games using these workflows, but we definitely, uh, you know, had to manage a lot of very unique setups outside the studio, and it's something that we were very, very cognizant of and try to constantly keep improving, so. And then the pandemic hit, like most of us, you know, it definitely threw a lot of, you know, spanners in the works there. So it really did change how we thought about development um, when that hit, and I'm sure a lot of you folks have the similar stories. Um, Basically, we started dealing with not just the external partners, but now a lot of remote workers where traditionally everyone would come in the office, would have all this you know, access to great stuff, and that changed overnight, essentially. Um, some challenges were very similar, like you know, you've got an external partner, they need to access the stuff. So a lot of the infrastructure that we built initially for external partners worked, but a lot of new things came up. You know, the idea of having a partner um, of a certain size with you know, access to local computers, awesome, but then when you've got lots of individuals who are just one person at home, it's very, very different. You can't just replicate all that infrastructure for every single person at home is what we found. It's very expensive and doesn't work very well. Um, but it definitely gave us a good appreciation of things and workflows that didn't scale and didn't work very well when we were offsite. And yeah, I kind of covered this already, but yeah, remote workers have wanted just very different challenges compared to say external partner studios. Um, and then like most people I think in the room, we scrambled to try to find solutions to these problems um, we did very naive approaches when we first started. We did things like, you know, hey, you get access to a VPN and just remote desktop into your machine on site. Kind of works for very simple solutions. But then what we found is that things like very, very latency sensitive uh, workflows, like, you know, art workflows or, um, you know, using things like, you know, my emotion builder, using the editor, people really didn't like that. Um, so we actually started to move a lot of more resources into the cloud so people could work on local workstations at home. Um, and our, our mantra is always that everyone needs to be as effective as possible, uh, regardless of where they are. So kind of bringing us forward a little bit to transition to UE5. We've actually transitioned to UE5 for our next project. There's, I'm sure you know, there's lots of great, great talks here at the conference, but there's been a lot of great improvements to the engine, assets, workflows, you know, fidelity, all that kind of great stuff is there. Um, you know, 
The little example I have here is like this is you know, build out geometry, which you wouldn't have done this before, this little picture from one of our artists. Um, but what we found is actually a lot of the similar workflow problems that we faced with in terms of the DDC, et cetera, still remained actually when we first took on UE5. So, you know, and if we all look, like, you know, the, the content fidelity and asset sizes have actually got a lot bigger. If you look at things like Nanite, you know, things like textures, they're, they're getting larger, which is actually going to exacerbate some of these problems. So we were super excited when we heard about um, virtual assets and the Emerald Cloud DDC, and you could see what challenges these could solve for us, or what problems these could solve for us, for, sorry. So going through a little bit of our adoption of virtual assets now and kind of the, what we found. So we had some success criteria we wanted to look at based on um, some of the stuff that Grace has already talked about. So we really wanted to reduce the amount of time the team spent syncing every day. You know, it's just a classic thing we all hit. Um, you know, we wanted to see these, these savings scale over multiple branches. We had a lot of problems where people would just duplicate branches. We did do things like perforce stream switching, which does help, but it's definitely not something that which is traditionally done at our studio. And we really wanted to reduce the overall disk size requirement for both, you know, users and build machines. You know, we have a lot of branches. It's something that just kind of scale, doesn't scale out very well for us. So, and we really wanted it to be not noticeable when people were working with assets, like if it had a massive delay or lags, et cetera, it's probably not gonna be good for people's workflows. So looking at the setup, we actually, it was great that we kind of went through, and it's really easy to set up um, and store the bulk data in both Perforce and in the Cloud DDC, which was great when we kind of had this set up. Um, you know, what we've done, we've actually kind of split our, our payloads where you store them in Perforce in a different directory or a different stream to where users sync every day. You don't want people syncing to that stuff as their you know, traditional normal syncing. Um, and then you need to make sure that you know, when you set this stuff up, that everyone has permissions to submit the data back into Perforce, regardless of where you pick, pick uh, to put it. And as I say, we store our, our bulk data in virtual assets with our setup. Um, in, it's per project for us, but you could actually push it higher in Perforce to actually increase the amount of deduplication that you have. Because if you, you know, have multiple branches and all they'll point to the same data, then it's obviously deduplicated across all of those branches, which is really exciting. Um, and it does require at the moment that the Unreal Editor has a valid Perforce connection just so it can go and find Perforce as a backup, uh, all that bulk data as a backup and submit it back. Um, and then, as it might make sense, you need to make sure that your payloads are submitted to Perforce before the virtualized assets are put in so that if someone does sync down a virtual asset and needs to get the bulk data, it's there for them to get. So looking at the rollout, we actually we did it in two phases. Uh, we did a bit of testing just to make sure. I know Epic themselves have been using it, which is awesome, but we wanted to make sure that it kind of worked for us. So. We tested this in isolation um, in a branch with both the textures, which is officially supported, and with static meshes as well, which I know aren't officially supported, but we're just curious um, because our project's got a lot of nanites in it now. We really want to see how it worked. So basically to roll it out, we basically went through and we saved all our packages. So it actually splits the asset into the bulk data payload portion and the metadata portion that Grace alluded to earlier. And then there's a great little tool actually that's in Unreal, which is called the uh, Unreal Virtualization Tool that basically can give you the ability to run virtualized and devirtualized content um, in an unintended manner. So, and then we went through and we uh, basically picked folders one at a time and basically virtualized textures uh, just to kind of see how it works. Um, and then what we did as well for our users to start with is actually disable virtualization on submit just to kind of make sure everything was working as intended. Um, and then we're very metrics driven at the coalition, so we actually made sure that everything was working. Before then, we extended this to go a little bit further um, across more and more folders in our project. And then personally for us, we're actually integrating the virtualization into our local validation tooling so that when people do a validation locally on their content, it'll then virtualize the asset and then submit it back for them. And because of metrics driven, was actually tracking every single, this is just one asset that we had, making sure that everything was actually working intended and that people could pull and push the payloads um, when they were working with virtual assets. So the bit you've all been waiting for, I think the results. So we're actually seeing a typical file size once things have been virtualized down to like 0 0.1 megabytes, which is impressive. We have some um, you know, skybox textures and things like that, which are three or 400 megabytes, but they, they reduced down to this size, which is like 0.15% of the original size. Hydration hasn't been noticeable, which is great, so when you need to get that bulk data back, it's been pretty fast for people, which is awesome, and we're super excited by the savings. So this is our current project that we have, and we actually had a disk saving of about 38 gigabytes to start with. Um, we use a lot of Nanite, so that's gonna, we're very excited if that's come online, but it's definitely something that has been a huge improvement. Um, and then going forwards, actually projecting back to Gears 5, we would have probably saved about 690 gigabytes of disk space, probably higher. We actually have our own material masking solution which stores a bunch of textures. 
Um, so if it could have supported that as well, it's probably yeah, some, somewhere in the region of probably like maybe even 80% of our disk footprint would have been virtualized away, which is pretty exciting. Um, and again, we couldn't imagine the total sync times we would have saved over the course of all the branches and all the projects. It's just something we couldn't you know, calculate, but it would have been huge. Um, and we're very, yeah, very much looking forward to the other asset types that can be supported in the future with this solution. Um, and then just last piece of information, we found that textures are super low churn for our project. About 50% of our textures only ever had one revision. So imagine you're syncing this all the time, but um, you know, they never change. And then 74% of our um, textures only had like two revisions. So again, super low churn rate, a lot of savings there to be had. So, so moving on now to the, the cloud DDC adoption they went through, similarly, we looked at some su success criteria for adopting this technology. So we really wanted to make sure that we could improve developer efficiency with Unreal when they were working outside of the office. Obviously inside the office it's great, but outside has been a, definitely a problem for us. We really wanted to also reduce the, the need for that local compute we talked about earlier. We really didn't want our partners having, having to have big compute firms just to support things like shader compiles and things like that. And we also wanted to reduce our reliance on a VPN. We really didn't like the fact that people had to connect through the VPN because ours, ours is quite slow and causes quite a lot of problems for us. And we also wanted to deprecate some of our old tooling. We had this really janky DDC replication solution we had with zip files. We really wanted to get rid of that if the solution was good. So to go through a bit of the setup, this is kind of the exciting one. We say we collaborate with Epic to stand this technology up in Azure. Um, Traditionally, Epic are running this in AWS, but it's kind of great to do a collaboration and partnership with them. It did require dedicated engineers on our side with knowledge of Unreal, of cloud-based infrastructure, and definitely authentication, because this is public internet facing for how we've set this up. Um, and we, uh, I think Grace alluded to earlier, we've defined a backend graph which points to the cloud um, and to a file share DDC, so it basically tries to connect to each one of those, finds the fastest, and goes and uses that one. Um, and the choice is made based on, yeah, things like accessibility and latency. So it does, and from what we found, I think 99% of the time, it does pick the right graph, so users do get the best experience. And Microsoft is actually looking to create a marketplace offering uh, for Azure users. So if you're interested, there's a QR code, there's a blog to follow, um, and we're trying to make this as turnkey as possible so folks can just stand this up and use this out of the box, which is awesome. So then looking at the rollout again, we, we did this in two phases. So during testing, um, we started in a separate P4 branch and fully tested the Azure infrastructure that we built to kind of make this work. Uh, we brought in several users to test, especially in those in remote locations. We were very fortunate that we've got you know, teams that work remotely and we tried kind of all over the world just to kind of people to kind of hit the solution and see how it worked for them. And then we did some testing around things like asking users to run with like hot and cold caches with both a VPN connection and with the cloud DDC enabled to see how that worked. And then we gathered a lot of stats. We say we're very stats driven at the coalition. We like gathering data just to see how it was working for them. And then once we gathered all those stats and we were happy with what we were seeing, we went through the rollout phase where we basically applied this as an opt-in test in our mainline branch. We then monitored and, and users as they enabled it just again to see that everything was working. No one was actually experiencing any problems. Um, and then based on what we're seeing, the system is definitely picking the, the right DDC based on access and latency, which is great. Um, and we've currently rolled this out to two data centers re replication enabled, which is great. So that all, that all that infrastructure is set up and running like Grace showed earlier. And I know this is very small, I apologize, but yeah, we, we, we track all of, our, um, all of our stats internally and really just wanted to make sure like how many, how many times people are being like prompted for things like authentication, making sure they are hitting the right um, DDC based on where they are, if they're on-prem and on the local network versus you know, at home and hitting the cloud DDC, and the results have been great for that. So, so getting to the actual results then from you know, what people were seeing. So based on editor startup with uh, clean local caches, we're finding that the, the cloud-based DDC is actually two times faster than accessing the file share through a VPN, which is amazing. Like That's definitely a huge win for us. And then, like you might, might expect, you know, we did try this, but you know, it's actually two times slower with Cloud DDC that, um, than accessing the file share if you're on-prem. But again, you're on the fast network, you can connect to the SMB share, that's expected. We just wanted to make sure that everything was working and we got the results we expected. We didn't compare the editor without using any shared cache, because as we all know, that's probably pretty terrible. You're gonna be compiling shaders and just waiting a lot. Um, so we didn't, didn't bother testing that. Um, and then we also found that cooking showed very, very similar speed ups, which is great. Um, 
Um, and the good thing for this is that you know, it kind of just works for everybody. Like once we'd set this up and then we had the ability to connect with this graph back to the, um, the Unreal Cloud DDC, it just kind of was very, very turnkey for people, especially compared to our old solutions where people had to do things like copy a zip from you know, a location, we had a few tools around it, but it basically just made it very, very simple for that setup, which was a huge problem in the past, especially working with external partners. And looking at it now, like the costs for us, it's about $31 per user per month for the two data centers that we run at the moment. Um, and this is my favorite quote that I got from somebody random, and again, you know, it's, we don't usually do just you know, people sending us quotes, but somebody found that their cook time came from 2.5 hours to 30 minutes based on you know, connecting to this solution. So these are the great kind of comments we've been seeing and hearing from our users as they've been uh, using this stuff. So just to wrap up, a few key takeaways. Um, it definitely really has helped improve our remote working experience, which is great to see. Um, it's reduced our sync times and bandwidth requirements based on virtualizing content. It really has lowered that need for local compute. People no longer have to do this. They can actually just access all of that stuff up in the cloud DDC. Um, and overall, it's reduced our disk requirements across all the branches that we have. And I say, as we grow, it's gonna be definitely seen even more. Um, and it's a native solution to the engine, which is awesome. We had a lot of custom solutions in the past to try to solve this, and it's just great that it's just there. Um, and it feels great, like we're engineers, we love removing legacy and old stuff, so we actually got to remove a lot of stuff we had at the coalition just to kind of support our old workflows. Um, and then one of our takeaways was that it actually, we would suggest if you were gonna do this, like to, un to set up the Unreal Cloud DDC first, because it makes setting up the virtualized assets much easier and you can use the Cloud DDC as this payload um, option as well. Um, and this works due to how globally distributed we are. It's just one, you know, we are definitely a scenario four. We've got a lot of people around the world and it definitely works for us because of the number of people we have connecting to this stuff, so. So with that, I will hand it over to Joachim, who's gonna give you, a, you know, a breakdown of the Unreal Cloud DDC. Right, hey everyone. So I'm gonna go into some more technical details about how Unreal Cloud DDC works. Uh, so Unreal Cloud DDC is, uh, is actually a generic uh, structured storage system, so it's not built specifically for DDC, uh, but that's what we primarily use it for at Epic. Um, so what I mean by that is, with the structured part, is that we work on uh, key value objects uh, that we call compact binary objects, so think of them like a JSON object, uh, but they uh, have a better, we have a, it's a better binary, more efficient binary representation of it and a richer typing system as well. So a couple of features added on that, kind of. One of these types of, of um, uh, type, uh, one of these types that we've added is called an attachment, uh, which lets you reference a payload by its hash, so it's content addressed, which means you get like a structured object of a key value, and then that's a reference to a big thing, like a texture or a mesh or something like that. <coughs> and these things are stored in in a content addressed store, meaning they're addressed by the hash of the content as well. So we get a natural deduplication there where uh, we only need to store the payload once. Content addressable store is also super valuable from a replication perspective because we can quickly determine that we already have this object, don't need to replicate it again. Another feature that we do need uh, when you're working with DDC specifically is a general mapping from key to value because you need to map from the DDC key to the output object. So that's also a feature that we do have. And uh, we map it via a hash to the output object. Uh, and the, we also have something which we call namespaces, which essentially allows you to do multi-tenancy. So you can set up Unreal Cloud DDC once for your entire studio and have multiple projects in it. So the namespace lets you control access, so different users have access to different parts. And then we have a feature called storage pools that lets you configure how the deduplication storage works in relation to the namespaces. So you can configure it in a way where every project writes to the same storage pool, so same S3 bucket, and then you get full deduplication across all of your different projects. Or if you're more concerned about that, you could also set it up so that each project writes to its own S3 bucket. Maybe you want to do that for billing reasons or something like that, which you can also do. So you have full flexibility in terms of how you want to, uh, how you want to sort of weigh those two things. And then as we're writing this, like this is a lot of data that goes into the system, a lot of churn in the DDC. Uh, so we have built-in garbage collection as well, so it will automatically remove objects that haven't been used for a long while. We do this by doing uh, lost access tracking, so whenever someone accesses the cache key, we just store that that's been accessed, and then we can delete that when an object hasn't been accessed for a certain period of time. We run 30 days uh, as our, uh, sort of how long we keep it around, but that's configurable, you can do whatever you want. 
let's have a look at the architecture here. Uh, so you can see the Unreal Engine there on the bottom left. Uh, that's like the editor or the cooker, something like that, that connects to the DDC. It will connect using HTTPS to our web API. So that's the source code uh, that is like the Unreal Cloud DDC. Uh, and that has a few components that it needs. Uh, first off, it needs a database uh, to store the reference mapping, essentially. So it stores a really small payload that is just essentially like information about what uh, else exists. Uh, for that, we use Scylla, which is a Cassandra-compatible database. It's essentially a rewrite of Cassandra in a more efficient way. Um, it's super, super performant and supports global replication as well. Uh, so it's super good. Uh, and then outside of uh, having to set up Scylla, uh, it's actually good to mention that Scylla can be a bit of a hassle because it's Linux only. Uh, uh, so you kind of have to set that up. There's some good resources available from them to set it up on your cloud providers. There's, they have a managed offering as well if you want to do, use that. We use the open source version, which is free, uh, so that's great as well, uh, no licensing cost, but it is a bit more effort to manage that. So then we have the shared storage, which is where all the blobs go, so that's the blob storage. This gets really, really large. Um, you know, I think ours is 40, 50 terabytes or something like that right now. Uh, so that's an S3 bucket uh, if you, for us on AWS. Uh, we also support Azure Blob Storage, so uh, that's what the coalition guys use. Uh, this is a super simple part, and it's not a lot of code, so it's easy to add more if you have some particular type of, of storage that you want to use. Uh, it, we can also just write it to a file system if you have a need for that, say you're on-prem or something like that. But it, it, it is a problem that you know you need something that has elasticity so that you can grow. You don't want to run out of disk space there. Uh, so uh, anyway. That's, uh, that's what we use, we use S3 for that. Uh, the problem with S3 is that it's not particularly performant, like it's quite slow uh, to fetch stuff from it. Uh, so we need to cache uh, stuff in front of it. So we have a local cache in front of uh, S3, uh, which is essentially an NVMe drive attached to every web API server. Uh, for us, that's about a seven terabyte storage per uh, machine, which gives us essentially mo our entire working set for most of the week is, is like live data on an NVMe cache that you can serve directly. So that's quite performant. Uh, and that's one thing to note about DDC workload in general. It's very latency sensitive, partially because of how the editor works, where you know you need to retrieve data uh, quickly to figure out if you should be cooking or not. So uh, it's sort of like, yeah, you do kind of need to be thinking about latency here. That goes into the whole idea of geo-replication and how it's set up as well. You kind of want a decent distribution of nodes so that it's not too far away from users. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to mention here on this slide, you can see uh, region B down there on the, on the lower right. The point there is to show that this is, you know, it's, you have the same infrastructure in every region. So you get like a full copy in every region, kind of. And then in the middle, you can see the, the auth setup, which I'm gonna go talk a bit more about next. So the idea here is we run Unreal Cloud EDC on, uh, you know, on public internet. Uh, we avoid VPN. And the reason for that is there's multiple reasons. VPN tends to introduce complicated routing, which includes, increases the latency, and is typically a problem. But also bandwidth issues can be, a pro, uh, can be a concern. And it's just generally annoying for users to have to be on like the VPN. So we run this on public internet, which means we need to secure it. Uh, so what we do is we have hooked it up to uh, OIDC, OpenID Connect. So you can hook it up to any identity provider you might have. You know, your single sign-on system, your Azure AD, Okta, whatever you use. Uh, so for us, what happens is the editor uh, will su support interactive login. It uses auth code with Pixie. So users will essentially get prompted with their normal uh, Okta login, you know, type in your password, do your multi-factor thing, and that will uh, log you in. Uh, we do also support uh, client credentials if you don't want to have an interactive login, but that's not as secure. And we can also disable all of this if you want to, if you're on-prem or something, you, don't, you, you trust your network. It's probably not a good idea to do that, but you can for development purposes, if nothing else. Uh, and the last thing to note, so everything is uh, referenced by hash, right? So you, you need to know the cache key to be able to fetch content. Uh, that gives some level of security because there's an obfuscation layer there. Uh, but we also made sure that there are no endpoints that allows you to pub, like enumerate the content, uh, meaning you would actually really need to know the content on top of having the, the token to be able to even access these things, which also gives some layer of security on top of what you would normally get. Right, so talking about the deployment at Epic then. You can, uh, you can see here I color-coded like a distribution of where we have users. So you can see we're kind of heavily on the North American side. So we have two regions there, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. And uh, then we have one deployment in Europe, one deployment in Korea, and then one deployment in Australia as well. 
uh, so we have about a thousand machines hitting this uh, every day, and uh, the total cost for us ends up being about $35 per user uh, per month. And that is uh, not the most fair way of calculating this because uh, the, the region in Australia is much more expensive you know, per user because we have fewer users there. It's like a fairly high base cost, about $3,000 per region for us, and then you know, the more users you have there. So there is a bit of a trade-off between number of users and, and performance. Uh, and the primary reason it, it works like that is because of uh, the fact that we want this like MME caches and full copy of S3 and so on, right? So it's, we're, and we actually have like lots of uh, like f redundancy for each region as well, like multiple copies of everything. So uh, we've definitely, you know, tended more towards availability and performance rather than cost in this case. So if you wanted to, you might be able to push this down uh, to a lower cost if that was a priority. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, five regions. We serve 40 million cache key lookups a day, and that, there's more web requests than that. That's just the, the cache key lookup itself, and then a few other things happen. And for us, we store about 30 terabytes right now. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to see like, how that, the duplication ends up as well. We have certain cases where you know, we have 30, 40, 50 copies of the same cache key being only stored once. And in, in like a setup where we're storing this by the DDC cache key, uh, you would have ended up duplicating this 50 times, right? So uh, the, the content addressable store does really help a bit in terms of deduplicating efforts. Right, so I'm just gonna quickly talk about how the replication works as well, because this tends to be what we get the most questions of. Uh, so there's essentially two phases to the replication. Uh, first off, when you write something into Scylla, so you do, uh, write a new ref, uh, Scylla will replicate that. That part is super small, it's 150 bytes or something like that, I think. Uh, so, you know, that gets replicated pretty much instantaneously, within a second everywhere across the world. Uh, so, that, you will know immediately that the cache key has been written, but you won't have the actual payloads. You won't have access to the texture, right? So, the texture or mesh or whatever you're adding, uh, that is managed by the blob replication, which is, which is a built-in feature in Unreal Cloud EDC. So, we do that ourselves. Uh, and the reason we do that is so that we can have a bit more control over exactly how the replication happens. The blob replication, there's two ways that that can happen. There's an on-demand mode and a speculative mode. The on-demand mode essentially means if I'm connecting in, in Sydney, trying to fetch the texture, it doesn't exist, it will connect to US East 1 where it existed, pull it down, and then serve it to the user. It's super slow, it's not particularly good, uh, but it leads to a, a view, like a consistent view in terms of which blobs exist. Uh, we don't really use that for DDC. It exists mostly for other use cases that we are, are not talking about today, but it's good to know that it exists. The, do, the mode that we do use for DDC is the speculative replication. So that is essentially building a journal of all the ref keys that gets added in one region uh, as they go, and then every other region will just read this journal, assume that it needs all of those things and replicate all of them. And that's per namespace, so you can configure if certain namespaces are replicated or not, uh, but other than that, it's just gonna try and pull down everything, assuming that you need everything. And this journal is only two weeks worth of data. Typically, when you have uh, uh, the DDC data, you know, the data that got added at the beginning of time, six months ago, two years ago, that's not ne necessarily interesting anymore. So we only keep a small part of it around, and that's the data that we replicate. The good thing about DDC is if there's ever a cache miss locally, the worst case is people will just build it locally, upload it to the DDC, and since it's content addressed, it's the same result as if we'd replicated this. So it's still consistent everywhere. So worst case, users just end up building it locally, which is a case we want to avoid, but it's not a catastrophe. Right, thank you. I'm gonna leave it over to Grace to talk about our roadmaps. Awesome, so like as a product manager, I love roadmaps. This is my most exciting part of the presentation. I hope everyone's excited too. Um, so a little bit of a preview of what's coming. So for 5.1, we said virtual assets is coming in in beta status, that means you know, it's ready for you to start turning on and trying on in your projects. Um, currently for source control, we support Perforce, um, and out of the box, we support textures and audio asset types, with more to come in the future. Um, right now, we also have a few different ways that you could turn on virtual assets. You could choose to, let's say, maybe set certain packages where you opt in or opt out certain things to try that out first. Or you could actually go and select an asset type and say, maybe I just want textures for my entire project to be virtualized. That could be a route you take as well. Um, we also have a feature where you can configure um, the min size for what would be considered a candidate for virtualization. For us, we found that half a meg roughly is kind of a really good benchmark that kind of weighs file sizes that aren't too small 
Um, and that lets us virtualize about 30% or so of some of the assets that we ran through um, for internal projects, and that worked well. Um, the other thing we have too is we have the option for you to um, de-virtualize or what we call rehydrate after you've virtualized a project. So this is normally um, useful if you actually sim ship samples, let's say, to end users. You'll want to stitch back everything you've virtualized into kind of whole new assets. Um, that's going to be ready for 5.1. Um, we will have this mentioned in more details in the release notes as well. We're looking to push out a dev blog, so definitely check that out. So next on our radar, we've heard Nanite come out a few times now. That's definitely on our radar, something we're working on in progress. Um, the other thing that's really big as well for us is we want to work on something we're calling work offline mode. We alluded to the fact that you actually need an active perforce connection for being able to retrieve things like bulk data. Um, and what work offline mode will enable you to do is if you have a scenario where you know you're going to have a bad network connection, let's say you're traveling somewhere, but you want to be able to do some work, you could actually opt to sync ahead of time and kind of get the bulk data that you need. So that's what we're working on next. Other things that are further down the line but um, under consideration, we're looking at other source control support. This is where your feedback's really valuable to us. Um, I'm here to hear kind of your needs where everyone else is. Um, as an example, we think Git might be next on our target down the road. Um, also other asset type support. So we really started off with the high like ROI asset types where we knew people had lots of these types and wanted to kind of tackle them. There are other things like skeletal meshes and beyond. So definitely if your project has, you know, asset types uh, that aren't listed on this list and uh, you want to flag that to us, please come find me. So next for the um, Unreal Cloud DDC, again, this is an experimental status, which is kind of interesting. Um, on one perspective, it's not experimental because we've been using internally on our projects at Epic. Fortnite uses this. We also use it on the Matrix Awakens experience. Um, so in many ways, uh, all of these features you see listed in 5.1, as well as uh, the fact that we've been using internally and have shipped projects on it, it's not experimental from that perspective. However, the setup process right now isn't quite where we want it to be. We want to give a lot more of a turnkey solution uh, to our licensees that want to turn this on for their projects, and it's not quite there yet. Um, so uh, kind of what's next on our roadmap here is just making sure that we really kind of double down on that setup experience and take those findings that we got from the coalition to really tighten that process up, as well as we talked about working with other cloud providers uh, to provide uh, solutions in the marketplace so that you could choose the best cl cloud provider for your projects. Um, and under consideration here, um, we had a few other ideas that are a little bit further out, but just to give you an idea of some things we're thinking about, um, this can evolve from being just the Unreal Cloud DDC to being kind of more than that and being more of a general purpose storage. Um, so things like having build results that are happening on the build farm, having those intermediate results being stored onto a system like this one, as well as maybe one day if we split out texture builds and do remote texture building, we could have in store some of those inputs and outputs also in a system like this. Um, so those are definitely things that are under consideration. And again, we'd love to hear your feedback if you have thoughts on these topics. Um, so with that, you know, I want to give a big thank you to Phil and the team over at the coalition. Like your feedback and that collaboration we have going has been so helpful for our team to help shape what we're going to do next. Um, I also wanted to do a quick shout out for Paul Chipchase, who's one of our uh, lead programmers on virtual assets. He couldn't make it out today, but I'm sure he's on the live stream watching us. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time today and joining us. So um, unfortunately, we don't have a ton of time for questions, but definitely feel free to reach out to any of us, I would say, during the rest of the conference. If you want to talk more or if you have more questions, we'd love to talk with everyone. Thank you.
A minute, yeah. Oh, I'm on. Hey, everyone. <laughs> we won't start just yet, in about a minute. We'll kick off. Cool. G'day, everyone. I am Jack Condon, and I'm an evangelist working for Epic Games. I live in Australia, and it's really cool to be able to come over to the USA to be at Unreal Fest. So, hello, everyone. Um, today, we're going to be talking about working with data in Unreal Engine. So, uh, what is this talk? Well, we're going to be looking at different ways we can sort of manage data within Unreal Engine. The focus is gonna be on holding data in ways that allow better collaboration with designers. And ultimately, something that I'd like to get is better empathy as well. The aim is not only to educate programmers on the new tools or tools that are available in the engine, but also potentially to allow artists and designers to see potential workflows that they could implement themselves or request. I guess the ultimate goal, though, would be to try to understand the considerations of different methods in line with whatever project requirements you have, which I'll dive into a bit later. So how to get the most out of this talk? Well, I wanted to make the point that it's about awareness, okay? And, and by that I mean I'm gonna be moving through content really, really fast. Uh, if you don't capture a sp specific bit of syntax or something like that, don't you worry, okay? Because that's, that's not really the point of this. It's really to understand the bigger picture of how all this fits together. Um, so. I guess that's another way of saying I hope you've had your morning coffee. I would encourage you, however, to compensate for this. I want you to use your phones during this presentation. So I've littered it with QR codes um, throughout the presentation that if you want to go dive deep in something, you totally can, right? What I want you to do is conceptualize this like a shopping list, uh, like a shopping aisle, and anything that you want to pick up and explore later, just grab the QR code, put it in your little imaginary cart, and look at it later. And also, I mean, if you see something that you already know, Maybe you can consider that like bingo and just kind of check it off in your head. So the agenda for today, we're gonna be defining problems and considerations when we talk about data-driven design and how we might wanna think about data. Um, we're gonna be looking at data tables and uh, composite data tables. Ignore combined data tables, that's wrong. Uh, JSON and HTTP requests, your objects and data assets, curve tables, the data registry, and I'm gonna leave you with a few other resources. So what do we need to think about when we first start a project and we're thinking about data-driven design. What are all the considerations? I wanted to warm up today by kind of throwing a few questions that you need to consider, but obviously there is a lot more that we need to comprehend when we go into the beginning of a project. So let's have a look at some. Uh, probably, probably the biggest one and the first one I'd talk about is how do you construct systems that minimize onboarding? How do you construct systems that have system transparency? And what I mean by system transparency is I wanna talk about a relatable feeling when you go into a project, maybe after the first two months it's already been running, you're kind of getting an idea of the systems and you're like, I want to do my job, but I also don't want to break the build and be in trouble by everyone. And so what we want to do is make tools that can communicate and also make people feel safe in that space and, and productive, right? Uh, we want to look at ways we can see big data relationships and the big picture all at a glance, right? We might have to factor in testing, automation, validation, and we probably should be, as well as scalable data, data management. Does it work for 10 assets? Cool. 1,000? Yeah, great. 10,000, 100,000, a million, so on and so forth. And if we have all those assets, maybe we're thinking about content versioning and management as well, right? Another concern you may have is do you need to represent data externally to your binary? Do you need to represent profiles on a web page? What about integration to platforms? Uh, another one that's important is user-generated content, packing, uh, uh, patching mods, DLC. How are you gonna scale updates in your game or project? And finally, cooking time. If you have lots and lots of assets, what are some things that you can do to ultimately deal with that? 
So what's the answer to these questions? Well, there is no right answer. As realistically, a project is a combination of all of these questions and probably a lot more. The best way, I think, is to be prepared and aware of tools that you have available and, of, of course, communication. But I'm going to be focusing on the former of those two points, trying to give an overview of all the best tools that you have available to achieve your outcomes. So with that understood, let's dive into our first amazing tool. It's uh, one that probably folks are already familiar with, or at least the UX of it, and that is, of course, the data table. So the data table is the most relatable data type uh, for designers, as it allows looking at data akin to like a CSV or a spreadsheet. It's got a tabular format. That's what we call that. Basically, it allows structs to be ordered and stored in rows, and that these rows can be then accessed by row name. But it's worth noting that we can also address data uh, as individual rows in both C++ and Blueprint. I would say its most magical ability um, is that it allows importing and exporting of JSON and CSV. And this is amazing because it allows designers to bring their own processes into that. A lot of designers and a lot of people really like working in Excel. They have agency over that space, right? So this tool can create pipelines between that. And with JSON, we can easily construct other tools in other programs as well if there is need for it. Uh, it's also worth noting it's a single binary asset. It cooks all together. So how do we go about making a data table? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, first, we need to start by uh, describing a struct. We're going to add a little thing to it called the, uh, uh, the parent type of the table row base. And we're also going to add blueprint type in order to use this struct in blueprint as a variable. And that's it. We're good to dive into the editor after doing this. Now, this can be done with blueprint structs as well, it's worth noting. But I'm not going to show that to preserve time. Um, I guess it's worth noting, I'm going to be showing blueprint where available and in other times C++. But if there is a blueprint implementation, you can assume that there's going to be a C++ implementation. Um, it's just not enough time to cover both. And the other thing is that I wanted to say is that we're going to be working with this, this, this uh, struct here a lot. It's like, um, I guess it describes an item from like an RPG, something like that. But when we're talking about all these concepts, I want you to have an open mind. It's, it's not just like an inventory system. It could be abilities. It could be uh, cinematic data. It could be anything that data can be in your project. So just try to you know, see how this can be applied in many different scenarios, right? So how do you make a data table? This is pretty simple. We just go to miscellaneous. We create a data table. We define the uh, we select the struct that we used before, and we're good to go. We can start entering data. It's as simple as that. So it's very intuitive to work with, and we can see that tabular format there. I just wanted to show as well how we access those. Um, so basically, we can make a variable type called a data table, and what that will do is it will give us a drop-down list of all the data tables in our project, right? which can be overwhelming if you have too many data tables, but I'll, I'll get to that later. From there, we can access that data table um, by grabbing a row name and getting the data out of it. So here, I'm getting all the row names, giving them a shuffle, and basically just printing the item name. So I wanted to show you that we can also um, handle individual rows in a really intuitive format. So I'm going to use a data table row handle uh, to, to do this. And it's very similar. We select a data table just like before, but now we have a list of all the rows that are actually in our data table. So this is a really intuitive way to work. We can be very specific within our large data tables. We can see that that's copied over. I wanted to show you what that sort of designer experience might be like, and I'm using a editor utility widget to do that. Forgive my design skills, um, but these are assets from the Action RPG that I've kind of assembled. Um, and I guess this is kind of a point that I'm going to make later, but I wanted to allude to it now that we can represent data with edit utility widgets. And what that means is we can actually change the view of how we look at data. Right now, this is a read-only widget, right? But there's nothing that would stop me from actually making that a tool that then I could construct for development, right? Um, so I did mention filtering before. I want you to look at these two examples. Uh, of data tables. One has five data tables in the list, this one. I think it's five. It is. It's also got a game tags table in there, but I don't want that. What I want is only inventory items. I want to be able to communicate to the design team and programmers as well, right, that this variable is going to be used for this struct. Don't, you know, try to utilize it in a different way. And to do that, it's really easy. All I need to do is add this meta tag, row type, and then write out the struct's name. 
So let's have a deeper look at data tables. Um, so data tables are, allow us to really easy compare rows of data in a tabular format that should be familiar with for anyone, right? They also handle import and export of JSON and CSV, and this is awesome because it allows external development um, from designers, right? Or external tools development, I should say. However, just be really careful with this method uh, because it creates more than one single source of authority, and what I mean by that is if we do an import and then we do a bug fix quickly before, you know, before a, a release or something in that data table, and then someone else goes and changes the source data and they re-import that, you're not merging that data, you're actually gonna be overriding it. So you need to bring your own processes when dealing with this. Um, and one other point, I mean, it's quick to work with, it's easy to add extra data, and there's not much onboarding. So that can be really appropriate in some scenarios. But there's no inheritance support, right, on the struct itself, and this can be tricky for some solutions. I want to flag this again, why is this so good? Well, not only are you, if you've got a lot of data tables, are you reducing the need to scroll through giant lists of things, but it's about that communication of intent. It's about also reducing human error. So I'd really, um, if there's one takeaway on data tables, I think that's one of the really good ones. And of course, something that I'm gonna bang on about like a broken record when I talk about data is that be careful of hard references in data table. This can lead to a very explosive source of load times, okay? We try to load our data table and it references the rest of our game, we're gonna have a very bad time. But they're also one user per edit, because it's a single binary file, right? So that can be problematic, because it means that only one designer can work on that data table at once, right? However, we can use composite data tables to get around that problem. So composite data tables are super easy. Um, all we need to do is, uh, we've, in this example, I've got a data table three rows, I've got another one with one row, and what I'm gonna do is make a composite data table by misc composite data table. Gonna have to still define the struct type, that should feel pretty familiar, but after this, I'm able to add all the data tables I'd like to merge together, and what you'll see is it'll populate a list with the different sources. So composite data tables allow, uh, work identically to a regular data table in terms of referencing and accessing data, so we don't even need to update our code if we wanted to move over to a solution like this. Um, but it also enables us to manage concepts and add communication to where an item might be found rather than one giant mega list, right? Uh, in this example, I had like the term rare items and misc items as my data table, but I think you can see how that concept could apply in a lot of different scenarios. But I think best of all, it allows multiple people to work on these data assets at once. So one designer can work on one data table in one area of the game and someone else can work on another one and you get much less collisions. What if data needs to be changed post-release? What about live ops? What about if we need to access our data from a web browser and a built binary? For example, like maybe a live scoring system. Well, that's where HTTP requests come into play. So Unreal Engine allows to, us to make HTTP calls um, to external web servers. And uh, this all works in editor and at runtime. So here's an example of the API we're gonna be using today. It's from catfax.ninja. Uh, catfax.ninja's goal is to share random cat facts about cats, which is something that I find very important. Uh, I, I guess resources like this one are really good for just understanding how these systems work. It's, it's designed to prototype. Um, what we're looking at here is the open API specification that will help us know how to actually interact with this API. And here I've made an Edsy utility widget. It uh, has three ways of accessing data from catfacts.ninja. Uh, we're gonna be kind of looking at each one and their kind of pros and cons. So the first one I wanted to start with is a C++ implementation. And we're gonna be using a blueprint async action-based parent type to handle the HTTP request uh, and do a type conversion within that node to a UE struct. So blueprint action async bases, despite being very hard to say live on stage, are one of my favorite classes in Unreal. They're a really fantastic to way to handle latent tasks as they both encapsulate the code into a single node and they provide a callback back to blueprint. To make one, we're gonna make a parent of blueprint action, uh, async action base, <laughs> where we're, and when we're done, it'll be represented as a node in blueprint with, uh, with that little clock there that tells the user that it is a latent task. So, uh, sorry. 
There we go. Okay, so from there, we'll need to add some simple overrides and functions, okay? Starting with activate, this is where we start the task that we're performing. In this case, it's a HTTP request. We're also gonna need a static blueprint callable function with input parameters to make it accessible in our Blueprint project. Additionally, we're gonna need a multicast dynamic delegate to return the information when we're ready. In our static function, all we need to do is create a new Blueprint async action base of the class and then configure its parameters. In Activate, we're gonna actually set up our HTTP request, so this is exciting. You'll see verbs and headers, and people who are familiar with HTTP requests are probably all over this. Uh, we're then gonna bind the delegate to return uh, the request when it's done and kick it off. Finally, we're gonna process our request and desterilize our JSON data. So we're gonna be using JSON to object to automatically convert our JSON object into a uStruct, which is really, really awesome. Uh, to do this, however, we need to set up a uStruct that sort of replicates the open API schema we were provided exactly. Then Unreal will do the rest. Um, so it's worth noting this also supports nested JSON objects. You just need to make a new uStruct and name it appropriately and, and, and plug it into your, your uStruct. So what can we learn about the C++ implementation? Well, I just wanted to plug uh, uh, Blueprint async action base again. It's a really fantastic node when you need to do these latent functions. Um, but it's awesome because we're also uh, able to handle the JSON marshalling into a uStruct within the node itself. And this means we're not exposing JSON to our designers, which is a personal preference. So the JSON object to uStruct is a really useful way to do these type conversions while keeping the schema structure of the original JSON uh, 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 the same and even works with those nested structs, so it's very powerful. However, what I would say is it can be really painful to write out all these types in Unreal Engine, especially with large APIs, right? Uh, and, uh, and it can also introduce a lot of human error. So I just want to say finally, my experience with web APIs is that they seldom remain the same. Even if it's an internal resource, there's a lot of shift in them. And I think because of that, you know, what will happen is that your data models will go out of sync and JSON object to uStruct will ultimately fail, right? So one approach could be to use the dep uh, deprecation function functionality in Unreal, um, but you might want to consider a more indirect approach to marshalling that data where you kind of only take on what your game exactly needs and you separate those two models. Next, we're going to look at the Blueprint implementation. Uh, it's the same as the other HTTP requests. You can see a Blueprint node here. It's got our favorite friends, we've got verbs, we've got headers, we've got a URL. We're putting the parameter directly in the URL in this case. Um, but what you'll notice with this example is we're returning a JSON object, and with reference to our schema again, we're able to work out that we're able to get our very important cat fact um, by referencing it by its JSON name, in this case, fact. So the Blueprint implementation is super available and easy to use for designers or anyone in the team, right? and this makes it perfect for prototyping and testing APIs. And it's awesome that now JSON objects are supported in 5.1, which means that we can prototype and send JSON information to other programs super easily. But I wanted to make the point that potentially consider marshalling to more UE, uh, conventional UE types rather than staying in JSON once you have your request response. Like a, a Blueprint static function library could be a really good way to do that in a Blueprint-only project, for instance. And of course, you'll need the new plugins enabled on there on the screen. Next, let's look at my favorite way to access web server information, um, web API. So web API is a plugin available in 5.1. In this example, note that I've already got an async node available to us, and note that it's also returning a struct similar to our first C++ implementation, right? But guess what? I did all this without writing a line of code which is very, very cool. How is this possible? Web API. So all I need to do is download the schema and drag it into my UE content browser, and this will make a new web API um, asset. So I'm gonna download it, we can have a look at that. It's basically just a JSON struct that defines all the functions and what they return and what we're gonna expect, et cetera, et cetera. I drag that in and bang, there is our new asset. So the window on the left is a representation of that schema API, right? The open API schema. And on the right is our Unreal types and implementation of all those functions. All I need to do is select generate when I'm ready, and there we go. I've got the full schema available to use. 
So why use a web API? Well, I think the biggest thing is it's combining those advantages from C++ uh, with the speed of working in blueprints. It also avoids the need to write out all those structs, uh, and this is a huge time saver, uh, and it's obviously gonna reduce human error as well. Uh, it's probably the best format now to allow testing and pro prototyping easier than ever, right? And it's worth noting that because you're making these types in C++, you're able to reuse them in the rest of your project, so you get that portability as well. So with these tool sets, I hope you can see that working with external live data is easier than ever in 5.1. Um, as a bonus tip of information for the IoT enthusiasts, I wanted to point out we also have an experimental implementation of MQTT, uh, which is another common web format. So blueprint assets. Let's get back to other ways we can hold data in Unreal Engine. This is an alternative to data tables, if you like. Um, they're often sometimes called raw U objects. You might have heard that. Basically, it's a blueprint class that inherits from your object that we don't intend to instance. Rather, we want to read in the default values, okay? It's simple to use and extend. It's really powerful, even in blueprint-only projects. And just to note, the design patterns that I'm going to be showing today uh, are accessing the asset's default properties, but you can instance them and do really powerful things. It's just outside the scope of this talk. So to make them, it's pretty easy. We're going to make a new blueprint class, and we're going to inherit from your object. Then we're gonna name it, and we're gonna add some variables that we'd like to fill it with. In this case, it's gonna be our inventory struct that we started working with at the beginning. This class can be considered our base class, and we'll wanna make child classes of this class in order to start allowing us to fill in some data. In this case, I'm gonna make a sword and an ax. In regards to our data table, each one of these individual U assets here can be considered as a row of data, if that makes sense. And of course, the same thing can be done with a base C++ class as well. Let's have a look at how we can reference our fancy new items. Um, so to do this, I'm just gonna make a regular actor. Um, kind of consider this maybe like a backpack or a loot box in the game. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a class pointer to our base class. Now, this way we'll be able to reference child classes of this type. But we're gonna be really professional in this case and use a soft class pointer. Uh, and this means that when our actor we're working with is loaded, it will not be automatically loaded by the reference blueprint asset, okay? So let's go ahead and make a quick function here uh, that resolves the soft pointer and ultimately gets the data. The secret source here is that get class defaults. And if we have a look at the reference viewer, uh, I wanna be really clear how the soft pointer thing works. So we can see in the reference viewer, I will have a reference to the base class because we're resolving that soft pointer, right? So we're always gonna have that reference. However, any blueprint asset in the data that we care about will be a soft reference shown in the reference viewer as a pink line. And so we can see this when we add a reference to our sword or our axe. The pink line means that it won't be loaded automatically when we load that base actor. So here we can see what it's like for designers to use this type um, with our favorite little UMG representation. This should look pretty familiar. Kind of just looks like selecting a texture or a static mesh or something like that. But you might notice that we've still got this base class over here. And that's not good, because we don't want that to ever be used in actual production. So what we can do is we can add this uh, abstract class tick box, and that means that it will no longer show up in that menu. Uh, we can do that with subclasses as well, as needs be. Um, and we can do this in C++ as well with the abstract class in our U class. Now, your designers might be upset because they can't look at the data all together in a tableau view, but don't worry, because we have that covered. The bulk property matrix can provide this insight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the variables that I'd like to see in my tabular format, and then I'm able to sort and look at all this data at once. And not only that, the UX experience is in some ways better because I'm able to edit directly in line, or you'll see here, I'm able to select a group of one type and actually update all their variables at once. So this is a really powerful way to work. So let's enrich what we've learned about blueprint assets. It's worth noting that each U asset is cooked and it's gonna require memory, and it, if you have a lot of these, it might end up adding to your cooking time. Also consider that we do have all those advantages of the tabular format with the property matrix. Um, however, with some limitations between the two with the property matrix and the data table. They're a little bit more time consuming to set up um, and can be a little bit more intimidating for some designers to step into but they support inheritance, which 
is useful as you might want to change the class as, as it moves through for certain solutions. But the coolest thing about this actually is data inheritance. So we're familiar with material instances and the way if you make an instance of an instance, it will copy over those properties, right? And if we change the base class, the parent class, it will replicate down to the child class unless we override it. Well, we can do the exact same thing with the structure, which can be really efficient for design. I'd also say, of course, consider tooling over the top of this um, with editor utility widgets or details customization. This is only a base password of what Unreal gives you. And once again, I really think it's important, unlike a data table that's quite static, people can add variables here. And that's great. It's great to give agency to people. But at the same time, they can also end up adding a lot of hard references. I really think it's worth teaching the entire team, everyone, about the concept of soft references to scale for this. I'm seeing some smiles in the audience as I say this. I think it's reflective of some experiences, potentially. <laughs> um, and unlike data tables, they also support instance properties. And I'm going to be going into that in a moment. So the next uh, topic I wanted to talk about is one of my personal favorites. It's very much like the BP asset, only it's purpose-built for holding static data, and that is the data asset. I guess the name kind of gives it away. Uh, they work very similar to BP assets, but they're totally purpose-built, and they live on disk. They're cooked, and then they live on the disk, right? They're loaded on demand as they're needed, and they also support inheritance, but in a slightly different way. Uh, we can do this at a class level, but not at a per data instance level, and I'll go into that in the examples. But ultimately, they have a much cleaner workflow, meaning the experience for designers is more transparent, which is something that we're always trying to achieve. This does come at a cost, um, and you'll see that when we talk about maybe you can't override a function within that specific set of data. But you don't always want to make these really complex mechanisms just because you can, and in a lot of cases, this is the perfect class for your project. So let's go ahead and make one. We're going to make a, a new C++ class uh, that parents from data asset. And then we're going to give it some properties. In this case, it's going to be our inventory item struct because we've come and know and love that struct. Uh, and then we can go back into the editor after I uh, write out some code. I find that I'm much faster at writing code and compiling in video format than I am in real life. I don't know how I do that. It's a little trick. So if I go over to miscellaneous and I go to data assets, this kind of like magenta color, maybe, um, then I'm able to select the class that I just generated, and that's going to make myself a data asset. And I'm ready to fill it full of data. So this is really similar to the BP asset um, in that we can look at it like a row in a data table. Again, it's that concept. So let's go ahead and use this asset in a new actor similar to our chest object we were playing with before, or backpack, whatever you like. And you'll see that I've got a problem here. I don't know if anyone saw the C++ code. I made a mistake, and I actually did this while recording, but I decided to leave it. I can't find this asset in, uh, in the editor. Uh-oh. So what I missed was I forgot to put blueprint type in the U class, which will mean that this is now accessible to blueprint as a variable. OK, so I'm happy now. I'm going to make a new, I'm, I'm, I want to reference this class. I want to get some information out of it. I want to show what that's going to be like. Um, and you'll notice that we're going to use an instance of this data asset. So we're, uh, rather than a class pointer. And that's because, in truth, we're not really able to instance this data asset. We're more pointing to information on disk. So kind of think about it like the get defaults only from before, but it's kind of happening under the hood. Uh, now, we could use an instance and just, um, uh, and just you know, reference that data and load it all in. But I'm going to be very professional. You might notice here I'm using a soft pointer again a soft object pointer to reference that data and avoid automatically loading this asset when it comes in. Very important. So what's great is that the designers can see a list of all these data assets. We don't need to worry about abstract classes. It's very simple. It's very functional. It's very easy to use. Of course, you can also do that async if you're feeling really clever. So here's our editor widget experience again um, to see you know, how that looks. It's very similar. We don't need to worry about the abstract classes, but it's very similar to picking a texture or whatever else. We can also add functions as well. So in this example, I'm going to add some getters and restrict access to that struct directly. Um, so I'm just going to generate some code there. And then back in Blueprint, you know, I'm going to have to fix that up. And that's, that's really powerful, right? So getters, pretty simple. But I can actually do some fairly complex things that will be revealed in the Blueprint side. They also support Blueprint diffing. And this is 
really important when you're working on a big project, you're trying to balance a lot of different data. This view will actually show on the left all the changes. We're able to step through them and compare values. And it's worth noting that we can also diff BP assets as well. So in this view, we're able to compare, yep, that we've made this item more expensive for whatever reason. Um, and while we're on the topic of diffing, it's worth noting that we can even diff data, uh, data tables, but of course the format is going to be slightly more intimidating. So let's look a bit closer at our data set assets. I want to say that they've got most of the advantages and considerations of the BP asset, only that they're purpose-built, therefore they're much clearer to work with. They require minimal amounts of C++ to get up and running, and unlike data tables, uh, but unlike data tables, they don't natively support importing and exporting of data. However, you can add that in by building your own factory or, or other tools that you might want to use. This is also the case for BP assets as well. And they do in, in, um, support inheritance, but not at that kind of level I was talking about when, when we're talking about the instancing of data. We can only add to that class base, so you know there are some limitations there. But what I would say is designers love them because you can change their values in Pi while you're actually playing the game, and it will update, which is super useful when you're trying to find the right value for something. Uh, as well, they support diffing, which is great. We saw that. Um, and once again, I'm just going to plug. This is the base point. Really, I would always consider, can we use an editor blueprint to actually change the experience of how we're looking and augmenting that data? Um, use software references wherever possible. Sorry, every point is going to keep coming up. Uh, but absolutely, this is just like BP assets. You really want to be educating your team on this. And like BP assets, they also support instance properties. But what are those? So instant properties are an amazing way to add properties or actions to your data arsenal. Um, essentially, it allows us to attach a U object to another object and edit its default exposed parameters in line in the details panel right there. So you can see in this example to the right, we are specifying a class, and then that, uh, we're able to access the class properties and set them in the details panel. And additionally, because it supports inheritance, it uh, allows to do some really neat design patterns that I want to kind of show off today. So here we have a type that supports two options in the dropdown. We've got single item, and we've got stack of items. And when we select single item, we can see that we have more properties to access. In this case, we've got a reference to our data asset of items that we've been building. We can also see if we select stack, we have an extra property that has propagated into our UI, and that's because stack of item inherits from the single item class and adds an extra in 32 called amount of items. Our data asset that contains this instance property does so by adding the U object derived class with the instance U property specifier. The classes it's referencing has a little bit of extra magic in its setup. Do take note of its U class specifiers. We've got default to instance, and we've got the main one edit inline new. This indicates that the object of this class can be created within the Unreal Editor property window, which is the exact behavior we're after. I've also used a display name, which I think is really uh, good for this type, because it means that we can display that in the drop-down menu for designers. It's, it's all about communicating the tool's intent, once again, with normal language rather than a class reference. And we've got a note, uh, we've got a reference to our asset as well. Um, so we can see that a single item therefore allows us to add a reference to one of our items that we've been making. But let's have a look at stack of items. Stack of items inherits from our previous U object, but adds on the in 32. And what's really fantastic here is that we're creating modular options for ways to propagate data. And this works on array too. So I guess in this instance, by using array, we've accidentally made like a chest of items, right? Or like a backpack full of items. So we can see that here. I'm going to add another type. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Very good. So let's look a bit deeper at instance properties. They're really fantastic for adding optional parameters to structs and objects, like the example. Um, they're really good for lists of actions, and a great example of this can be seen in the modular gameplay framework here on the right, where we can add a whole bunch of different actions that we might want to perform. But they don't work with data tables, and this is because they need to live on an object in the game, OK? So there is that limitation there. They can be really useful for creating chains of references or a tree hierarchy when you get them to reference themselves. You can create like node-like trees, which is really interesting. But it's worth noting that the object that's instance will be fully loaded when its owner is loaded, uh, when its owner is loaded. So um, very powerful tool. 
We've been looking at ways of storing data for a while, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how data is represented to designers. So meta tags can be used to change the way information is displayed through showing and hiding details or enabling and disabling input. They can be used to hold extra information about a U property in general, and you could use them to store information on your own systems. Uh, an example of this would be tagging a bunch of U properties on a data asset with a certain meta tag, and then you could go through and grab them all out if they had that mega tag to actually generate like a report or something. But be aware that you can only do that in the editor in vanilla UE. In this example, we can see uh, that the struct amount is only visible in our inventory system has a stack. Therefore, we're decluttering the editor with unneeded information. And to do this, it's pretty simple. We just want edit condition and edit condition hides. You can see in edit condition, we're referring to a bool that's pointing back to a bool that we're using in the struct. Inline bools are really useful as well. They allow us to put uh, the same, uh, they allow us to put the bool on the same line as the stackable item count. And what's really cool about this is we're now forming a relationship between those two properties. We're communicating our intent much clearer. And this is pretty simple as well. We just use edit inline condition toggle, and then we point back the edit condition to that bool again. So how does this help designers and teams? Well, they provide an opportunity for your tools to communicate their intent. Um, they also provide basic data validation by controlling access to data and generally improve the UX for designers. And as mentioned, you can also create your own meta tags for use in the edit editor, and um, this is really powerful with your own editor utility widgets, as you can sort of access that data or the details customization. Um, but keep in mind, once again, you're gonna need to modify the engine just slightly if you wanna use that in build. And just speaking about data validation, I wanna plug this amazing plugin. What plugin? The data validation plugin. Um, so the concept here is to stop issues before they happen. Um, we're all human. We all make mistakes, even me, once. Uh, the data validation plugin allows designers feedback as they work. Have they made a mistake? Can we identify that? Can we tell them? Well, we probably should. And what we want to do is stop issues well before they go on to push their work to a team. Or we can even put a check inside a build pipeline to actually uh, ensure all the custom rule sets are valid. Have you ever wanted to store a bunch of curves or allow designers to balance scale properties external to the editor? Well, if you didn't, you will want to now, I hope. Let me introduce you to curve tables. So basically, they allow a, a list of curves. Um, they also support importing and export of curve data from external tools, just like data tables, okay? They're very similar to data tables. They support linear, constant, and cubic curves. And you can create combined curve data tables just like, uh, uh, sorry, composite curve data tables just like composite data tables, so you can scale them that way as well. Uh, you can also access curves from a curve data table just like you can with a data table, so we can access a specific curve in the same way. So here's an example of making a curve table inside the editor. We can find a curve table in our miscellaneous section in 5.1, and we'll need to specify a linear, constant, or cubic, and then from there we have a very intuitive interface for accessing our data. And here's an example of us importing this directly from CSV. So importing is the same as a data table, only we need to tell Unreal that this is going to be a data curve table instead. Then it's gonna be like linear, constant, and cubic, and I'm gonna be like linear, because I like it. Um, and that's it. After this, we are still able to modify the data in Unreal. Unreal will even suggest values based on interpolation, which I think is really cool. Uh, but do be aware that you have that issue, um, like before, with a single source of authority, uh, just like data tables. Additionally, curved data tables work really well with scalable floats. Basically, this is a type that allows the combination of a float and a data curve row that will allow you to both scale and preview the output. So this is really great when you want consistent scaling of a curve in a project, but at a per asset change or difference. So let's have a look at them um, together. So what I want you to do is notice the float value multiplies against the curve data and provides a preview slider. See, we can slide that up and down, we can change that value, and now it's gonna double the preview, and so on and so forth. They're really, really quite cool. So accessing information on them is really simple. Um, we just need to provide the level, um, or the x value of our curve, in this case. So data curve considerations. Well, I think they're really great for values that scale in your game. Uh, especially when you want to get feedback of values over, you know, x value in this case. 
but they also allow the importing and exporting of data, which is a really great way to work with this format of data. So you may have noticed that some items in our example haven't had their item type filled, and maybe you haven't, but this is starting to really bug me, so I wanna fix that right now um, with our friend's gameplay tags. So basically, they're like F names that are globally predefined, um, and they allow an easy selection inside the editor UI. So you can see up there that uh, we've got this UI interface to actually select the type. And basically, this avoids human error, but they also come with some bonuses, like we can have tag containers uh, that allow us to have more than one type of tag in a single type. They also have an inherent uh, hierarchy, so we can find relationships between tags. For example, we could say, is this a child of this tag or something? A lot of people don't know this. They're also supported in the reference viewer. So an example of this is we could look them up and say, what are all instances that have the acid F tag or something like that and see all the objects in our project? Um, they also support redirectors. If we do need to make changes, we're not gonna break the build, which of course is important. And they can be baked down to index IDs for replication, so they can be really cheap in a multiplayer game in this sense. So let's look at an example of gameplay tags in use. Here I'm gonna make a variable with the type gameplay tag, and it will allow me to select tags from the tag hierarchy. Next I'll make a tag container, and this type will allow me to select multiple tags. So as well, I said the gameplay tags come with a bunch of useful functions, and in the example I'm about to show, I'm gonna compare the tag to the gameplay container tag, and basically see if it's in that container. Gameplay tags are also super easy to add to your project. All you need to do is make a data table of gameplay tags, and then you can add this in your project settings. Um, they can also be added into your INI as well. So I'll show an example of both of these. Um, basically here, I'm making the data table. This is a bit dry. I'm doing it as fast as uh, recorded Jack can move. Uh, and I'm gonna add it into my project settings. And yeah, that's great, they're propagating there. So that's really cool. Um, but from here, I can also add them directly into the INI um, just by writing them out and clicking enter. Simple as that. So let's look at an example where I've tried all to use everything you've seen here today at once just to give a bit of context about how these things go together. So here you'll see that we've got like our, our, our familiar struct and I'm filling out that asset data. We got like a texture, we got some stuff. But then I'm using instance properties over here and right now I've got this variable called like charged tags, so maybe this like weapon has some magical powers, we've got a charge limit. I'm using scalable float for that. I've then selected another type which is damage, right? So I'm actually adding in this data as I might need it. Um, then I'm gonna add in another one that's static mesh and I'm not actually suggesting you should make your items or inventory like this, I'm just really trying to present how these things might flow together. So the asset registry um, is the last thing that I wanted to talk about and one of our most powerful tools and features that we have at our disposable. They not only help with system architecture, but they are also implicit UX improvements for designers working with data in the editor in the asset, uh, with the asset registry. So the asset registry can be seen as metadata about an asset themselves. Take a look, for instance, at our example here where we've got this variable max players, and then over here in our tooltip in the content browser, we can see that coming up. And that's kind of what the asset registry is doing. And you've probably seen this before. For example, when you hover over a static mesh, you're able to see its try count. But the asset registry is not just for generating cool tooltips, even though that is quite awesome. We can use it at runtime and in the editor to load and filter data. So in the example to the right, we could use this query uh, what, uh, to query what map would be appropriate for an eight player match right, without actually loading the map or uh, extra data. So let's look at a case study. Here we're able to visualize meta, uh, metadata by hovering over our beloved inventory object. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not only what we can do, we can actually filter in the um, content browser as well. So I can be like, item cost equals 10 or 50 and it will show that because now it's part of the content browser search system. And to implement this, all we need to do is add asset registry searchable tags. But this only works on types where a direct conversion to asset registry tag actually makes sense. So in this case, I'm not using the struct anymore because how would you define a struct as a tag? You're gonna need to define that. And in order to handle uh, that, like structs, or in fact any arbitrary tag you'd like to add, all you need to do is override get asset registry tags. You wanna include a call to the parent function to grab the parent, and then uh, we can add any tag we like. 
In this case, we're just getting the item names for the struct and letting UE know that it's alphabetical type. But we can also do it with numerical data, right? So like item cost in this case, and we can use that for sorting in the example there. Here we're gonna use the data registry to load in some of our items based on a simple tag check. Let's have a look at how we do this. With a reference to our asset registry, we can get all actors by class, okay? But the class is not actually loaded. You'll notice that we've got this blue pin instead, and that means that we're just looking at the metadata of this asset. We're then gonna compare its tags against the gameplay tag, and if it's one that we want, we're gonna get the soft asset reference, and we're gonna load that into UMG over here. So we can look at the data table in, as well in a tabular format within the content browser with the column view, and we can also sort this data. So here's our tabular view again that we can look to um, sort assets, and then we can use filtering in order to you know, further refine that. The asset, auto, uh, the asset audit window can also do a really good job of this as well. So this is really only scratching the surface. Um, let's have a look at what we covered. It's a super quick library for referencing data. Um, we can use the content browser we can use the content browser as a way to view all the data at once in a column view, or we could use the asset audit window. We can control how we find data and objects with certain metadata at runtime or in the editor. And so this is really useful for DLC content, for instance, where if your logic for finding what items are appropriate at any one time is going through the asset registry, well then if you add extra data assets from a downloaded or external source, they're gonna get referenced and pulled in without changing your code. Final note, the asset registry is async on the editor, however, it is synchronous in a game build. So sometimes when you're building tools, you just wanna be aware of that. So what's next? I'm gonna conclude here. Um, I would say follow up on these types, understand their strengths and limitations, be open to finding the right solution to your project. If you're really interested in customization, then I'd check out details panel customization um, to go into that further. And if you're interested to get more out of data tables, I'd have a look at the new data registry plugin. And ultimately, if you want to learn more, Lyra is a really good source of seeing how all these things can fit together. And uh, additionally, you can uh, have a closer look at the gameplay ability framework or the gameplay modular features plugin. I guess I wanted to close with this thought, though. If we're making systems, if we're making data, we always want to be empathetic to how that data is going to be represented as well as fit in the system. So I think that's what we really need to think about when we look at all these types and how they fit together and how they're represented in order to save huge efficiencies on projects, and ultimately it means that we're gonna have a better time developing. So with that, thank you very much. I don't think we have enough time for QA, but uh, I'll be around at the festival uh, at Unreal Fest, and everyone have a wonderful time.
well. Hello. Good morning. Uh, my lapel mic is working. Sorry, just going to move this up a bit. Hey, so welcome to my talk on building tools quickly in Unreal. Uh, I know it says blueprints, menus, utilities, and widgets, angel script, and more. That and more is doing a lot of heavy lifting. So uh, we'll see how we get on. Um, I've got a little mascot who will be helping me along the way. Uh, so I'm Paul Grieveson. I am a senior technical artist at Embark Studios. Uh, that's my Twitter handle in case you want to follow me for memes and Unreal stuff. Uh, I work at Embark in Stockholm in Sweden. And we're using Unreal on two of our projects, uh, Arc Raiders, which we released a trailer for last year, I believe, and also for the finals, which was more recently teased and trailed on YouTube and uh, Twitter as well. So we're using Unreal on a lot of things. It's a multi-project studio, and we use the same Unreal Engine version on both, which leads to some unique challenges. So what are we looking at today? I'm going to start with some kind of more high-level philosophy stuff and then head into some details of like some technical things and some practical applications of what you can do with tools in Unreal, because it's a big animal. Um, and then I'll go back up to some other stuff and come back to hopefully satisfying conclusion that some people will learn some things from. I expect a lot of you already know some of this stuff, but probably a lot of you don't know some of the other stuff. So we'll see how far we get. Uh, so my approach in general as a technical artist and tools developer is you obviously, depending on the size of the team, it might just be you, it might be a bunch of people, you wanna identify the team's needs first. Like you need to be fixing an actual problem. You wanna be solving something, speeding up production, saving people time, making them happier in how they work. That's an important one as well that often gets missed. Uh, and generally, because you're usually working on a production, you wanna ship something, you wanna solve that problem quickly. Uh, so that's what we'll be covering a lot of today. And you usually solve that by being specific. Like, you don't want to waffle around the problem or like try and think too far away from what it is that you're actually trying to solve. You just want to be specific and say, OK, these people need these, these things. What's the best way to do it? Um, and then once you've got that solution, you can kind of iterate and refactor that and like improve on it. But I always prefer the idea of getting something into people's hands as soon as possible just so that you can actually see am I doing the right things? You don't want to spend a lot of time on something and then find out you've actually solved the wrong problem because you didn't give the thing to the people who needed it. Uh, and one of the bigger things that that leads to, I think, is that when you have a larger studio or a larger team, you can kind of build an ecosystem of all the things that you're creating. Um, and I think of this in two ways. On the one side, you've got your information, and you could be using any sort of thing like Confluence, Notion, uh, I don't know, Google Drive, Microsoft Office, OneNote, whatever. There's a lot of tools out there. Um, and then on the other side, you have your functionality. So like the buttons people are clicking, the data people are working with, that's all in Unreal, or it's in your DCC apps like Houdini, Maya, Blender, whatever. Uh, and you kind of want those things to feed into each other, because when they feed into each other, they reinforce each other. Uh, and there's lots of ways to do that. So I prefer looking at things as having a single source of truth. Like, like I say, there's a lot of apps out there and you might use many of them, but you generally want to pick one and say, this is the thing that we're using for X. So like Notion is where we get our documentation. Jira is where we track our tasks. You don't want to start doing stuff like, oh, but we'll actually put some of the tasks in Notion and some, someone else has a Trello board over there where we do some other things. Like unless those are really disparate things like for tracking high level versus low level things, I would generally recommend keeping it together. It just makes things easier and it makes it less likely to drift information and lead to confusion, especially in larger teams. Uh, the nice thing about a lot of these tools is they give you shareable links. More modern tools have very good embedding. Like you can embed Jira links into Miro. You can embed presentations from Google Drive into Notion and that's all in line. People can find it easily. You want to put that information where people can see it and not and, end up digging around for ages. And that leads to cross-pollination, like cross-linking. People can find things from one place to another. And you can actually bring that into Unreal as well. So like when you have links in Unreal, you can just jump to those in the document. And then you can actually jump back to Unreal in ways that I'll cover later. So it, 
for us at Embark, since we are a multi-project studio, we generally want to plan for sharing our tools because it just lightens the load a little bit. Uh, we do have a fairly small tech art team, but they do a lot. Um, I know I said be specific before, and I think that's true for solving the initial problem, but you can kind of think a little bit beyond what it is that you're doing right now while you're doing it. So like if, if someone has asked for a specific tool, you can be like, okay, well for this project, that's exactly what they need, but what small things can we change that will make this apply to something else or make this more reusable? And I'll cover some concrete use cases of that later. Um, I don't think it takes much there. There's a word in Swedish which is lagom, which basically means like just the right amount of something. Uh, and it's difficult to describe as a concept of how you think about things. Like you don't want to overthink something and spend ages trying to generalize and like make it abstract. But you also don't want to be so specific that you maybe miss a win that you could get. So it's kind of it's a difficult point to know where that is. And I think that kind of comes with practice and experience and talking to your team. Because um, yeah, like if you don't talk to your team, you won't know if you're doing the right thing or not. If you're your own customer, great. You can close that iteration loop and just be like, what do I need? I'll do it. Is that good? Yes, I'll do some more on it, and so on. Um, building modularly, I think, is key to doing things quickly, because if you don't do that, you will end up with big systems that are hard to refactor, things that don't really connect very well. Uh, and again, a little planning up front goes a long way with that. You don't necessarily need to plan everything, but sometimes just sitting down and thinking or sketching for like five, 10 minutes can reveal things that will make you think about a system in a different way. So have we all seen something like this in a project? I mean, I don't like seeing it. I haven't seen one recently because of building modularity and stuff, but yeah, like this is what we want to avoid, right? No one wants to open something in Blueprint and go, well, uh, wait, what is even going on here? How do I get from point A to point B? Is any of this stuff even reusable? It's probably not, it's all in the Blueprint. Um, so the way I think about solving this is kind of applicable to all axes of information in Unreal. It's you compose things together, right? Like if you've got an actor, you see this a lot in Unreal already. You have a lot of components that do specific things. And the way you compose behavior is, this component will talk to this component. You'll have events that fire off other things. And it's the same with widgets. Like uh, I think Adrian actually gave a good talk on this yesterday, is like you wanna use inheritance and then also composition to build up layers of functionality in a very modular way. And it just saves you so much time when you think about this and like, well, what does this widget actually want to do? Do I need to make something specific or am I gonna reuse this somewhere else? Think about reuse a little bit it can save you a lot of time later. And obviously, as you see on the end there, it's the same for functionality, I think. Like, you generally want small functions that do something specific that you can compose into a bigger function. You don't want to just have one gigantic function that does absolutely everything, because that's, it's not easy to refactor, it's not easy to edit, it's not easy to understand and follow. So breaking things down is really good. And again, I'll give some practical examples of this. I think that by looking at things in a modular way, you can iterate faster. And you really, like iteration is everything in game development. Like if you can build something quickly, you can see how it looks in an actual practical application and then go, wait, does this make sense? Like stubbing out methods, I do this all the time. Like what I mean by that is you basically just create a method that takes some input parameters that you care about and create a return if you need to, which returns some other output parameters, but don't actually do anything in the function yet. Just make those inputs and outputs, and then plug them in, in, in your actual blueprints and see where, does this make sense? Can I use this somewhere else? Does this save me time? It's very, very quick to do, and it can actually save you some headaches later when you realize you've built things in the wrong way. So by doing that, you can kind of help lock down a simple API, which is more of an engineering thing. I borrowed a book called Code Complete. So I'm a technical artist, I don't have an engineering background, and I felt like I needed to learn something about engineering, and I really recommend that book. I'll link it at the end. Um, testing often is obviously really important. If you don't test your stuff, you won't know if it's working. If you just kind of build something and then throw it over the fence to another user, you probably find out that you missed something. So you need to test it in practical scenarios and like I say, get it into your user's hands so that they can actually try it, show you what's wrong, talk about it, maybe even on their own machine, iterate on that. 
Uh, that iteration loop, to me, it kind of covers everything in game development from the highest level to the smallest level. And you want to keep that iteration loop as tight as possible. Uh, I think it's a good feedback loop. So, uh, in terms of iteration, something that we found at Embark has really helped us, uh, and your mileage may vary on this, is we're using a angel script uh, fork of Unreal. So it's a full GitHub fork. It completely replaces the base engine, so it's, you can't use it as a plugin. So Hazelight, who are a Swedish studio as well, they developed it to help their iteration times on It Takes Two, which they released last year on multiple platforms. It's a very good game. I think it won awards. Um, so they actually built this because it enables their designers and uh, uh, programmers to work more uh, collaboratively because everything is just scripts, uh, which gives us a lot of advantages. They also have a Discord. Uh, you can get to all of the information from that URL there. Um, but some pros and cons to that. So I really like it because it's got hot reloading. It's much faster to write in C++. Uh, it is a script language, so it is lots of typing, but it's faster than Blueprint at runtime. Uh, since it's text, you can diff it, you can merge it, you can do all those nice things that code does that Blueprint is more difficult to do. You can, in most cases, copy-paste code from AngelScript in C++ if you need a uh, speed up for it. A couple of little uh, caveats with that, but it's very easy. And it has access to some things that Blueprint doesn't. But the cons, and these are big cons, especially if you're a small team who doesn't have an engineering support like we do, uh, it is an unsupported fork of the engine. You're at the mercy of whatever's on GitHub on Hazelight's repository right now, so do it at your own risk. I wouldn't recommend moving to this if you're halfway through a project. I would recommend, if you think you can support it, taking a look at it and evaluating if it's gonna be interesting for you or not. Obviously, as a scripting language, there's syntax and stuff, so it's maybe less accessible than Blueprint, where you can just drag nodes out and connect things. It depends on the person, in my experience. Some of our artists are writing AngelScript as if it, they were blueprints, so like, it will depend on the person, I think. And it doesn't have access to a very few things that Blueprint does, like some latent actions, like delay, but I don't think anyone should be using delay anyway, so I don't mind. Uh, so here's a simple example of what a Blueprint would look like in AngelScript. This is just a really simple batch rename where we just iterate through the selected level actors and change their name to some format string with an input. Uh, so very simple thing. In AngelScript, it looks quite similar to C++. You just declare a class, which is a subclass of uh, actor action utility, because we're just making a utility here. You implement a function, mark it as you function, and then just do your code there. So anyone who's written C++ and Unreal, this will look very, very familiar. Anyone who's done C Sharp and Unity as well, it will probably look quite familiar. So uh, I think it's quite easy to get into if you have that kind of background. But that's just a general baseline, because for me, I find that is, it saves me so much time working in script compared to working in Blueprint because of the benefits it gives us. Um, so, uh, on to some specific stuff. There are a lot of things in Unreal, right? It's a big engine, it keeps getting bigger every year. 5.1 added loads of stuff, like subsystems, all new things that didn't exist in 427 even. Uh, lots of things to learn there. So I'm just kind of interested in if I can ask the people in the room right now to raise your hand if you are implementing things in construction script. 25%? Uh, okay. Uh, what about asset or actor action utilities? Oh, about, oh, maybe even a bit more, interesting. Uh, Blutility buttons, just as little buttons in the details panel. Yeah, a decent amount. 50% maybe. Uh, what about asset validators? Ooh, good. I like that. Lots of people validating assets. Uh, custom menus, icon buttons. Okay, wow, that's a lot more than I expected because those features are quite hidden. Uh, and editor utility widgets. Also good, so quite a lot of you. Good, okay, so this might not be news for a lot of people in the room, but uh, I shall carry on and cover my examples. So you need to figure out what you want to choose, right? There are all these options, uh, and you need to figure out which one is the best one to use. So like construction script, I'm not going to go in, into depth on this. Uh, I tend to avoid it, but um, the good thing about it is you can kind of do whatever you like into it. It's all self-contained within the actor. 
you can't do stuff like spawning actors or whatever because then you'll end up with horrible things that are unmanageable. Uh, I think one of the downsides of it is you can do a lot in it and you can end up shooting yourself in the foot, uh, especially because not a lot of people realize that construction script runs on cook and a lot of people use construction script for things like doing traces and finding stuff and then like if you don't have all of the levels loaded at cook time, you don't have the same context and then things get weird. So you've gotta be really careful about what you do in there and I would say just keep everything self-contained inside the actor if you're doing construction script. And depending on what you're doing and how expensive it is, it can be better to just do that stuff through a blue utility button or a utility widget that runs in the editor or even a commandlet if you wanna do stuff at cook time. Um, moving on to action utilities, I love these. Our artists love these, our designers love these. We make loads of them. Uh, the downside of these is <laughs> that you end up with loads of them and they end up in the right-click context menu. If you've got an asset action utility, it ends up in the context menu of the content browser. If you've got an actor action utility, it ends up in the context menu of the level editor when you right-click on an actor. So they're super easy to make and I'll just do a little example of this here. And the nice thing about that is if you just sit down with some of your team, even if they haven't done much blueprint before, you might find that they can actually make tools to help themselves and me as a technical artist, that's great, it saves me time. Um, so you just make them by right clicking, make a editor utility blueprint and then choose either actor action utility for a level editor thing or asset action utility if you want something in the content browser. So here's a simple example where I wanna just remove material overrides from the actors I've got in the scene. Let's say someone has been overriding materials, I don't want that. This is like, this looks super simple, right? Uh, I've just added a blueprint function called remove material overrides uh, on the blueprint I just created, and I just mark that function as call in editor, and as soon as I do that, that means it will get picked up by Unreal and shown in the right click context menu. So this is a very big simplification, but this is what my function looks like. It's literally just a loop over selected actors and then call a function that removes them. And so even if anyone has never seen this before, they can just load it up and go, okay, that's what it's doing. It's getting the actors and it's removing material overrides. They don't necessarily need to know how or why it's doing that. It's very easy to follow. So there are a bunch of things to get to that, which I'll cover in a second. But um, the main thing that you might wanna consider here is if you have a lot of these, you wanna make sure that they're only showing up in a relevant context. And I think context is really important because otherwise people end up with weird buttons that they can click that don't do anything, which is never fun. So if you implement get supported class on your uh, action utility, it just determines whether we should show that or not. And it just returns the, uh, I believe it's the class type. So it basically looks at your selection checks against your uh, function, and if the selection contains something that matches the class of the return node, it will show up. If it doesn't match the class, it won't show up. So here's an example of what ours looks like. Um, we wanna just get the selected level actors, loop over those. If any of them has a material override, we just early out and say return actor because we want it to work on anything. Uh, this will just work on any actor that has a material override. If we go through that loop and none of them has a material override, we end up in this return node down here where it actually returns class, which is a weird little hack because you can't have a class in the level. So that means that this will never return true for actors in the level if they don't have material overrides. So then this button just won't show up, which is kind of cool. This is a more complicated example. You could just implement something as simple as uh, return static mesh actor, and then it will only show up if, it, if you have a static mesh actor in your selection. So that's the, like the simple case. Um, I optimized it a bit later because I needed to do something else, because as we saw earlier, I had a function called get selected actors with overrides and modularity in mind. We just want that function to do the same thing in both cases, so I'll get into that in a minute, but this is what I end up implementing for get supported class on this asset action utility. Um, so, this is where we start go getting out of the action utility and I've made a blueprint function library which contains a bunch of just static functions that just take an argument and return something. So they have no context, all they get is an input and they give an output. And they're very minimal as well, they don't do much, they are, it just takes an actor, returns a bool. 
So again, we want to keep it simple. We just get all the components that are a static mesh component. You could also use mesh component if you want to make it generic, but then other things get more complicated. We loop through those, and then we've got this magic little other static function, but it's actually in the same Blueprint function library that just says, does this have material overrides? If it's true, we return true. Otherwise, we keep iterating through, because we don't care if all of, like if we got 100 components, we only care if one of them does or none of them do. So earlying out in this way saves us a bit of time if the first component has an override and none of the others do. Um, so this is the actual meat of the function. This is what, uh, uh, if I can go back one, the has material overrides thing there, this is what this is doing. So we're actually getting the static mesh component, getting the mesh from it, getting the number of sections from the mesh, and we're basically just saying, does the static mesh component, which is the instant in, instance in the world, have the same material as the mesh originally did? And if it didn't, we return true out of here saying, yes, it has material overrides. So there's two early outs there just to say, like if we didn't get any static mesh at all, we just return out saying no, because it doesn't have anything. And if we reach the end of the loop without coming out saying it's true, we just say it doesn't have any material overrides. So the nice thing about this is all we do from an API point of view is we just pass in a static mesh component and we get a bool. You don't actually have to understand what it's doing if you want to use that function. And you can use that anywhere because it's in a blueprint function library. So I have exposed this function here. Actually, this could also be in the blueprint function library uh, because then we can use it anywhere. All it does is call the editor actor subsystem, gets the selected level actors, and then iterates through them and calls that little function that we already wrote, right, that just takes an actor and returns a bool. So if, if that passes that condition, we add it to an array, and then we t return the array at the end. Because that now means we've got this nice little function that we can use anywhere to just say, get selected actors with material overrides, and it will give us that. Um, and again, it just means that we've got a nice simple uh, we've got a nice simple function that we can reuse, and it's easy to understand, it's easy to look at, and kind of all the functionality is hidden inside these smaller nodes. So here's an example of what that looks like. If we select a, an asset that doesn't have any material overrides, it doesn't show up, but if we right-click here on one that does, then we actually see that there's a, a right-click menu item called asset scripted actor actions, and remove material overrides is there. And if we select something that doesn't have it, it doesn't exist. So we can just kind of, we can use that to reveal that function or not, depending on the context. And it doesn't make much sense when we've only got one, but when you've got like a library of 20 or 30 of them, you don't want them all showing up, it just gets confusing. So the nice thing about building it in this way means that if someone's like, hey, I want a little button on my actor that just removes the material overrides from the actor, I don't know why you'd want this, it's a little contrived, but this is now super easy to implement because we can just go to our blueprint, make a new function, set it as call an editor, that makes it a blue, blue utility button, and we literally just call exactly the same function because it just takes an actor, so we can just pass itself through. We didn't need to do anything else. This is now super simple. Uh, and what that looks like is we just have this little button there, and you click it, and the actor uh, material overrides are removed. And you'll notice at no point did we have any kind of like huge spaghetti graph of things coming everywhere, because if we had built that asset action utility in one place in the blueprint, we wouldn't be able to reuse any of that stuff anywhere else, and I think that's really useful. Uh, so I didn't put any details on this because there are a couple of really good tutorials, both on the Unreal Community Wiki and also I think Alex Stevens, who used to work at Epic, posted something on Twitter. Uh, there, you can actually make custom menus, buttons, and add them anywhere in the Unreal UI. Uh, it just takes a name for the menu name, and then you just pass it a function to run, and it will add buttons, icons, whatever you need. And this is great for just making tools show up where, in context where you want them. And you can put them in multiple places as well. I generally prefer putting things more places than less, because it increases the chance that someone will find something good you can't make sure that everyone knows everything all the time, it's just not possible. Um, helps contextualize them as well. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've got some links at the end that people will be able to see, but I figured it wasn't worth going into here. 
So, asset validators, I also really like these. We use them a lot uh, at Embark because we want to keep our build stable and safe at all times. We don't want people submitting bad content. So, uh, ideally, your asset validator should tell someone how they can fix the problem that they've done. You can just put a message into the results of that. You can re reuse functions from our blueprint, material, blueprint function library that I just implemented before, and then we use them in CI. Arturo is doing a talk this afternoon in room 281 at 3.30, where he covers a little bit of this and more things about uh, how we validate our builds. But now, with an asset validator, I can just implement this exactly the same way in one function. I can just make an asset validator and then add a uh, call to the blueprint node that I implemented before, which is does the actor have overrides? If it returns true, we fail the validator. If it returns false, we pass the validator. And then you get this little message log in Unreal whenever you hit save. If your asset fails validation, you will get that message saying, oh, it has material overrides. And we could write more information into the warning message there if we want to clarify the details of how to fix that, for example. But the nice thing about this is it takes like five seconds to make because we already have the function. We don't have to copy and paste anything. We just call it. Uh, something that you can't do in Blueprint that you can do in AngelScript and C++, and I find this really useful for making project agnostic tools, is there's a class called uDeveloper settings. You probably used it. Uh, <laughs> I think the name is a little bit misleading because you can use them anywhere. It's not just for developers. They appear in the project settings. Uh, of the editor, and you basically specify properties as being configurable properties, and then they just show up in the settings. People can set them to whatever, and I will uh, show you how we use that in a, in a bit. So, editor utility widgets, I look at these as like the real meat of what Unreal can do as editor tools, because they're very accessible, they're very easy to make, you don't have to go into C++ or anything. They fit nicely in with the UI, you can dock them. Um, I tend to start these by just sketching out an interface in widgets and then just try and find out what a good layout is going to be. Again, no functionality. I just want to see what data we're kind of looking at or what layout will work best. Uh, and with everything, you want to be responsive and contextual. You don't want buttons in that widget that kind of do nothing in certain scenarios. You should always try and implement uh, like enabled states and stuff like that for just disabling parts of the UI that don't make sense in a given context. And they're very easy to create. You just right click in the content browser, edit to utilities, edit to utility widget, and then you just get a widget blueprint that you can fill up with things, right click on it, and run it. So in this case, what I've done is I've just made a little edit to utility widget that just has a text, a list view, and a button. And we're using exactly the same functions I wrote before. I've just got a timer here that ticks every, I don't know, half a second, because I didn't want it to be too expensive. And it just uses that function, which is get selected actors with material overrides that I've already written, and it's in a blueprint function library, so I just call it. And then the remove material overrides just uses that same selection and calls the same remove material overrides thing. There's like two nodes that I need to implement for this. So it's actually super easy to make something like this when you've designed your initial uh, tooling in a modular way that you can then compose. Um, now, I can talk about something specific, because we've actually been doing this quite a lot on our games. Uh, I don't like how that text looks. That's better. Um, so here is our character customization editor that we use on the finals. It's basically uh, a list view, some tools, and some information at the top. And the way I've put this together means that you can just have tabs that you can switch to view the content that you're currently looking at. So it's basically just a view on data assets. So at the very top level, it's a very simple editor utility widget. We just have a list view on the left, a header at the top, and then a kind of container for the tabs and a button for saving things. Um, this I find is really good for that cross-pollination that I talked about before. We've basically got some settings where we have a uh, gameplay tag, actually, that is, because that's hierarchical, and you can walk up the hierarchy of a gameplay tag, and you can just gather a bunch of things from a developer settings object. So we have a developer settings object called the, I think it's editor documentation settings, and you just say, for this gameplay tag, I want these URLs and these Slack channel links. 
And what that means is for anyone implementing a new tool, it's very easy for them to just drop this header in, add a gameplay tag on the help documentation tag property, and it automatically builds that little list of like there's two Slack channel links, a Jira link, and a Notion link there. And so it's very easy to just implement those and call them from anywhere. So if someone else wanted to reference the same links, they just reference the same tag. And then if you want to add more links to that, you just go and edit the properties in the project settings, add links to that tag, and it'll walk up the hierarchy so it will include everything all the way up. So we have a generic Slack channel for editor tools, for example, so that people can jump in for support directly from the tool. Uh, also just some theming for it to make it look nice and stand out in the UI. Uh, the list view thing, this is basically just a wrapper around a normal list view. Uh, it has a filter object, which is also a modular thing, so we just have a single filter that has a very, very simple U uh, API. It just basically gets an object, and you can do whatever you like with that object and just say, does this pass the filter or not? So it's got one input, one output, uh, and anything that passes that filter gets shown up in the list view below. Same with the sorting thing, it's just a little widget that is a standalone thing we can drop in anywhere. So if anyone wanted to add a filter for some other reason in some other UI, they can just drop a filter widget into that and then they just set the filter class, which is just a custom object. Uh, the main thing here is just, uh, I call it the tab widget switcher because there is a widget switcher in Unreal but it's just a panel with nothing on it. So this is just a wrapper that automatically adds tabs to the top of things. And again, we use this all over the place. It's a bit very generic widget type. It just takes a bunch of widget classes and builds widgets for them inside of it and generates the tabs for them. And again, it has simple API for like getting which tab is active and stuff like that. So, for example, to populate that tool list, here is what one of those uh, developer settings looks like in the, set, in the project settings in Unreal. You just add however many tools you want. And the nice thing about this setup is no one has to go and edit the main a utility widget, no one has to touch that. This is all stored in an any file which is text and diffable, so all they need to do is implement a new widget and add it to this list. So it's very easy to add new tools into the character customization editor. And so the way we think about that whole API is actually super simple. Because what I wanted to do when I set this up is just make sure that all of our team can easily extend and work with this tool like if uh, an animator wants to add a new tool for editing character animation specifically to an asset, it shouldn't mean that they have to learn a whole huge complicated system. All they need to know is they have a tool that lives inside here and the only things they need to care about are this on selection changed event from the list view which just passes through the asset we have selected which we know is a character customization asset because that's what the editor is. And then we have the tab widget switch that just tells them when their tab is activated uh, and a save button at the bottom that just tells them that, that their tool should save. So there's very little for anyone to actually care about when it comes to implementing a new tool. They don't need to care about anything around this. So the API here in AngelScript is very simple. If someone wants to make a new customization editor tool widget, they just inherit from this. And the only things they really need to implement is get tool name, which just returns the text for the name of the tool that will go in the tab. And then they just need to implement something that happens on selection changed, and that's where we get our item that comes in. So uh, by doing that, you basically pr create a very clear framework for someone to just go, oh yeah, even if they didn't know anything about this tool before, they can see that by having those public methods, and you can do this in Blueprint as well by making a Blueprint interface or whatever, they can just see these are the things that they can do with the tool and I don't care what they do inside any of these methods as long as they implement them. They can do what they like. All they need to know is they're getting a character customization item and after that, whatever they want to do happens within the widget. So this gives us a very modular setup. Uh, so like the simplest example, for example, is just a details view which just receives the uh, uh, character customization item and displays its properties in that view. So it's just a simple way for people to find those assets without having to go through the content browser. So actually, if we uh, jump back to, I don't know why I'm pointing at the screen. Uh, if we jump back to this, you'll see that we actually have the front end name, which is the localized name, and also the back end name of the asset there. 
and the filter in the top left, if they type in anything, it will filter on front end and back end names. Because depending on who you talk to in the team, some of them refer to the back end name because they're a designer working with that. Some of them refer to the front end name because they're like a UI person who cares about that. And if we only display one of them, people get confused because they don't always match, right? Uh, so we want to make sure that all of the information that we display is very relevant to everyone and that we can filter on that. So, uh, yeah, details views are great. And now I'm gonna jump out a bit into going back into that ecosystem, how we connect things. So we have a tool at Unreal, at, Unreal, at Embark called uh, Skyhook, which Niels Vest developed. It's built in Python, it's open source, so you can get it from our GitHub right now if you want. Uh, in Unreal, it uses the remote control API, uh, and it basically is just a little simple layer that communicates between apps. Uh, they're just URL links that take parameters. So in our example, we have like Unreal as our main uh, hub for developing, and then we send things to Blender, we send things to Houdini, we bring things in from Houdini, we can link from Slack or Jira, we can send or bring things in from Maya. Um, and the way it works is basically the Skyhook app just assembles a little URL from a JSON payload. All you need is a function name, which is a string, and a dictionary of named parameters, and those can be anything. Uh, and then the server, which runs on your PC, potentially in the remote, remote control API plugin in Unreal, just looks for that function in a Python library and then tries to execute it. So it's very, very generic, uh, potentially even scarily generic. Uh, you can do a lot with it, and you can write the client in any language, but you do need an HTTP server to receive those, uh, those links. And so this is what it looks like in practice. Someone might have messaged you on Slack with a link that you can just click, and all it does here is it actually just opens a map and sets the camera to that view because we've got a function that does that. And then they've got a different one which just jumps into the content browser and selects a specific asset. So in both of these cases, it's just a function which, hang on, I'll try and play that again because it's quite quick. Uh, it's, you can see it's a very long and horrible URL because basically the whole URL just contains things like the map name, the camera location, all of that packed into a dictionary. And so you can just paste this into Jira, into Slack, wherever, and people can just click it and it will do stuff. You could even make it open like 20 blueprint windows if you wanted to. Uh, the limit is just what you want to implement in Python, basically. So that is really powerful, actually, and we use that a lot uh, for just getting things in and out of uh, Unreal, we use that for going between Maya, for example, like if you click an animation in Maya, you can jump into uh, Unreal for that animation and vice versa. So I know that was a lot of stuff and I kind of roller coasted around everywhere. Uh, hopefully something in there was useful. I think the technical takeaways that I would say from this are like, you should just focus on the functionality first. I think it's okay if you wanna build a gigantic blueprint that does everything in one event graph, but I would not leave it that way. Use the collapse down to function stuff to bring it into specific functions that do specific things, and then ideally put those into blueprint function libraries so that you can use them from anywhere. Uh, you always wanna make your tools functional and responsive, uh, sorry, contextual and responsive, because you don't want tools just showing up in a context that doesn't make sense, right? Or allow people to click buttons that aren't gonna work. Um, I think if you are a multi-project studio or if you're working on lots of things yourself, you should try and think about how you can make your tools a little bit more agnostic, like maybe take a class a little higher level than the one that your project is using. Like if you have my project character as a subclass of character, maybe make your tools work on the character class. That might be all you need. Or work on a component basis. And obviously iterate on that a lot. Like I can't extol that enough, like iteration is what makes things great. And the tighter your iteration loops and the better your communication with the team, I think the better your tools get. So talk to the team. Like you want feedback. If, if people aren't telling you things, seek them out, ask them about how they feel about the tools that they're using. Ask for specific feedback, gather bugs, fix them quickly so that people can trust that you are doing things that are helping them. Uh, and by doing that, you can build this kind of ecosystem that everyone can find data easily, jump from Unreal to documentation, jump from documentation to task tracking, jump from task tracking to DCC apps. Like the, the more interlinked you make that, I think the more power you get out of it. 
Uh, if it's hard to find things, then everyone gets confused and things slow down. I think everyone can actually build tools in Unreal with the, the features they provide are very accessible. And if you just want to make something small, just using an asset action utility can get you a long way. If you just want to rename a bunch of things, it's actually just six or seven blueprint nodes. So I think if you ever felt like you're like, oh, I don't want to do tools, it might actually save you a bunch of time and it might be easier than you think. And you can help your team as well by educating them. Because uh, I think it, yeah, if everyone understands more about how to build things in a nice way, then you end up with a better collection of tools that you can work with yourself. Uh, so yeah, just want to thank everyone at Embark. I think there's some of them watching on the stream. Uh, I'm gonna thank my brother for lending me his copy of Code Complete, and I honestly really recommend it. It's a very well-balanced book. It's not super opinionated, because I think that's a fundamental thing in game development and software development in general. It doesn't pay to be absolutist. You want to be flexible. Sometimes you want to do something quickly and dirtily. Sometimes you want to plan it. You need to just know when to do which one. Uh, and yeah, obviously, thanks to Epic Mega Games for existing for a long time and removing the mega. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much.
channel after the event. So for some quick intros, my name is Jessica Archer and I am part of the business development side of Unreal Engine for games. And today it is my immense honor to be up on stage here with uh, some of the team from Crystal Dynamics. Um, and they're going to be sharing with us about um, their move from a couple of decades in internal tech over to UE5, which was no small feat. Um, we're going to kick off the discussion with a few questions that I have for them first because someone gave me a microphone and now I'm up here unsupervised. So uh, after that, we will open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, and most importantly, Crystal is here today to talk about the tech. Um, they will not be answering any questions about current or future projects. So when it's time for questions from you, if you could be respectful of that and keep the conversation related to their experience moving to a new engine, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, so if we could give them a nice warm welcome, we will then move into their introductions and start the discussion. All right, so. I guess I'll go first. I'm uh, Scott Stevens. I'm a tech director at Crystal. I've been there for two years now. And uh, I actually came as an outsider for this because as a newcomer, uh, I've been in Unreal at other studios uh, for about five or six years. So I was uh, kind of a third party observer to the process of the switch. And uh, hopefully I was of some help. Uh, my name is Alicia Thayer. I am a lead technical designer at Crystal. I've been here for about 10 years, um, and I'll be representing content creation, uh, prototyping, technical design. Hi, all. I'm Till Brenner. I'm one of the technical directors as well. I've been at Crystal for almost 13 years now, and you'll be hearing a lot about the technical side, our decision-making process, and the pain points that we went through. Um, that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alyssa Reuter. I'm technical art director here at Crystal. Been here for about eight years now, and I'll be representing uh, tech arts, tools and pipelines, our materials, and also maybe a little bit about our environment team. Awesome. Uh, I'm Ben Irving, uh, executive producer here at Crystal. Uh, I've been at Crystal for about two and a half years, so similar to Scott, kind of a newer addition to the team, had worked at studios on, Re on Unreal before as well, and joined right around the time we started talking about, hey, what if we move from our proprietary tech over to the Unreal Engine? Um, so I can talk a bit more to the, the kind of strategic conversations we had or some of the production realities, if you'll have questions about that. 
Back Great. to you, Jess. Thank you. So we'll start off with the big question that everyone has, and that is, why did you switch from internal tech to UE5? Yeah, so I mean, it's the obvious starting point, and I'll give a little bit of context, and then we can hand over to the team to kind of dive into some of the, the specifics that I'm sure is what you're all after. But you know, in Crystal's history, uh, we actually had talked about moving to Unreal several times and decided to not do it. Uh, we decided to, to invest in our own tech and, and build up our engine. And so then the question becomes, well, what changed? What was different this time around? Um, and I think a lot of that answer is just the difference in the industry. You know, the, the further time goes on, the more technical games are, the bigger games are, the more complicated it is, um, as well as the, like, the quality standards we put on ourselves for the games that we want to deliver continue to go up. And so we quickly got to the point of saying, you know, do we want to be a game team that builds engines or do we want a game team that builds games? Uh, and we kind of sided with the passion for us, which is the game making, telling amazing stories in, in immersive worlds. That's the thing that we're really passionate about. And some of the production reality there was, and I'll use made up numbers just for the, the sake of it, you know, do you put 50 engineers on creating an engine or do you take those 50 people and put the energy on creating the game? And ultimately for us, we wanted to put those people on making the game, and we felt like over time, we wouldn't be able to keep up with other engines in the market, like Unreal. Um, we did a, a long evaluation, and again, I'll, I'll hand off here in a second to talk about some of those details. Um, but none of that was easy. There was lots of, it wasn't all a slam dunk. For example, Till and Scott will speak a bit to some of the engineering challenges. On the tech side, a lot of it we felt would be, there were pros and cons, and we weren't sure. Whereas on the content creation side, design, art, et cetera, we felt like it was a slam dunk with the, the tools that Unreal has. And, and again, that's where the, the other team members can talk to that. And so it wasn't a slam dunk. I think we're all happy to have gone through it, but it certainly wasn't easy. And so if you're in that spot, you know, they're the kinds of questions we're happy to answer. We want to be super candid in the conversation. Uh, we want to share the positive things that have worked well for us, as well as the things that we're finding challenging. Um, Jess has encouraged us, even though she's from Epic, uh, to be as honest and candid as possible. And so we'd love to hear uh, tough questions as well as, as easy questions from you all. But why don't I hand off and, and we'll go to Till first to talk a little bit about, you know, the engineering challenges or, or discussions we had in the evaluation. Sure thing. So one of the big things is the history of, of Crystal and how many years we've actually spent and invested in, in our proprietary engine called Foundation. Um, at least 20 years, if I remember correctly. Um, as I said, I've been there for 13 years. In those 13 years, we actually did two rewrites of the engine where we added major architectural changes. Uh, during one of them, we actually did do an evaluation of Unreal as well. Um, and specifically, we were looking at Kismet at that time. And one of our scripting, visual scripting languages ended up being very, very similar to that concept. And we called it a action. action graph at this point. Not to be confused with action script, but action graph. Um, so that's the, the 13 years there. We added a lot of tech. I personally spent a lot of time actually in the code writing new systems, and it is, I had to give up my baby on this one. So this, this was definitely one of those, uh, me as the engineer on this panel, I, I struggled a lot with, with this particular decision. Uh, so I'll hand it off to somebody else. Yeah, I don't know, Scott, you wanna add just the flavor of being the, the engineer with Unreal experience coming into the team full of uh, proprietary engine experience and like some of those conversations you had to have with the team. Yeah, that, there was a lot of uh, sort of reassuring that they would still have a job, that there's still plenty of engineering to be done even when you're using Unreal, that, that there's no uh, lack of technical work still, still to be done. Um, there, uh, it's also takes a little bit of a mind mind shift change that um, you know when you're in an engineer on Unreal, you might spend as much time researching the problem and seeing how how it's done elsewhere in the engine as as, as you will just implementing something because you know you want to know if it's already there first, already there implemented in the engine. From a content creator's perspective, um, we ended up looking at a lot. I mean, I do a lot of like rapid prototyping and early gameplay exploration, in addition to you know supporting the designers with tools and things like that. So I I felt like a kid in the candy store candy store when we were doing our evaluation and deciding whether or not to to change. 
Um, I, having Blueprint available to me in UMG, being able to make editor tools and runtime tools um, without needing to interface with code. Um, these were things that we didn't have accessible to us in our previous engine. Um, in addition, Sequencer. Um, uh, Till said we evaluated Unreal, what, three for Matinee back in the day, right? Like, basically from that point on, the design team uh, and the content creators were begging for something like Matinee, you know, so Sequencer, like, uh, yeah, it was just, it, it was kind of like, hey, finally, you know, um, and so we spent some time figuring out, like, the, the applications, whether it be cinematic or in gameplay for Sequencer, and, you know, basically every time we opened up a, a, new, a new tool, we just found infinite uses for it. So, Yeah, and I think another thing, like, from a tech art perspective, even though we're doing a lot of tools and pipelines where we're not directly involved in the engine, like, we do do a lot of content creator support. Um, and looking at Unreal, um, like, it offers some really polished, like, UX, like, right out of the box, which was really helpful because, um, Artists could either like just figure it out intuitively. There's tons of documentation that they can refer to. Um, and a lot of content creators also learn how to use Unreal in school. Um, so that translates to a little bit less support time for tech art. Um, and we can spend more time working on really cool things. So that was really nice. There is an, an additional element, and this actually pains me as an engineer to say, you know, I, I actually completely agree with our content creators that um, Unreal really makes it easy for people to actually work with those tools. Uh, in, in our pr uh, prior engine, people were struggling. It was a really powerful engine, but you had to have a PhD, for instance, in our physics. Okay, system, yeah, right? it was it was it was crazy powerful, but it was nuanced, right? Like, I mean, Till said it's like what, like 20 years old or something like that, right? So building on it since like. Gex, you know, like forever ago, um, and it, 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 we found that it would there, the ramp time to get someone familiar with our tools it took a while, right? And the physics engine one, it, he brings that up because I I bring it up a lot, right? Like it had real world world values in it, right? And so if you didn't have a lot of experience in physics, for example, like you may not be able to intuit that a tunable needs to be point zero 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 one, for example, or something like that, right? So um, yeah, the everything's very visual in, in Unreal. The whole blueprint is everything concept I'm a big fan of. It just means that you, you know I can learn one thing in one place and then apply it to everything else, and that's been very great. And then speaking of, of the history there, speaking of Gex specifically, we had a unit. Our, our entire worlds were built with Gexels. And then one of those big reworks was actually purging Gexels out of the engine. And with Unreal, we just have centimeters and meters, and it's just a standard unit, so. It's, it's a little thing, yeah. Yeah, that was actually another thing that we uh, struggled with a little bit in foundation, um, just because we've been going project to project. Um, we've accumulated a lot in the engine, and at one point we tried to separate our content from our engine code, and that ended up being really difficult, actually. Um, it was basically hard-coded in. Um, so we ended up with a lot of old stuff in our newer games. Not ideal. So we're gonna keep moving because I know I know it's easy to keep talking. I'm sorry, really but, um, <laughs> one other another question that I had was, um, how long did it take you to get up to speed for your teams? Should I give a, a so? We did some high level stuff and then I think if you'll speak to the specific thing. So um, one of the things we did, and, and I don't know, there, there might be better ways to do it, but our approach was uh, let's take a six month initiative where we try to build something that's a playable experience and we use that as what we called Unreal Learning or Unreal Training, I forget, whatever we called it. One of those two things. Um, and the whole goal was like this was a, an added part of the cycle of our project. It wasn't about hitting project specific goals, but it was about teaching the team. Um, and we started early on just with doing things like, oh, we'll just do the online learning courses and whatever. But, but we found that without trying to rally the team around a deliverable, we weren't like forcing groups to come together to build something playable to learn a bunch of the harder lessons you don't learn until you're trying to actually do that. And so um, that was a thing that I think worked well for us. We had a playable thing at the end. It was themed to the kinds of games we're interested in building, as you can imagine, um, but it wasn't specific to the, the game we were trying to make at the time, um, but it helped rally the team into that. And, and one point I want to make before we, we hand off is like, we didn't think that we would become unreal experts in six months. 
We just felt like that was about the amount of time our team needed to experiment, to learn, before we could go back to, to building the game. And I think it's probably fair to say everyone's still learning now, even though we're, we're pretty deep into it and we'll probably keep learning forever. I don't think you, you master it all necessarily. But that was just a dedicated, at least from like a production or team perspective, a dedicated amount of time we had to, to give our team some space to learn and adjust to a brand new engine. So, so. how's it going with the design and scripting though? So Alicia. I can do that one. Uh, yeah, so the design and scripting is interesting. Like I, I have to talk a little bit about our old, we had a visual scripting language before, right? Blueprint is familiar. It's not a huge uh, jump to go from one to the other. However, the readability of our old scripting language was um, a, a little less than Blueprint. That The execution pin concept, right? We didn't have that. So any output could trigger any input, which meant that you ended up with a lot of loop de -de 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 scripts. Um, but, it was, for, it was further abstracted um, from C++ than Blueprint is. And I think that it was more accessible to our designers and our content creators than Blueprint is. And so I am noticing on my team that for the less technical scripters, um, they are struggling a little bit with adopting Blueprint. It's a little scary for them, right? Um, and they're needing more, more help and more time and, and, and more tutelage. And Blueprint is definitely a lot closer to code than, than our previous uh, visual scripting language. Uh, think of it as... Lego pieces, you have a lot more Lego pieces, whereas on, on our previous engine, we had pre-assembled Lego constructs that we could then uh, assemble to, to, to be bigger pieces. Um, however, <laughs> again, as an engineer, I actually really like how close Blueprint is to code. And it is so easy to actually implement new nodes, new functionality, just by adding a certain type of uh, macro or, or uh, markup to, to the actual code, whereas on foundation, it was actually a thing. You had to write your own classes and that would actually expose the functionality and then test it and all that kind of stuff. It is so much easier to do that in Unreal. That's a really good segue into something I wanted to make sure that we covered on this talk and that was, um, so in our previous, in our previous engine, um, we had a, a pretty big wall between uh, content creators and engineers. And with Blueprint being adjacent, more adjacent to C++, I'm finding that my relationship with, with my engineers is improving greatly. Um, and I have one in particular that I work very closely with. And the way she and I work together is we set up kind of the, the code backbone for anything that we're working on. We extend Blueprints from that, just like Epic recommends, right? Um, but what it lets me do is it lets me, it gets me little noodle places, right? To, to prototype in Blueprint and to play with new features. And then when I feel like it's, it's what I want and I can represent what I want, I go back to her and say, hey, check this out. I think I, I think this is how we want to build this content. We'll review it together. And then she ports that to code, right? And we just do that at regular intervals. And it's, it is, it's beautiful, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's, it's pretty much one of the best ways I've ever worked with engineers in my life, like in my career. I guess those are the first two hot tips right there. Right. <laughs> Number one, set up your base class first, inherit uh, your blueprint off of that, because that makes it so much easier than to actually transfer everything over to code. Uh, the other hot tip, if you haven't looked at it, redirectors, core redirectors, that's a really, really important uh, concept. Look into it. Was there, was there much of a difference um, switching over to Unreal with like junior versus senior team members? That's actually a really good point. Thank you. Um, I noticed actually a really interesting correlation of seniority and how easy it was for people to switch over. The more junior engineers, especially in the engineers, they had a lot more experience either from school or it was just a lot more, they were a lot more comfortable in the switch. Our senior engineers, they actually struggled, myself included. We just struggled a little bit more trying to adapt to the new uh, concepts that Unreal brought them. But to be fair, like a lot of these people are fighting with like a decade of experience or a decade plus experience in a different engine, right? And our old engine, you know, like it was extremely powerful, but it does approach problems differently than Unreal does. And so the rewiring is really tough. <laughs> As I said, 12 years on an engine, I had to give up my baby there. Cool. So any anything else on that topic before we move? Actually, probably a good topic here to cover then is how did we even, you actually said the, the, the six months worth of a training phase then, right? But we actually did have a phase even before that where we started evaluating the engine and it was actually uh, three months for the larger team and at least another two months uh, before that where a really small core 
set of engineers and content creators were actually looking at, uh, yeah, I think that's at right. Unreal. Then. Mm. And one of the big things that we decided to do that, we actually listed over 90 topics, uh, stack ranked them, actually weighted them uh, to figure out, let's, let's look at this from an engineering perspective. What are the pros? What are the cons? Uh, some of the early, early or the, the highly stack ranked items were definitely our streaming system, mm -hmm. but I think the top one was the multi-user workflow. Oh, certainly, yeah. And I think that's a perfect segue. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the, the pre-evaluation, right, was, was a little targeted effort of just a, a handful of experts um, all dog dogpiling on a little, a little, a little effort, a little um, uh, project to see, just to test the waters with multi-user workflow. We were really afraid of that. Our old engine was really good at it. All of our, um, our assets were XML. Right? So our developers got really accustomed to be able to check something out, right? keep it checked out for long periods of time, um, and then just kind of most of the time, most of the time, merge it pretty seamlessly with someone else's work. Right? Um, I see some people chuckling. Yeah, it's because I say most of the time, we did have some experts in-house right, who would help you know, when things just totally blew up. You know? um, but the cool thing about having those be text-based is we were able to like, jump in and open them up in a text editor, and they're like, oh, OK, this is what went wrong, you know, and, and then fix them by hand. And um, so we were really worried about exclusive checkout, right, um, with a team culture that just does not jive with that, you know, and then not being able to merge. Um, I will admit that on, in that eval period, it was tough. Like, we did stomp on each other a lot, but we learned that what that taught us really early was the value in, in, our, in architecting our content correctly, right, and uh, compartmentalizing things, making things components, things like that, right? Um, so it was, it was a very good teaching experience, but we did, like, that was a really valuable um, exercise for us because it started to challenge the assumptions that we had been using for a long, long time. That's a, that's a great transition and start to the next question, um, which is, you know, what can UE5 do that your engine could not, and vice versa? Do you want to go first, Scott? Not uh, sure. I, I hope I'm taking one's thunder here, but uh, one of the bigger ones was animation previewing and being able to, uh, you know, tweak an animation and just view it right there. I think they had to go end to end to the target platform to see the actual tweak. Uh, so that, I mean, all those workflows like that were, were uh, you know, definitely advantages that Unreal, Unreal had. Uh, a sequencer, obviously, we already mentioned that one. Uh, There's also a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, the VFX system was another one. Um, I would actually argue Blueprint is one of those in terms of how close it is to code, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> a whole bunch of really cool tech. So um, let's see, we got Nanite, we got Lumen, like Till mentioned, the VFX system, we got virtual textures. Um, it's easy to add plugins, which you can talk about. Um, virtual shadow maps, like so many cool things right out of the box. Um, so that was really awesome to take a step forward um, just by switching. Validation. Oh, 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 validation and automation. There you Thank go. You. No, I absolutely adore the, the the automated system and the automation system. We just didn't have any of that on foundation. We tried a couple of times to, to build something like that. It just didn't work, but it just comes out of the box. Um, there is a lot of work that goes into writing proper validation and writing proper uh, automated systems, but the fact that the foundation is, uh -huh, foundation is there, uh, makes it just so much easier and so much uh, nicer to work with Unreal on that. One thing I will say about the validation stuff too, because I've come to appreciate it even as a content creator. Um, getting we got it set up really early, and we like we decided to just kind of go all in. We were just gonna like, okay, let's let's do this, right? It's the greatest teaching tool. Right, like our content creators are just naturally messaged when they mess something up, right? When they don't set up an asset, right, or something like that, and it makes what it creates is a self-documenting tool, which is the best thing ever because we all know you can, you know, pour your heart out into Confluence, right? But like, if if people don't know that those those things are there, then you know, uh, your, your team isn't learning. So the, from a content creator's perspective, the validation, I mean, I get hit by the validator all the time, right? Um, but it's great because it reminds me that like, I'm creating problems for myself in the future and I should fix those before I check them in. I mean, for sure, there's also just console support and there's a, a whole bunch of work that we can now leave in Epic's hands to just take care of all the nuances of each platform. We know if it works, you know, on PC, it's probably going to work 
plus or minus a little bit of, of tweaking on, on other platforms. That was uh, one of the advantages for sure. So what about some of the things that you miss now from Foundation or that you're frustrated by with moving to Unreal? Um, so for me personally, I do kind of miss our material system that we had in Foundation. It was very, very powerful, but like we mentioned earlier, um, even though it was very powerful, it was sometimes a little hard to use. Um, so I do miss that. I guess the two things specifically are, I think we had a little bit more control over um, the user-facing UI UX for our materials. Um, so we could organize things um, in a way that our artists really liked. Uh, the other thing is um, the amount of um, modifications we were able to make as technical artists. Like we could do a lot of things um, that we don't have access to um, in Unreal without making source code as it edits, um, which we want to be really careful about. Um, so I do miss that a little bit, um, but there are other aspects of the material system that are great. So. On, on the gameplay side, there's, you know, I think we kind of underestimated the amount that, uh, that Epic leaves up, up to the team to decide about things like, there's no class weapon, there's a very basic projectile, there's some very basic damage systems, but in terms of the kind of games Crystal tends to make, there's a lot of infrastructure that was built around those games in the old engine that we're, you know, having to recreate. And it, it's, it's um, you know, it's appropriate that the engine leaves all those things up to you to decide, but as part of the switch, there's, there's a lot of work in front of us in that, in that space. On the flip side, it does allow us to actually get rid of some of that cruft then as well. So for instance, our old inventory system, we rewrote that a nice reset know, how many button. times. Yeah, yeah. But that's a great reset button. Um, one of the things that I actually really miss was our, or is, was, was our streaming system. Uh, the, the streaming system on the Foundation Engine was really, really powerful. Um, we were actually looking for equivalent workflows, uh, so we had something called stream layers. They actually had built-in logic in terms of when they would actually stream in, when they would stream out. Um, and then with UE5, we actually got our data layers in as well, right? And that is one of those really great one-for-one, -one, almost one-for-one, um, systems that, that really help us maintain the workflow and the, and the way we were thinking about our games. So, Alicia, I, I know you love blueprints so very much, but is there is there anything that they're not not all the way there for for you? I love everything about it. Performance. <laughs> I haven't had hit, okay, yeah, that performance I'm sure is an issue, which we'll get to, but um, I, I, it's the, the accessibility is, is the thing I'm struggling the most with, right? Um, like, I am, I am feeling on my team a need for, like, a layer of technical designers that sit, you know, in between the engineers and the, you know, the, the level designers and the, and the, the content creators, um, just because a lot of them, like I was saying before, like, they... The, there's a little bit of history here. Um, like we, when we switched, like we really wanted to try to do things the unreal way, the right way. And so that was the message to the team was like, you know, do your research, take your time, try to figure out the right way to do things. But the weird flip side, the weird effect of that is, is that, you know, you combine that with the unfamiliar, unfamiliarity of the tools, right? And you kind of get paralysis. And so like I was saying earlier with our less technical um, scripters, they, I find that a lot of them just kind of freeze up a little bit and go like, I'm not sure what the right thing is to do. Um, which is motivating me to try to make more helper, you know, like helper function libraries and, or, you know, our little macros for them or even tutorial videos, things like that to ease that along. But that, it has not, that has not been as easy and it's kind of fire and forget as our action graph visual scripting language was. So I'll do a quick plug for support here. When your team members don't know what the right Unreal Path is, what do you have them do now? There's actually a couple of steps. One, Talk to your Unreal experts if you have them on the team. It is so valuable. Ask often, ask frequently. And then on top of that, obviously rely on Epic. Post on UDN, post often, post frequently. Get those questions out, uh, out there so that we can actually look at those answers and then implement it the right way. Yeah, and, and UDN is for everyone. It doesn't need to be something that, you know, you hold off and only a few of the senior team members have access to. Like, add, add the whole teams, right? Because everyone's going to have questions. So um, anything else on that, 
on that topic, old engine versus new? I think there's plenty, but I think we should open it up for, yeah. for everybody. Yeah, so we got about 20 minutes left. Um, so we will open it up to questions from the audience. There is a mic in the center aisle here. So if you have questions, again, not about any current or future projects, uh, go ahead and fire away. Hello. Uh, I was just curious, uh, so y'all moved from proprietary to UE5. Uh, what was the process of getting the rest of the team up to speed? Was it documentation, or did you all have in-house workshop classes and such? So there's a couple of things we did, just uh, high level, and you'll dive in. So um, we definitely engaged with Unreal on a bunch of the, the training courses that they offer and went through that. Um, we did a boot camp inside of our org for people that were brand new to UE or, you know, e even now new hires that come on board. So we had a flow they would go through depending on your discipline that's like, go in and do this training course and the output is build X and X changes for whatever discipline you're from. So we did some boot camp stuff like that that was just that core basic training stuff. Um, as a project, we obviously did that six month thing um, that we talked about. Um, but beyond that, do you all want to speak to specifics for like, engineers or design or tech art? Part of the six month thing, one of the first things that I remember we did when we kicked it off is the discipline leads got together and created kind of kickoff pages for each discipline um, of just like, okay, cool, here's various topics we need you to get familiar with, and then here's you know a handful of tutorials that you, you, sh you need to go through, right? Um, but the most important thing, I think, that really solidified training in the early days when we like just started the transition was putting the entire team on a focused effort together, right? Um, like whether we kept that work or not, but getting everyone very product oriented so that we could kind of simulate like what production would be like and, and not, you know, and, and and not noodle on get, being stuck in learning mode, but actually trying to create something together. And that uh, is actually a side project that we still have, and it's still active in our Perforce uh, server. And that is exactly where we send everybody who joins the company is going through the exact same steps in as well. Uh, for instance, for engineers, we actually have, think of it as a syllabus of here are, you know, the, the 10 items or so. Um, actually go into the engine, create an actor, create a component, uh, create a plugin, et cetera, et cetera. And then they actually have to go through, even our Unreal experts have to go through it. They might be able to do it in two days, but a lot of the people then take about a week or week and a half to actually go through through that process then. Yeah, I think we're trying to do lots of little stuff as well. So um, I think a lot of us work from home still, and I think one of the advantages of doing that is we use Zoom a lot, and Zoom is great to record things. So we do like micro talks, that are like 10 minute tutorial or, hey, here's a thing you might not know or here's a reminder about a workflow or, hey, remember to do all these things before you check in or whatever it might be. And they're just little 10 minute like things we do at our team meetings, we record them, post them in Slack. And, and I think instead of trying to overload with a lot of ongoing stuff, like for example, we experimented with, let's do dedicated two hours of training every week and it was not very successful after the first kind of three months. But the little 10 minute chunks seem to work really well because people will go watch those videos, digest it, and it can be like an important thing that's relevant to whatever we're doing you know, at the time. So for instance, we kicked that one off with a five minute talk about the reference viewer. My, personally, my favorite to, uh, tool completely. Um, and that's just a five minute talk, give it to everybody, and that just kicked it off. Everybody is encouraged to actually share their knowledge then as well. Cool. And I have a switched engines mid-project, was this a mid-project transition or was it before starting a new project? So this was an early transition. Yeah, I think that getting into the specifics of that is tricky, but we, we swapped early. Thank you guys so much. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so I, I, I think in my career I, I've gone through, what you've been going through a bunch of time, I think it's three. And I noticed the pattern in my, my case, which is always the same, which is uh, the artists will rejoice and the programmers will resign. So, have you noticed this as well? Yes. <laughs> are, yes. You, are you a songwriter on the side? That was <laughs> excellent. Uh, well, I, I've been preparing for that. How many did you lose in a percentage? How many what, sorry? How many programmers did you lose in percentage? Oh, yeah, so I think, like, if Till, you want to speak to, like, what was it like for the, the old guard that were hesitant to transition to Unreal? Um, 
it was tough. I, I'm being very, very honest there. It was very, very tough. Uh, um, actual engineers that we lost on the team itself is actually zero. However, we did lose some of our really, really close friends in uh, a codev partner uh, that we really enjoyed working with them. Um, on the flip side, we did gain a lot more expertise and new friends with other codev partners that have a lot more Unreal experience in as well. So real, real, real quick, did anyone say they were going to leave? Yes. But they didn't. They did not. Woo. We did also, I mean, to be fair, like, Till, you put a lot of effort into, like, how, like, we would identify people that we thought were high risk and say, like, how do we figure out projects for these people that are engaging? For example, if, if they were doing work that maybe mirrored stuff that Unreal gives you for free, well, what are other difficult problems that we can give them to push the game forward? And so you put a lot of energy into that. I think that helped with that, um, which was great. So that's a, that was a tip and trick we had on our list to share. Yeah, and I think we noticed that a little bit for TechArt too. Um, and actually going through the process of the evaluation was really helpful because instead of like being afraid that, oh no, like all the work is already done, like we listed out very specifically, like this is what we need to move forward. Um, and realized like, okay, there are actually some very cool things that we can still work on. And we can even like, since the boilerplate stuff is done, focus on the stuff that we're actually really passionate about. So that's been really exciting for uh, the tech art team to focus on those types of like future looking projects um, and then like we didn't reduce our tech art team size like we've actually doubled so it is however a really good point our core tech engineers were the ones that suffered the most because previously they actually owned core elements of the engine whereas <laughs> now a lot of that stuff is just provided and they fell into that well, what do I do now Right, and that, that is absolutely to Ben's point. We had to look really, really hard to find those meaty, meaty projects, uh, some R&D work that, that really sparked our interest in as well. Do you expect any resignment in the future? Do we expect people to resign in the future? Let's, let's say specifically because of the moving Unreal. Because maybe not now, but let's say in, in, uh, in six months when you start making the game and they start, we start notice that they're yeah. just making uh, you know, profile optimization and memory tweaking. So uh, my personal take is I think we're beyond that being the reason. I think at this point, you know, we transitioned 15 months ago. Like I think it's been long enough that at this point it's about general happiness on the project and people that leave, it's probably not gonna be unreal. I mean, I think it, it's possible that, that some people do. I think that's not a hot topic for us when we talk about how do we make our team happy? How do we retain people? Like. Like Unreal has stopped being a, a subject. It's more about how do we make sure everybody has meaningful work. You've been extremely lucky. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One more thing on that one. You will need engineers for optimization, guaranteed. Um, can you talk to your build pipelines, DevOps, asset processing, all that? So what was that like? Thank you so much for that question because <laughs> that is a fantastic topic. Um, hot tip invest in your pipeline early, early, early on. Get that stood up, get your, your build pipeline uh, ready to go. It ties into automation, it ties into the uh, DDC cache as well. It ties into actually making builds. Uh, it ties into when you're making engine upgrades, you can actually automate a whole bunch of stuff with it. You know, Speaking of, invest in automation then as well. Invest in your validation. Your build system will be able to run that validation as well. Uh, we chose to go with a uh, Jenkins bait uh, based uh, build system. Uh, it does allow it, it. We had a previous build system. This was a perfect time to actually do this switch. So if you're thinking about that, do that switch at the same time. Uh, I know there's actually horde in the code, which is wink, wink, question, question. When is it actually going to come Hurry out? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't Appreciate hear it. you. <laughs> Hi, thank you for all the insights. Uh, it's really nice to hear all of that. I was curious uh, if you're comfortable sharing, uh, is there like a missing piece of the engine that you decided maybe to rewrite completely a feature that already existed or something that's a huge tech investment that you say we need, really need this feature that's currently not there? Like you've discussed a bit about it. But, uh, I have the perfect guy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, 
early on in that evaluation and, and even beyond that, we prototyped a lot on the character movement component that comes with Unreal. We know it's, it's very integrated with the rest of the character pawn, like there's a whole bunch of code around it, but uh, we were finding that, that for the games we want to make with a lot of advanced movement modes and things like that, it was, it was not built for that, for any kind of data-driven, uh, you know, that custom move mode kind of things that are, that are cumbersome and engineering heavy to do, and we didn't, we didn't want that to be our workflow. So that is one of the big investments we're making, and, and it, um, you know, we tried to do it in such a way that we're, it's still technically an extension, and we're just kind of slowly migrating more of the code into our code, but it's still functionally equivalent, except that we can do more. But it, it's, you know, it's one of those things, it's like that's the important part of the games we make, so we felt like that was one of the big bets to make, and it's, it's been a, a journey for sure to, to, you know, to get to the point where we're starting to be happy with it, but um, you know, I think in the long term it'll pay off because it's in, what's important for our game. But I can't reiterate this enough. Do it the Unreal way first. Yep. This is actually our did. motto. We did that. Yep. Do it the Unreal way first. Only then see how you can modify the code. And only then actually make that choice to, to rewrite or write something completely new. All right. Thank you. Hi. Related question, actually. So were you able to port any gameplay systems from Foundation Engine to Unreal Engine like easily? Or was it rewriting most of the time? Def definitely re been rewriting more so. There's been a few things where we'll, we'll have the foundation code up side by side and, and take inspiration from if it's a, a specific algorithm that we know we want pretty one for one. But for the most part, you know, as they spoke to the many years that were invested in foundation, there's enough cruft in there that we didn't want to just take something one for one. It, we could have just, like almost all the game systems, we could have just ignored Unreal completely and, and thrown those in there, and I don't think we would have been better off. We would have been just fighting the engine. The, the, we wouldn't have had the same blueprint and, and uh, uh, you know, all the property sheet integration and all that kind of stuff, so. There are a few very self-contained uh, systems that we can do that with, mm -hmm. uh, but for a lot of the gameplay stuff itself, we just don't see, it, it's too much of a risk to actually try to, to port our old code into, into Unreal. Another related question. So let's say you had, let's say the uh, weapon system, inventory system that you want to remake. Could you estimate how long it would take in Unreal or that was like a new world so you can't really estimate just because you have the old system? We definitely underestimated how long <laughs> it would take, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, the gameplay side. Right? Yeah. Um, but there are certain other ones. Reset button, the inventory system was so complex, as you mentioned it. Uh, we just decided, you know what? It's a bag of holding. Let's keep it really simple and then build on top of that then. Okay, thank you. In regards to debugging, with your old engine and new engine, were there any tools that you had to either relearn or adapt to, or maybe even rebuild in the new engine? And more specifically, for a newer developer, are there any tools that help y'all a lot with debugging that you would like to bring attention to? I guess the biggest thing is that the editor is the game, right? So again, we, we use Visual Studio for, for debugging all of our stuff, right? But one of the big lessons for a lot of the engineers was you will actually have to restart the editor most of the times, not always, there's some new tech, which is really exciting, but you would have to actually restart the editor when you're recompiling. Uh, and that was a big shift for us then, where we could just keep the editor running uh, and then start the game somewhere else with Visual Studio, and, and those two were not coupled. Uh, other tools, uh, honestly, Unreal comes with a lot of debugging tools that are really, really helpful, but occasionally you do need to drop down to a little bit more low-level tools, uh, such as, for instance, Pix or something like that when you're, when you're trying to do a little bit more detailed uh, optimization work then. We, we do invest a lot, and I would recommend in, in debug tools, like in Plain Editor or in on, on platform that there's a, you know, you make your own interface and all, uh, you know, show what's going on um, that, that, uh, that carries over one to one on any engine that you'd want to invest in that. Exactly, CVARs are great, uh, but there is that extra little layer that, uh, that you can put on top to actually visualize a lot of stuff than uh, either in the play and editor or in the game in general. Thanks. Hi. Um, considering Unreal is um, getting more and more companies um, did, um, did you 
evaluate uh, the, the, the risk of not having the uh, ownership of the uh, technology for the future, like uh, relying on Epic, which is going uh, wider and wider in different tech, like uh, re which re doing his own audio tech, physic tech, um, rigging tech, animation tech, etc. So did you evaluate that? Uh, yes, we did. So it, 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 you make a really, really good point here, actually. Uh, there is a certain risk when you're switching to Unreal that you might be working on some code on some tech that Unreal might or Epic might just replace with, here is a completely new, out of the box, here's ready to go, and you've just invested two years in, in writing that, and you're like, oh, but that is, it's painful on one hand, so you will run that risk, but it's also important to keep in mind that um, Epic is making a general purpose engine, right? So they're, they're, they're targeting uh, systems that everybody wants to use, right? Whereas for your game then specifically, you can take a look at what are the things that will differentiate this game in particular from everybody else. And that is where we're trying to put our, uh, our chips. Thanks. Uh, hi, so you, uh, sorry, <laughs> you mentioned about uh, it's worse to have the, the build systems and all of this infrastructure day one in there. Uh, as we're in similar position now, uh, what advice would you give for other similar things? Like, okay, day one, take care of this because it's really going to pay off for you in the long run. Set your naming convention. <laughs> Set that one up, make sure that you have it, and then you can actually build validation on top no, of it. No, you all laugh, but it's totally true, right? Like, uh, so one thing that we do is like, it's, uh, as part of our feature development, we now require like whoever's making that feature, whether it be a technical designer or an engineer or what have you, like like set up your naming convention and add it to the validator, you know, before you pass a certain sort of like checkpoint in your feature development. Like it's way worth it because like if you don't and you don't do that early, right, you're going to end up with an entire database of, you know, misnamed like weirdo assets, right, that you can't track and you can't parse. Like, and it's just, that's been so healthy for our team. And it's such a small thing, right, you know? But, like, it's it's been a really great cultural shift to one, empower people to create their own naming conventions, and then have this little thing, you know, that runs every time they try to submit, uh, enforce that. Um, we've also gotten a lot of mileage out of, uh, we made an experimental folder. And, and so while we're, while the engineers are kind of still working on best practices or writing core systems, you know, we wanted, at their uh, insistence, to give the designers and the content creators a place where they could experiment as well. And you know, we, we didn't want, we didn't know exactly how we wanted them to do stuff, but they still wanted to experiment and, and improve out the idea. So we made a, an experimental folder, and and so the, the the blueprints and the assets that are in there are known to be not vetted by engineers. And some of it, you know, I'm sure will be just fine. And some of it, will say, yeah, we definitely want to nativeize that, or or provide a different model, but it's given the team more freedom to, uh, you know, experiment while the, while, the, while the engineers are comfortable knowing that we're not going to ship with whatever. And we can add Excellent validators and, uh, to actually catch any of that content sneaking into the real levels. And well, I mean, the, the experimental folder is designed to be allowed to sneak into the real levels, right? Like, don't look at me like that. Um, <laughs> It is right, like, and but the idea is that it's often it's it's often a little spot where it can be tracked, isolated, you know, um, all of those things, and so it, that's been really valuable. From I know these two are looking at me right now with like burning eyes, but like it, it's been really valuable for I need space to experiment and play and find fun, you know, um, and and noodle, and I get the freedom to do that in these spaces and make sure that like you know I I. Lit, you know, earmark one of these guys and say, hey, I did this thing, it's over here. We just kind of add it to the list of things to audit. So it's been very empowering. But the nice thing is it can be audited. It's not yes. just anywhere. <laughs> so literally just having that one folder makes uh, that a lot easier then. Yeah, and also like with the separate folder, we can do like different levels of validation checks for that um, versus our production content and also the developer folders do. So all of those can have like totally different levels of validation depending on where we are and we can change that at any time. Oh, but back to your original question. One more uh, we haven't mentioned yet is, is UGS and the, um, the metadata server that provides little badges so that each change list you see in there uh, tells you which jobs completed successfully. I mean, a lot of, besides the validation and the automation, the build systems, surfacing the, the status of them in a convenient and helpful way to content creators, engineers, whoever, 
has been an ongoing effort. Scott, what is UGS? Unreal Game Sync. It's a, a tool provided uh, in, in, in straight from Epic, but uh, it's, it's not it's not part of the normal engine build. It's outside of the engine. So two hot tips then as well. Um, on our previous engine, we always relied on a nightly build and sync uh, with Unreal. Encourage your team, sync often. Sync throughout the day. It's okay. Just sync, sync, sync. It's fine, right? Whereas with the previous one, we had problems with that. Don't do it. But now, go for it. We have about 90 seconds, Jess. I don't know how many questions we can get. One more? I think, uh, what would may you? Maybe one or two more. Depends on uh, how good of a question We'll try to is, give brief answers. We'll try. Sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> we'll be brief. All right. Uh, was your past engine garbage collected? And were there any challenges transitioning to Unreal's system? It was not garbage collected. So a lot of, and, and that's actually a really good point. Uh, the patterns that we use because of that um, are biting us in a little bit right now because the engineers have to rethink how to how to approach that. Now, that being said, just because you have a garbage collector doesn't mean that it's free. You are going to run into issues with, with performance or optimizations that are actually caused by the garbage collector. You'll see spikes. So I'm going to build on that real quick. Um, was there any misconceptions about moving to Unreal that you have since learned? I like to joke about the fact that it's not really C++. It's more like C++, uh, because there's a lot of macros. There's a lot of uh, uh, markup that you actually add that a lot of our senior engineers were just straight up not used to. No templates on new objects. No multiple Feature request. OK. Last question. So uh, just to go back to automation, sorry. Uh, do you, you said there's a lot of automation. Do you mean using uh, UAT, Unreal Automation Tool? And if yes, uh, we've talked about linting, validation, things like this. Is there anything exotic that you guys are doing that would be valuable for us to know as one of the? Uh, one Yes, so it is UAT, or you're using Buildcraft as well. Um, one of the things that we wrote early on is a size map uh, job. So you know how you have the reference viewer and a size map or, uh, in, the, uh, in the editor itself. So you can take a look at your asset, see how big it actually is on disk or in memory. Um, and that helps you then doing optimizations or checking where is all my memory going, right? But the one thing that we didn't see was, all right, so tell me about every asset that you have. So that was one of our very first jobs that we wrote. Let's just run this. It takes about half an hour or something like that for us to run. I actually know a little bit longer at this point, where it literally just goes asset by asset and actually creates a list of this is how much it will pull in. And that's actually another really good point. Watch your dependencies. Absolutely watch your dependencies because that is going to come back and, and bite us. That's really what's happening right now. Um, where we really need to be careful about those. So thank you all for your questions. That was that was really really good content. Um, I know um, we're right at the end here, but I believe Ben, you had one more thing that you wanted to cover. Yeah. So really quick plug. This talk was entitled "Taking the Heroic Leap from a Proprietary Engine to UE5." And if you would like to join us, oh come on, really? If you would like to join us, <laughs> if you would like to join us. It's not me. Someone else is pushing a button to. Oh, you have the thing. Wait, now. can you push Sorry. F5, please? If you would like to join us on that heroic journey, we're hiring. And there's a slide that says that there I. It, there it is. Hey, round of applause. I that was to heroic. I just feel nervous real quick. Um, but we are hiring some key roles. Um, if you're interested, uh, please come up and talk to us. If you know friends who could be interested, please direct them this way. Uh, we're looking for some talented people to join us. So. Other than that, thank you all very much for coming. All right, and a big thank you again to everyone who joined us on the panel and the live stream. And I also wanted to say a special thank you to Scott Amos at Crystal and the whole team who allowed us to have them here today to do this. So thank you. Thank you, Jess. And we'll be hanging up out front. If you want to chat some more, we'll be around for 10, 15 minutes. Thank you.
she's there. All right. Hello, Unreal Fest. Or, since we're live streaming, I can make a programming joke and say, hello, world. E uh, my name is Chris Murphy, and today we're going to be talking about 35 features in Unreal Engine 5 that you probably don't know about. Now, I'm, I'm a level with you. I originally pitched this as X features in UE5 that you don't know about. And at some point, marketing were like, we need a number. And I was like, I haven't written it yet. So <laughs> you'll see how many there are. Well, if you're counting, I guess. Um, the other thing I want to highlight before I kind of get into this is the word probably. I know there are plenty of veterans in the room. I'm still going to do my best to like highlight a bunch of obscure things that are kind of in there. Um, but, you know, it, there's a very good chance that some of you have picked up some of these things. Uh, that said, I'll be impressed if anyone knows all of these things. Now, for anyone there that's like, who is this guy? My name's Chris Murphy. I'm an evangelist. Uh, historically, I handle Australia and New Zealand. And my role as evangelist, which is a weird-sounding job title for anyone unfamiliar with the tech industry, is to basically help developers within my region. Uh, there's, uh, Epic has a reasonably uh, tight-knit presence in, in my part of the world. So consequently, we kind of head around, we help out all sorts of people, and it's a rather strange job. But in the process, there's a lot of conversations we have reasonably frequently that it's like, oh, you didn't, you didn't know about this key binding? You didn't know about this feature? Oh, yeah, that was a small note in a release note somewhere that you didn't read. Sorry about that. And you know, the common joke literally running through this entire conference is, you don't know about that checkbox? So in general, the alternative titles here that could have been is like features that developers groan about when they realize they exist, and things that snuck past you because you were too busy releasing a game, and why are you throwing these things at me? We have to focus on the current version. Chris, stop saying stuff. Um, so let's go ahead and start with some of the fun stuff. Most folks know the water system that's come into Unreal. It's a fun one, but what a lot of folks aren't aware of is that we have buoyancy support in there. If you go ahead and enable the water plugin, you can go ahead and flick on a buoyancy component to your blueprints, at which point you get flotation of things. And you're probably like, cool, Chris, you floated three cubes, but I floated many more cubes than that. <laughs> um, so it's a fun one. It works surprisingly well. It's a, one of those things that like, I've literally seen people engineering this system, and I'm like, we did it already. So they get like angry, happy, if you know what I mean, when you find out the features there already. The next one here is the Niagara debugger. Plenty of VFX artists in the room, I assume. A lot of folks aren't aware of the debugger, though, which allows you to go ahead, launch it up, and freeze frame the effects. You can also go ahead and start to like step through it frame by frame to see what's going on. But another really cool thing here is you can uh, filter by system and filter variables out. So in the system viewer, I want the fireflies in the background. So I type in the word fireflies. You see that it gave me a little nice drop down as well because that effect existed. From here, I can look at that and be like, oh, this is cool, but I really want to know why the lifetime is all screwy on these things. So I can go ahead and say, tell me the lifetime. And it's going to go ahead and do that for me. So I want to flag that this was there because folks aren't always aware of it. The other really cool feature on this is that you can, uh, you can go ahead and manipulate the speed as well. So if you want to run an effect in slow motion to just see what's going on, feel free to launch this up and change the speed as you go on. It's good. So the next one is custom decal response. Now, generally when you project a decal, I've gone ahead and I've projected a gradient decal onto this, which is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you can see we have cool blending going on with that decal. Okay, so what's actually happening there that's really cool is that Unreal Engine 5 has the ability to let you custom set up the decal response of a surface. So inside the material, you can actually say, hey, when a decal is projected onto you, this is how I want to do it. In this case, I'm just doing a height blend with the grime to make it look a little bit like it's blended into some certain areas of it first. 
Now, this is really useful. The two main functions you need to care about if you're using materials here are your debuffer uh, texture uh, and your um, apply debuffer nodes. The other thing that's really important here is receives decals has to be false. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but what receives decals equals false does in this scenario is it basically says stop receiving decals in the traditional way. And if I need decals, I'll hand them in the material itself myself. Okay, if you're wondering what the material was as to what I just did, I love how many hands I just saw go, whoa, um, then this is a quick thing. I'm literally just getting the same material, doing a standard blend, and then just throwing in an alpha with a high blur. It's nothing too complicated. Placeable clouds are fun. Uh, this is a system that a lot of folks are unaware of. Uh, I bring this up because this is a cool little system that's sitting inside the Volumetrics plugin. You can access it, you can tear it apart because it's written in Blueprint, so you can extend this as you see fit. You really only need two actors within it. There's a cloud mask and then there's the cloud mask generator. Once you kind of pop them in, it actually handles the generation, pushes out a render target. The render target then filters into your cloud setup. Now the default cloud material won't work. So you'll need to enable the Volumetrics plugin and then inside of that, I suggest you take a look at Billowy 3 and that shows you where the render target is meant to go in a standard cloud pipeline. This isn't exactly like a hey, it's an out-of-the-box feature, but it is a really, really good feature to drop in, test with, and experiment because so much of your, like, your view in any open world game is literally the sky, and a lot of developers are like, so I put in the default clouds, and they looked great, and then they go about their day, and it never changes. So I wanted to highlight this for a little bit more customization. Custom prim data came in a little while ago, but a lot of folks are unaware of it, and I think it was for 5.0 that we cleaned up the interface, so historically speaking, when you have a parameter, in this situation, you can see that we have one parameter, and when I change it, a bunch of rocks in the scene all change together. And that makes me sad, because sometimes you wanna go ahead and you wanna have it so that each rock could be modified independently. Now, a lot of people would be like, guess I better make a blueprint, and I'll be like, I guess you're wrong, because we have a great system that you can use called custom prim data that pushes the variable off to the primitive. You can see here that I can now add moss intensity and only that one asset is changing, all right? So it's actually throwing these variables on the primitive and then pushing it up. It's a really nice thing. You can do more than just scalars. You can have vectors. You need to custom assign what numbers these are being assigned to, like it's custom prim zero, custom prim one, or whatever. So there's a little bit more work in it, and you need to kind of think it through from a, a pipeline perspective if you're incorporating it. But it is really, really useful, and it looks good. Now, um, a couple of things that are really useful here that are worth mentioning is that if you historically get a material that is like identical, but then you change a value, those things no longer batch, right? Because you've got one instance with a value of like, let's say you've got a damage lerp in there that's like a damage of 50%, and then another one that has a damage of 25%, they're technically different materials. When it's on the custom prim data, it's loading it, they have the same material, it's kind of just loading that variable from the primitive instead, at which point we have batching, which is great. So it's good for artistic vision and it's good for performance reasons. Everybody wins, but it's a really like nerdy sounding art feature. <laughs> and I think that's how it got missed by some. This is something that's in 5.1, but you know when you look at like the release notes and you're like, no one is gonna notice this. So I'm just being preemptive about this one and flagging it. Uh, this is a 5.1 feature, which is really cool, which literally lets you go ahead and create variables and functions, and it generates the C++ header information uh, over here for you to use uh, as necessary. This is really good when you're learning it because you no longer have to like, well, I'm sure, you, you know, anyone here that's done any programming here has gone through the ropes, you know, when you're first learning U properties and such, you're like, oh, what's it look like? Um, this is kind of a nice, friendly way to do that. Another reason I like it is because it's a friendly way to kind of put your toe in the water as a blueprinter that's moving into programming that may want to have some, maybe all you want to do is make something inside the asset registry so you need to declare it. More on that later. Um, this is a cool one. Interpolate material instance parameters. So see this node over here? It takes two material references that have a common parent material, important, and then it takes the current target. And what it does in this scenario, you'll see that I have material version A Material version B, once again, there's the node, and I've bound it to spacebar. And when I hit play, you can see that it's interpolating between those two. Now, the great thing there means that your artist can basically make a version of the material that is like, here's what it looks like with the shield effect applied, 
or here's what it looks like when they take damage. And you can kind of have it as more of an artist-driven version instead of them just changing a whole bunch of those values in the blueprint. Um, you know when someone tells you a console command and you're like, how on earth was I meant to know that? Well, a lot of folks don't know. If you click help, you can click console variables, which generates a searchable document of all of our console. Now, I strongly recommend you check that button there that says search help as well, because that checks our tooltips, which is really, really good information. But in doing so, I can just be like, look, I have a problem with fog right now. Tell me everything that could fix it. And then the engine's like, here's your list. And then we high five, and everyone's happy. Uh, speaking of console variables, I wanted to bring up the console variables plugin, which is off by default, in, but you, if you turn it on, it's cool. It lets you add variables, which is great, but you can then flick them on and off, and you can see where the variables were flicked on or off. Um, you can revert them to like the constructor, so you can see what that default state of them was. Another really, really cool feature is that you can go through and you can save those variables into presets. So if you have a common setup that you need to have when you're testing various things, like these five options are off, it's really cool to just be like, do that, computer. And again, high fives all around, feature implemented. Uh, A-B test, this is not ab test. Um, A-B test is a great little console command that if you type A-B test before a console command and then enter the two values that you want to test, Unreal will automatically flip between those two values over and over and over again. And it actually tells you the performance difference of those two things. And then it tells you the chance that that was from noise. Okay, type in A-B test stop or you're gonna have a bad time. Um, but this is, by the way, I use the worst possible image to show the fog off on this in hindsight, so sorry about that very mild flickering in the distance, but hopefully you got the point. This is the actual worst image in this for a cool feature, but um, the Common UI plugin was added in 427. It's a feature uh, of Common UI widgets that get used in many, many games. I mean, there are a lot of features that I'm sure anyone here in the room that's handled UMG um, that you've You've built that framework again and again between projects where you're like, I guess we need to have a rotunda in this project again. Uh, Common UI gives you a lot of those basics, but another really cool aspect of Common UI is it allows you to give style assets to your buttons and widgets, so it's much easier for you to change things in large sweeping moves rather than having to like go through them all one by one. Uh, so being able to like pass it in as an object is really good. It's also a bit uh, nicer for interactivity with game pads. Reload asset is one that I see happen frequently. You can see here that I'm changing a Niagara asset. So instead of going, oh no, I broke it, you can just go asset reload, and this will grab the version of it on disk. You don't need to restart the editor. Um, and you know it works there, so you can see that it's reverted it, but it actually works for levels as well. So again, like in this case, I'm duplicating a bunch of stuff, and then I'm like, oh no, I broke it. Don't restart the editor. Just go to it and click reload, and then it should revert back to what you had, okay? I like that there's a little bit of groaning in the room on that one. Like, I felt collective pain. Um, this is a fun one. This is in UE5. This is the waveform collapse generation uh, plugin. So if you build a sample environment like this, it kind of shows you how bits of a thing can be stuck together. And you can use this widget. This is a plugin you can enable. You can use that widget to create like sample data. And then you can go ahead and generate samples based on the thing that you've built, OK? I bring this up because this is like, one of the most frequently rebuilt things that I see in, when people are first learning procedural generation and like they jump on Twitter and they post it and they're really happy because it sounds really technical, waveform collapse generator, right? Um, but it's a really nice one to have just a reference point for how something like that could go together. So um, I wanted to flag that this existed and if you ever want to kind of, you know, uh, go down that path that there is something that you can have as a reference point, okay? So it is all just housed within this editor utility widget that has the output and input controls from it. RVTs, or runtime virtual textures, uh, these are really, really lovely. They've been in there for a while. Some of you that follow me on Twitter probably consider me a runtime virtual texture evangelist, and I totally understand why. Um, but the RVTs basically create a large sample of the world. Can we bring the house slides down for this sample if that's okay? I'm not sure if you have the controls there. Sorry to put you on the spot. He's shaking his head no. Um, but if you look really carefully, <laughs> if you look carefully here, you can see that it's actually blending into the environment. So as this asset's kind of going into it, 
it's actually doing a smooth blend, and that controls the normals as well. This means that your rocks don't look like they've just got like a hard polyline and stuff stuck into the environment. It's a really, really good technique. My apologies for using dark colors on dark colors for the example in a well-lit room. Um, but essentially what it does is it takes an orthographic image from like, so it just sees the X, Y, and then it passes that off, and you can then sample that data. So your landscapes can output that information. It's also really good for performance reasons, because you can kind of get the cache that's coming through there and pipe that back into the landscapes. Check out our docs for more info on this, but it is a really, really good feature, both artistically and for performance reasons if you have uh, outdoor environments that you want to feel good. Now, Niagara Fluids are a feature that plenty of folks have seen bits and pieces of, but just to flag it, it is a plugin that if you enable, um, you can go ahead and create your own. Now, I wanted to kind of step into what that looks like because if you enable the plugin and create one with the simple particle source emitter, it's actually a really comparatively friendly way to get into it. And what it does is it actually passes its information from that left emitter into the right emitter to control uh, the fluids. So on the right-hand side, you can see we're able to change the temperature, we're able to change um, the advection, we're able to change all of the stuff that happens after the flames kind of get created. But on the left-hand side, that emitter is actually spawning particles that it's pushing out, excuse me, that it's pushing out. And what's actually happening is like, that means that you can control the visuals of these effects, right? So in this case, you know, I can go ahead and say, hey, spawn them inside of a torus and create this cool ring of fire, and you know, I can control this in different ways, but it actually is just being controlled by a standard, rather boring emitter that just happens to have a nice way to pass this information to the complicated stuff. And I bring that up because a lot of people open them up and they're like, that looks too complicated. But quite often, I'm like, if you only go to the emitter summary on the right, there's a good chance that you can tweak it and create some pretty cool effects that you may not be aware of. Now, here's an awkward one. If you've got something with fluids and you add an actor tag collider to a mesh, I know, what that does is fluids will now collide with those specific surfaces, okay? So you can see here that flames are actually spraying into that mesh, and if I move it around, the flames go past. So again, you're adding the actor tag collider, and that will enable collisions for fluids, okay? Uh, which, again, like that's just, it just looks really cool. So like, I was just very happy looking at that still. So again, just here, Collider. Okay, so I'm, I know I'm reiterating this point, but it's uh, missed by many. Now, another thing that's really useful for any folks that are developing content uh, is the advanced search syntax. So in this situation, I'm typing nanite enabled uh, is equal to false, and the triangle count is greater than whatever number I type in. And what that actually will do is that will show me every single thing within the content browser that has those values. Now, it's worth noting that these, this metadata that you see here, this information, that is what is being saved in the asset registry, and that's what it's searching. So anything that's really appearing in there with a number is something you can then query through the, uh, the, the, the browser. Now, that information is referred to as the asset registry, okay? So whenever you define a property in C++, if you flag it as asset registry searchable, okay, that will now be added into that information. So a cool thing is that if you did say, let's say you have weapon blueprints in your game, right? And you create a bunch of different weapons that have a damage value, and you make the damage value asset registry searchable, in your content browser, you can now say, get me all weapons that have a damage of greater than 300 and things like that, okay? So that information being used for your own nefarious purposes, good stuff. And if we go through here, the other awkward thing that folks don't know about is the columns view. Um, I know this seems weird, but uh, everyone often keeps the content browser and just default tiles. But if you use the columns view, it, again, it's searching all of that information and you can now arrange by certain things without having to type in queries. So I wanted to flag it because, again, it's a thing that a lot of people miss, and I wanted to make sure you're aware of it. Blend space graphs are a feature that has uh, appeared with UE5, and that is if you create a blend space asset, you may be familiar with this, but what you may not be familiar with is that if you double click on any of those, you actually now have subgraphs. So you can now have some really crazy nested behavior with more complicated stuff handled within each blend, which I personally think is really, really good. Um, but be careful doing it because you can get some really deep, complicated behavior pretty quick. Uh, but again, a lot of folks don't realize it because there was a lot of changes with UE5, right? 
Uh, bake to control rig, so in this case we have a regular animation, but it's worth noting that if you go edit and sequencer, bake to control rig, and you have a setup uh, on a control rig that will support it, then what this will actually do is grab that animation that's come in from you know, an external program, and I'm actually bake it out as keyframes within sequencer for all of the controls, not just the bones, but the, the controls. Now the great part of this is you're now able to kind of tinker with it and tweak it as you see fit. I bring this up because you're probably looking at that thing down there and you're like, Chris, that's a lot of keyframes. And there is a simplified keyframe button when you create it, but if in post you want to do a little bit more than that, be aware that you can go to the curve editor, you can grab whatever keyframes that you want to tweak, in this case I guess all of them, and you can go through and you can click filter. And filter, I can go to simplify. And that will now remove a whole bunch of keyframes and give me some generally slightly nicer curves that I can now use. Now the great thing about all of this is that when you do that, it creates an animation in Unreal that saves out as an animation for that mesh. So this means that if you have something like this, like how many times have you been given an animation from someone and then you've been putting together a prototype and that animation is slightly wrong, but they've gone home for the night, but you really want that feature working. So it's really nice to be able to kind of grab that. Sorry, that sounds like it's coming from a personal place. Um, but like you really want that feature working, right? And it's really nice to be able to kind of jump in there and tweak it and clean it up and whatever else. And you know, they might do their proper job later if they feel like it, but it's really great to be able to bring these things in and tweak with it. It's also great because you can grab, if your team is moving to Control Rig, knowing that you can use previous uh, assets that you've created, previous animations, and potentially bring them across is really good. Um, so animation mirroring is another one that popped up uh, with UE5, which allows you to set up a mirror table and then play your, your things on the left or the right. Again, this is really useful because, you know, if we have something like, let's just say you wanted to add left-handedness and all of them are right-handed by default, or let's say you have some cool sprint animations and a leap that always comes off of one foot, it's really nice to know that you have, you have options there. While we're on the animation subject, because I guess I'm on that train now, you know how often you save variables out uh, in an event graph for animation blueprints, be aware that you can create an arbitrary function, and inside that function, if you make the return value, which is what I'm doing here, called return value, and you make this function do whatever you need to, in this case it's accessing third person characters, and I'm making it const, there I go, making it const, this function, and I know that was a couple of steps, but this function is now something that we can query inside of the animation. So back in this animation here, I'm now able to go grab this pin and say, I want you to run the get third person character function. And then I'm able to go down and get the movement component and I can just check if is falling is happening without having to create like, raise your hand if you've created an animation blueprint before. All right, now keep your hand up if you had to add like 50 variables at the start of that that you were kind of regretting the whole time. Yeah, notice not a single hand went down. <laughs> So it's nice having some functionality like this, which just kind of cleans up some of that stuff. Cube Grid is um, honestly one of my favorite things that was added in 5. It's a bit of a strange one. It's a modeling tool, uh, but if you go down to the tool that is labeled as Cube Gr, uh, then you can go ahead and do this. It's really nice. You can just use control click to kind of extrude sections, create corners, pull things out, et cetera, et cetera. And when you click the complete button that's awkwardly included in this GIF, um, it will then go ahead and save it out so that Lumen will kick in. So you can see that I did that and we've now got a nice little asset. This is really, really great for prototyping. Again, I see a lot of people kind of weirdly scaling different cubes and stuff within their environment sometimes where cube grid would just be much nicer for simple, effective block outs of things. Fix pivot tool is another one. Like how frequently you've been given a model and the pivot's in the wrong spot. Um, you can just click on the model then go to the pivot tool and just be like, put this in the bottom center um, you know, the thing that we all want, and it'll do it, pivot, done. Uh, geometry script is a fun one. Uh, in this situation, I did something rather simple. Uh, geometry script here is just running um, a simple Boolean so that I can stick a fan on objects and it will automatically create a version of that object with a hole in it, and what I'm doing is I've created a cylinder and we're just Booleaning that cylinder against whatever object I'm sticking it on. But I want to point out that that was really only just a couple of nodes. That was really quite quick to put together. Um, so just be aware that this functionality exists. It's really effective. And you can create some interesting tools. I wanted to flag this because people have seen this in Lyra and they've been like, that's a Lyra thing. And I just want to be like, it's an everyone thing. And it's surprisingly easy. So if you feel like you, you know, 
have some easy, low-hanging fruit for uh, potential GeoScript stuff, please, by all means, get on it. Now, the next one I want to touch on is texture baking, because, again, texture baking is one of those things that people are like, yes, I need to do that in an external package. But it is worth noting that you can bake out curvature, normals, bent normals, and more, which I put in bold, uh, <laughs> um, in engine. And all you need to do is go to the modeling tools and go to the baking. Now, a really, 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 probably too many reallys, but cool aspect of that is that you can bake this stuff to textures, but you can also bake it to vertex data. So if you want to bake out the curvature to, say, the red channel of all of your meshes, you can now access curvature in any of your materials, right? And the reason that's really good is if you look at your average nanite mesh, well, not average, but let's, let's grab a nanite mesh as an example. You know, they have really dense verts, right? And quite frequently, we're pulling in textures that are quite large. So if you're looking at nanite meshes and you're like, I love that fidelity, but I don't necessarily want to have really um, bespoke, baked out textures for all of these things, you can do things like access the curvature to do some kind of organic blends to maybe automatically bring rust and stuff like that into these meshes and share texture sets between some of those meshes, which means you kind of get a best of both worlds situation where you end up with a really high fidelity mesh, but you also end up with your texture reuse staying pretty much in check and overall quite often a, like, a pretty good size for the overall asset set that's being used. Um, which is really good. So yeah, vertex colors. My one thing that I want to flag there is please try and uh, keep that pipeline in mind from an early point in production if you can, just so that you know ahead of time that red channels, green channels, and blue channels are all going to be allocated to specific kinds of things. Otherwise, otherwise you can kind of end up in a messy thing pretty quickly because the artists are doing their thing and other artists are doing another thing. Um, so if you ever look at an effect and you're like, that's too expensive, I can't use that on mobile, um, just be aware that Niagara has a baker built into it. Um, you can actually generate flipbooks from Niagara, which is a really useful feature. And this is good as well for things like if you know, if you, maybe it's just a distant load, right? Maybe it's not even for low-end platforms. Maybe you just in the distance want to have an explosion. Um, but in this situation, yeah, we're just, I just baked it out as a rather simple flipbook, uh, and it's it's there. It's one of those things that's like weirdly invisible until someone points it out, and you're like, there is a button that says Baker that's been in front of me this whole time. So I can see a bunch of you are like, huh. Um, so be, just be aware of that one. This is another great one because this is what you expect particles to do in Sequencer, and they don't by default, right? Like, you know when you play an effect in Sequencer and it's triggering an event? That really surprised him. So. What happens is it's playing the effects normally, but if you go ahead and add a life cycle track down the bottom, and then you go to the properties, and you set this section down here to say age update is desired age, sequencer will now control the point of time that that effect is at. And if the, um, like if the effect has been set up for determinism, it's gonna go ahead and it'll scrub forward and scrub back which is just really, really great when you're doing any like animation work or cutscenes or anything like that, and you really want to know that everything is exactly where it should be, okay? This is a cool one. Um, if you, you have to enable this, uh, but if you enable the Chaos Cache Manager, uh, you can go ahead and record with that button down the bottom. You can record chaos things that have occurred, so explosions and things that have collapsed, and you can play them forward, but you can also then go ahead and do some fun stuff, because you can play them backwards, right? So in this case, you know, we're like unexploding the barrels. Um, but you know, if you create something like this in the scene, uh, I could maybe make an effect that makes it look like a wizard did it and unexplode a bridge that's that's fallen down or some rafters that have collapsed or whatever else it may be, you know. So I just wanted people to be aware that like the Chaos Cache Manager is pretty cool. Um, people kind of think of it as like, well, why would I want to blow it up when I can just custom blow it up? And sometimes like really tailoring what that effect looks like is um, is is fun. This is a good one and the only audio slide that I have going on here. But if you get two effects, I have music and wind playing at the same time. And you type in this command followed by a word. It will only play sounds with that word in it. I typed in wind, everything else stopped. I type in music, the wind has stopped. Okay, and if you type in the command again, and hit enter, everything plays again. 
Because again, like, you know, if you're trying to debug footsteps or something like that, it's really nice to just be like, please, engine, give me early footsteps. Okay. Uh, the next one I want to cover here is placeable volumetric fog. Uh, this is something I really, really love. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things that folks are aware of volumetric fog in the engine, but they're often not aware of the placeable variety. And what happens is if you create a material in the fog domain, you can go ahead and you can drop a sphere inside the world. And when you do, you can apply that material to it. Excuse me. And when you do, you can now see that we have volumetric fog that's placeable in very specific locations. And you can go ahead and add panning to it and you can move it around and do whatever you need to. But like, see how that lets us like really kind of customize the mood <laughs> in that room. You know, it's a, it's a good feeling. Um, there's a couple of like caveats to it. Um, but before I get into them, actually one other thing I wanted to show you is that, again, these effects can be set up for movement. So if you look at this one, you can see it a little bit better. I think I did more on this slide. We'll give it just a moment. So see how that fog is kind of gently moving? I swear I made this bigger. Okay, yeah, it's a bit easier to see there now that there's darkness in the background. But see, you kind of get that gentle wisps going up. You know, it brings a lot of life to the scene, and it's, uh, it's pretty easy to do. A um, couple of things, just make sure that you've made your material in the volume domain, and um, you've gone ahead and you've enabled exponential height fog, but you've turned volumetric fog on in your exponential height fog actor. A thing that is a bit of a gotcha is you still need to have a value greater than zero in your exponential height fog. It can't be turned off and then only have volumetric fog in the scene. Um, you need to have a value that is greater than zero. Even if it is 0 0.001, just uh, make sure that's set up. And for anyone here that's like, yeah, but how'd you do it? Um, this is the material graph that I used to create that effect that you just saw. Um, I just made sure that it was additive and in the volume domain. And in this case, I'm using a volume texture to kind of create some of the noise around the edges. If you want to see more on this specific thing, you can check out my Unreal Engine 5 guided tour video that's sitting on the, uh, the, the developer community online. Um, and we have a node graph that you can just copy paste straight into your thing. Uh, the next one I want to touch on was named reroutes. In the material editor, you can right click on reroute nodes and say create a named reroute and it will do this and you can tinker with them and change them around and you can add new ones. But a cool thing that a lot of folks are unaware of exists now is if you feel like, no, I hate named reroutes now, you can right click on them and you can collapse them back to a reroute, okay? So if you're, sometimes you're actually just doing it for while you're working on something or maybe you want it to permanently look like that, but I want people to just be aware of that. Now that's 35, but again, I kind of just kept going. So, <laughs> Since we have time, um, by the way, if anyone's wondering why I haven't tweeted like any tips and tricks for the last two months, it's because I've basically been like, oh, I'll put it in the presentation. Uh, so <laughs> that's why. <laughs> um, but since we still have time, let's go ahead and hit off some other things that are worth uh, flagging. Uh, Common Conversation is an experimental framework that sits inside of UE5. It, it snuck in there. Uh, it's worth checking out because it's an experimental framework for building um, for building conversation trees. Uh, again, it's really cool to kind of have this set up. It's the fundamentals for things um, such as, uh, like, sorry, start again. Fundamentals of these things, so it's your graph set up. You can add um, tasks, side effects, and conditions to each of these things. Um, there's some support for networking and replication. I'll level with you. I haven't had a chance to really attack this yet. It's more of I opened it up, saw that it was there, started tinkering with it. I asked an engineer who was like, yeah, it's there. And then kind of, you know, that hanging silence afterwards. <laughs> so, uh, again, for something like this, it's experimental. However, even if it's experimental, one of the wonderful things about UE5 is you can open our source code. So even if you're looking at writing your own, it's still really lovely to look at something that Epic's done. And even if you're like, I'm not sure if that's still going to be there or what's going on, the thing that I always stress here is it's really great to copy someone else's homework. You know, so <laughs> if you can go ahead and look at that thing and be like, hmm, okay. Um, it'll make your life easier building your own that may have your own conditions. Niagara G buffer access is another thing that a lot of folks missed out on, but I really love. Um, so in Niagara, you can sample the G buffer. And a cool thing of that is you can say to Niagara, hey, what color is the pixel behind the particle that I'm about to spawn? And it'll be like, it's red, and there's this much roughness. 
and then you can go ahead and sample that information and throw that onto a particle. So it's actually really easy to create some pretty like crazy Niagara effects where you like sample the entire view of the world, throw particles on them and then dissolve everything into it. You know, you can create some really cool like screen space effects that are sampling the world and I don't know, I love it, um, but I haven't found a cool enough demo yet for me to be like, this is the exact use case. Um, but I have used it before on some things like dirt and grime. So whenever I had um, uh, dirt, kind of like dust coming off of the ceiling, um, I sampled the original color of the area that the particle was spawning. And instead of blending just the transparency out, I actually blended the color out as well into the dust effect that I eventually wanted to kind of create some slightly better visuals on that front. Another thing you can do there is again, if you want dust blowing across the ground, just sample that initial thing and you can kind of create something a bit more finer grain that feels like it belongs. Uh, sequence of player camera blends. Uh, this is something that a lot of folks miss and it's really fair, I understand why. There's, the thing that everyone misses is top corner of this. So in this scene, I've put a trigger in there and I've got a sequence with a camera. Now, the camera's moving around, right? And I've go to, the, I've go to the, the, the director track and I'm setting this up to can blend. And if you grab that very right hand corner and very left hand corner, you can actually extend it to create this blend track. Do you see that? Now, if you have no previous camera, you know what this does? It blends from the player camera into the cinematic and then it blends out of the cinematic back into the player camera. There's a person over here that was just like at the person next to them, so I can only assume that one of you built it for the other one. <laughs> My apologies. So, like I said, it's kind of, it's a, the, the, it's a little bit tucked away because you have to really grab that top right corner. Like, see this little white pixel? Uh, <laughs> now, see this triangle in the top corner? You've just got to grab that and pull it out, okay? But yeah, blending in and blending out means you can create some really cool effects, you know? Like, if you want to have it, like, as the player steps through a doorway, and even if it's a first-person game, you can do some fun here, because, like, as the player steps through a doorway, you can suddenly just seize the control of their camera, do some cool-looking cinematics, like they're getting attacked by someone and pushed out a window or whatever, and then as they land again, you just, you've already moved the player over to that, and you kind of blend the camera back in again, and you can have some nice kind of, like, seamless effects if you're really quick and careful with it. Um, but again, like I've seen quite a few developers build this feature and like when I tell them that it's like right click and then move the thing, they're like, no one saw that triangle. And I'm like, sorry. Um, so I want to flag this one. It's pre-skinned local position bounds and normal. And I've got a vertex interpolator node in there which you will need to do it. Um, what happens is this. The screen doesn't really do this justice, so you're going to have to look at my hand gestures as I explain this one. But generally what happens is when you have a projection in world space, so you're doing a world aligned texture, what happens is that texture is, it looks like it's projected from a projector. And as you move, the stuff moves with you. Everyone still with me? Now you can do some really simple transform math to you know, keep projecting in the actor's space. But the problem is, is if I want to dissolve a person, weird sentence outside of a game dev conference, but if I want to dissolve a person, um, and they're moving their arms. <laughs> you wonder someone's arms get in the way. Uh, just, but if I'm, if I'm dissolving a person, right, VFX-wise, and they're moving their arms, um, <laughs> that creates a real problem for me. This is getting worse. So what happens is as they're moving, the coordinates are going to be moving around as well, you know, and you're going to get that weird jump back. Now what's really cool is what these nodes do, the pre-skin local position bounds and normals, is it grabs that information as if they were in their T-pose. Okay? And because it grabs it in their T-pose, when you're dissolving them, the sphere mask that you use to dissolve them, or in this case, I'm just applying camouflage to <laughs> really, really bright camouflage, but in this case, I'm applying like noise to them, but notice as they move around, that noise isn't shifting either. Do you see that? So that's because I'm grabbing that information from like basically their T-pose state, projecting it over there, and then I'm carrying that through. So again, this is really, really good for effects. Um, and a common thing that I see in video games is, you know, the, the person gets, gets, gets destroyed or disintegrated or whatever, and then as they collapse, I watch their foot disintegrate and then undisintegrate for a second, and I'm like, you. Uh, all of a sudden, I find myself on Twitter being like, hey, use this. 
Um, so just be aware that that's there and everyone's happier for it. Screen space transforms, uh, just be aware that if you grab the center of the dot, it's in screen space. Um, I know that's silly, but like, again, a lot of folks aren't aware of it. Cool thing you can do in Unreal that's off by default is in the viewport look and feel section, you can enable rotational screen space. So that kind of gives you this circular thing around the widget, and now wherever you are, you can just rotate relative to your camera, okay? It's nice, it's there, it's easy to work with. Uh, statistics viewer, this is a little bit different when it comes to having nanite meshes in your scene, but it is still an early thing to flag, is just if you look at your scene and you wanna quickly just get some information about what's there, just be aware that you can use the statistics view to really quickly just be like, oh, okay, there are some really high textures being used in this scene and I was not aware of that. Um, it happens pretty frequently and it's a very easy first port of call when you're trying to like check out your texture memory and things like that, so I wanted to flag it. Now, obviously the next port of call is generally um, GPU capture stuff, you know, when you start doing things like profile GPU. Now, this is an awkward one, but how it works is this. If you, there's a series of commands you can do that allows you to capture GPU information um, that shows you on a per material level, but it used to be this like, it's like five commands that you're setting up to disable RHI thread and such, and it's a bit of a pain. Um, but we actually set up a thing, which is if you type in r.rhi set GPU capture op options space one, and then do your capture, um, this will now give you a per material cost as you scroll through. Now I made the mistake of capturing this on a machine with a 3090 in it, so everything's like, it's pretty much 0.0. .0. Um, but <laughs> you can still see some of these values are non-zero. So that's just kind of a useful little tip to know about, that if you type in that specific command, um, you can get it, so again, I thought this was gonna repeat, so I'ma just do that. So the command for any folks that wanted it is here, which is r.rhi set GPU capture options, okay? It's a useful little one. Just make sure that when you're done with your profiling, you've set it back to zero, okay? Gives you a bit more information. Procedural foliage is a little tucked away because it's in the editor options, not in a plugin, so you need to enable this on your editor. But how it works is you can get your procedural foliage volume by just dropping that into the world, expanding it to the size you want, and creating a foliage spawner, which really just says what foliage do you want. You can set up rules and guidelines that say how much foliage should be put into the world and whether things can grow in the shade, how many seeds they distribute, what the average distance of the seed distribution is, and what their collision is like. And a cool thing is that when you bake this out and you click that simulate button, um, what it goes ahead and does is it creates it as regular foliage, and the advantage of that is you can now erase stuff and add stuff without, like, you know, it just kind of does the, the boring stuff at the start. Um, and the other thing that's really cool is if you get those variables right, often they look better than what I painted in in the first place. And the reason for that is because they're spreading by, hey, this one spread these seeds which created these ones and whatever else, you end up with like really nice natural looking patches, uh, which I really love and um, yeah, it's a really just good starting point that saves you a ton of time. So just be aware that it exists and when you are done with it, you can just get rid of the procedural foliage stuff and just treat it like regular foliage, which I think is great. Uh, camera locked movement, some folks are unaware of this one, just if you hold down shift while dragging, um, the camera sticks to it. Again, I know this has been in Unreal for a long time, but too frequently I do that, or I watch someone do that classic drag, move the camera, drag, move the camera, and then like while I'm sitting behind them, I'm like, do I tell them? <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> because of that, it's a good idea to just be aware of it. Uh, another one that I use pretty frequently is environmental bookmarks. So if I hit one at that starting position, sorry, control one and then control two, I can then use one and two to just flip between those two positions. I can do the same thing over here with control three, and now I have one, two, and three. And I can really easily just toggle between all of those positions that are in the environment. Okay, now one thing I wanna flag with this is that one of the first things I do whenever someone's like, makes the mistake of letting me open their level is I actually just kind of hit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero, because that actually generally shows me what was important to that artist when they were making the scene, you know, because they've kind of created these little, like, 
and this is the control room, and this is a tower, and this is whatever I've got. And it's actually a really nice way to kind of like quickly blitz between them. And every now and then you'll discover that all of the, the bookmarks are in weird spots, and you're like, someone else did something, and you've built over the top of it. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, how'd you know? And you're like, well, I'm teleporting inside of your mountain, and et cetera, et cetera. So just be aware of that one. So it's control. Sorry, I should have had some stuff on screen. Um, next one's nice. This is the shadow pass switch. So let's say I'm putting a light inside of this uh, branded light globe, uh, which are not official swag. Um, you can use a node called the shadow pass switch. And what it does is it says, hey, when I'm rendering the shadow, this is what I want you to do. But when I'm rendering you, this is what I want you to do. And now you can see we're still getting the shadow on the bottom of that light globe. But notice that we're no longer casting that U shadow that we see here, or unwanted shadow, if you will. Um, and it is really just one node. Um, this is really, really good as well on, um, if you ever do an effect where you have a camera that's moving through like a wall or a, a dithering out like a gate or something like that, like you have a chase camera and you're dithering stuff out as your camera moves through it. You know, you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. So shadow pass is really good for you to be like, look, I want the view to dither, but I want the camera to, oh, sorry, the shadows to always stay as if the dithering never occurred. Because again, another thing that you see quite often on people that have got the dithering for the camera is all of a sudden they get some weird shadow action happening because they're disappearing too. So um, just wanted to flag it with everyone. Uh, move component to node. I like this because it's a really simple little async blueprint function. So I'm doing an attach and then, that was way too quick, but hope that, yeah, I put a slow motion on it. So what actually happens here is as in this situation, it's saying move the component over the course of 0.5 seconds to 0, 0, 0. And because I've attached it, it's just moving up to her hand because I had attached it to her hand. Um, it's a really, really simple little node. But I'll tell you what, if you're making a VR experience, I personally really love this because it's just when you pick something up in VR, instead of it just like popping into their hand, that like quarter second, half a second of it going <whistles> That was louder than expected. Um, into your hand is a really good, like it just feels like, it just feels better. It feels like what you expected it to do instead of like, bam, you have weapons now. Um, so move component two is a useful little one. I love it in prototyping, um, yeah. So simulation stages are a feature within Niagara that a lot of folks are unaware of. Um, I wanted to flag this with people because essentially what it lets you do is iterate over different data inside of Niagara. So instead of just running your spawn and your tick, you can go ahead and you can say, hey, I want to go ahead and iterate over every particle and do this to them. Or I want to iterate over every, um, every section of a render target to do something based on all of that information. Now another really cool thing about this is that Niagara, and this, this is especially true, but this is something you do through simulation stages, is that um, Niagara doesn't need to output uh, particles. What's really great about that is you can run a Niagara system that's actually outputting to a render target through sim stages, because you iterate through all of the, the bits of a render target, and you're like, you know, you get a pixel, you get a pixel, and set it up to whatever you want to do. Now, what's really great about that is it means that if you're kind of tinkering around, this is something I threw together in about 15 minutes, and what it actually is is I just literally fed a Niagara um, render target which you can see in the bottom corner there. So it's just generating that. And I'm just feeding that render target into the cloud system, okay? So it's a really, really quick thing to do because the cloud system already exists, right? Like we have that, that is a thing. Um, and when I'm kind of grabbing that cloud information and instead of just using a regular texture, I'm just kind of piping the render target that we're getting um, into there. If you want to do this yourself, by the way, just look at the content examples project that we have and check out the advanced Niagara room. And there is a nice advecting Niagara setup, which is a really good example for you to just kind of hit with a hammer and do your own thing to. But I want folks to be aware of it because again, it's just, there's some really advanced effects like I've seen similar effects like this getting a gross number of retweets on Twitter and every time I'll be like, it's just a sim stage. Um, and I, I want everyone to know that they can do it too. It's accessible, so sometimes. There we go. Uh, this is the simple like, my boss is coming mode. Uh, hit Shift F11 and it will hide your taskbar. I just flagging with the world because quite often when I'm saving um, videos out or saving GIFs, I find it really useful to just go ahead and say, hey, for this information, I want to, um, you know, I just don't want the taskbar down there. There's no purpose to that being around. 
Next up, I have collapsing and expanding blueprint material nodes. Uh, don't do this instead of functions, but it is nice to have for certain situations where it's like one time use. So I collapsed all those nodes to a subgraph, but I want to flag that you can then right click and you can, uh, you can expand them back to where they were. So if you do have blueprint logic that's really just a one time thing, sometimes it's nicer to just kind of get that and say, I want you to just be one single node. And finally, we have press K to keep location after physics. So all of these uh, kayaks have physics on them, right? And if I select all of those kayaks and I press K on them, K for keep, what it will actually do when I stop simulating is keep them all where they were, okay? So if you wanna make a reasonably organic looking mess, this is a really good way to go about it. Um, and just make sure you turn off simulate physics when you're done, otherwise they're gonna keep simulating, okay? So with that, that brings me to the end. We have 30 seconds left, so uh, nailed it. Um, thank you very much for coming. I hope this has been useful, and I hope to see you around the rest of Unreal Fest.
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I know it's the last talk before the Mardi Gras party, so I appreciate everyone coming here. Uh, I would like to say about Crossplay, peer-to-peer, and Unreal Engine. It's easier said than done. Uh, so yeah, let's go. Uh, the Crossplay feature uh, is more and more welcomed by players, but it's still not a standard yet, uh, especially when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer and un Unreal Engine. We tried that for our riders and somehow succeeded. Uh, so this talk is kind of a post-mortem as well as overview things we had to overcome in order to, uh, to get there. A few words of introduction. My name is Jarosław Falczyński. I am a project tech lead at People Can Fly for Gemini Project. Uh, during Outriders production, I was online lead programmer so I was very close to the technology I'm presenting today. I'm in the gaming industry for nine years, and that included uh, Epic Games Adventure. Uh, if anyone wants to contact me, here's my email address. Okay, so who are we as people can fly? Uh, we are in the um, industry of game development for over 20 years. Uh, we are doing mostly shooters. Um, we started with Painkiller, then Bulletstorm, after that was Gears of War Judgment, and most recently, Outriders, which inspired this talk. Mm. Uh, there are 600 of us, and we like to think of ourselves as Unreal Engine experts. Uh, we are across the globe, uh, in Europe, United States, and Canada. Mm. Currently, we have seven projects in the making, and we are a public company on Warsaw Stock Exchange. Okay. Um, everything I'm presenting today is not a work of any single person, but rather a group of people. Uh, almost everything implementation-wise was done by collaboration of PCF's online programming team and Square Enix online suite team, so huge thanks to those guys. Also, I would like to thank to PCF and Square Enix leadership and production for making this bold decision. It wasn't easy. Also, I'd like to thank the QA teams that had to test all this, this Frankenstein we have created. Okay, so let's start. Ideally, the, the process of implementing the uh, crossplay features should be stretched across whole production. So I will start from prerequisites then I will move to technological layer. Then I will try to cover what it takes to certify uh, the game with crossplay. Um, and I, I would like to summarize with uh, takeaways, so things I, would, I think you should take home with you from this. Hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A after that. And before we go, um, a bit of motivation, why we did that, so we kind of, expected that this feature would be warmly welcomed, but when we announced that this, that this feature is in our game, the number of praises we got was uh, amazing. So I think that in recent future, this should be a standard. Okay, so first things first. Uh, how to approach this problem? How to implement crossplay in your game? First you need to define the problem. Uh, please remember that uh, every, uh, every platform you add to your platform set increases the complexity of the problem. Uh, it increases with the square of a number of platforms. And you actually would have to test all those configurations. Um, then you should consider the design. For example, some PvP games might suffer from the differences between default controls that are on different platforms, right? Mm, for example, PC has a keyboard-mouse combo by default, and uh, consoles have gamepad. Some players might think that it's unfair for them to compete with the keyboard and mouse, right? Then you need to somehow design the user experience. How my players would connect to the players on the other side, on the other platform. Uh, can I do only join codes? Perhaps I need to cross-platform friends. 
and it's also, it's, it's more complicated than it sounds. Maybe just matchmaking will suffice. All those things are, by default, created by the platform itself, and, uh, and you will have to do it yourself. Um, then, please make sure you get platform owner's approvals before you invest a lot of time and money implementing that feature. The crossplay is not allowed out of the box everywhere, almost anywhere it's, it's not allowed, so you need to approach the platforms and ask if, it's, if they allow it or if they like your design. <clears throat> the most notable things they might, um, they might think that they don't want you to have it is our security reasons. For example, your game might be exposing too much data to the other platforms and they, they promise their players to not expose this data, right? Um, and the second thing is fair share versus monetization problem. Um, but I will talk a bit, I will dwell a bit about this. Okay, so fair share versus monetization problem. Let's imagine we have two platforms, A and B, and both of them is, are taking one third as their margin. Uh, on both of those platforms, there are players X and Y. Uh, both of them are buying your title, uh, and basically, $20 from both of those players are coming to your treasury, and $10 goes to each of those platforms, right? That is the largely the business model, and it seems fair. Um, you're, let's imagine you are adding a microtransaction item to, to your title. Uh, you are pricing it at $3, player X is, is buying that item, so $1 goes to Ace Treasury, $2 goes to yours. It's still fair, right? Yeah, well, that depends. It depends on the features you have implemented in your game in your cross-platform interface. If there's any way microtransaction content can be transferred to the other platform, uh, uh, through your crossplay mechanism, it, it might be a violation, and platform owners might not like it. A few examples of, of this problem, of, of violation of, of this rule. For example, if you have uh, DLC sharing, which means basically that only one person in the party uh, has to own the content in order for everyone to play it. It, it is a violation from this point of view. Also, if you have microtransaction items with cross-progression pro, uh, cross or cross-safe, even if this is the same person, but with account on another platform, uh, you shouldn't allow for those items to cross over unless you get approval for that from the platform owner. It's the same with micro, microtransaction items with in-game trading and probably a lot more that I haven't anticipated here. Okay, so to summarize that, please do not wait until the last moment for those approvals. It might be a process and a negotiation. It's not, uh, and, it, and it varies from title to title and platform to platform. Um, the best way to go forward is you need to find a common design that works for everyone. And please remember, this is uncharted territory for everyone, for people, for processes, for those platforms. The, there are no standards here for everyone. Okay, and once we have those prerequisites, now we can focus on the technological layer. So, what do you need to implement the crossplay from technological point of view? in peer-to-peer -peer Unreal Engine game. You need to know how to establish low latency connection between Unreal uh, game clients. And Unreal assumes UDP protocol, so everything you implement needs to mimic that. Then you need to build all the bits and pieces of uh, the backend structure in order to support, uh, support this design. Also, we need to identify and address all the differences in hardware that might jeopardize the user experience. For example, in Outriders, we had issues when players on prev-gen hardware were hosting a game that next-gen uh, next players 
uh, join it to. Players notice that, that their experience is significantly worse than, on pre uh, than if it was the other way around, and they complain about that. We tried to address that, but we couldn't fix that for every case. Okay, so how to establish low latency connection between platforms? Um, in debug environments, straight IP connection will probably work, but it won't work in retail. There are two main reasons for that. One is that the situation when players are playing from within the same LAN network are extremely rare, so we need to have some kind of NAT traversal implemented. The second are security reasons. Platform owners might not like that you're exposing uh, IP of the other players. Uh, it's, it's extremely easy from PC, if you have straight connection to the platform, uh, to the console, to be able to see the other person's uh, personal IP address. And if you are unlucky, it might be easily, uh, easily uh, connected with the personal address. Connect that with frustration players might get playing your game and you, you might be in trouble. So what is the solution? The, the relay servers. So basically, what is a relay server? Uh, let's imagine again that you have two platforms, A and B, and players X and Y. They both are playing your game, and they want to somehow play together, so they need to connect. They are trying straight connection, but it fails from various firewalls and other paranoid things IT is doing to make us safer. So you introduce a middle service that is neutral to both of those platforms and is just passing the packets to the other side. Uh, this kind of relay server is fairly cheap to operate. And by cheap, I mean it can ho one virtual machine should be able to host of tens of thousands of players. And it's, and it's, as far as I know, it's the only way to achieve that, uh, to reliably achieve this connection. Okay, so how to implement those relays? You have a, a few options. One is to, to implement it yourself. But it is, it's simple in theory, but it's actually hard to implement. Because to, uh, to spare uh, a bit of money and latency time that they will increase, um, you would like to be able to fall back to straight connection if the circumstance allows it. For example, uh, with connection from PC to PC. And implementing NAT tra traversal um, is a very complicated task, task on its own. So I would highly recommend to base your solution on some uh, some standard. The, the, the problem isn't new, it was solved for a lot of different applications, so you just need to take and adapt it. For Outriders, we used WebRTC as a client and Cotern servers as Stuntern servers. Also, to support that, you need some way of out-of-band signaling for channel negotiation. Basically, both of the players need to somehow negotiate and identify themselves without actually exposing their personal IP address. Uh, when you do this, you need to trick Unreal to use it as a socket. Um, for Outriders, we, um, we took a stream socket and modified it to implement it this way. But there are a few traps if, if, you, do this, if you do this this way. For example, we had Mm, the most notable issue we had was um, that uh, the increase in latency I mentioned earlier was even higher than we anticipated. Uh, it turned out that WebRTC by default, at least our implementation, was adding reliability and ordering of packets. If you remember from previous slides, Unreal is assuming UDP connection, so no reliability, no, rent, uh, no ordering was required. So basically, we're paying the price in latency 
uh, for nothing, basically. Once we've disabled that, everything went back to normal. So my recommendation is to use something out there. For example, Epic Online Services has free service that will allow you to do a straight peer-to-peer -peer connection. And I, I assume that there is some kind of online uh, subsystem that supports that. Okay, and as I mentioned, there's no free lunch. So if you have those relay servers and there's probably, at least I don't know of any way around it, you will need to pay operational money unless you pick something free like Epic Online Services, but then they are paying the bill uh, to keep the servers running and possibly evenly distributed across the globe because you want to have them as close as possible to players. And there is a pay to, uh, price to pay in latency time because after all it's one hop more for every packet. Okay, now uh, we covered the low latency connection so now we can move to backend features. So what do you need from backend point of view in order to support the crossplay? You need, as I mentioned, you need some way of signaling if, you, if you'd like to implement a low latency connection yourself. Uh, but even if you decide to go with something uh, already there, uh, it's a useful feature uh, that will also help you with other features like uh, cross-play invites, etc. What is signaling? Basically, it's a way of sending a message, straight message from platform X to Y on different platforms uh, without too much latency. But it's not low latency as we need for active gameplay, but it also can be an email. We are talking seconds here. So in this example, player X is, is sending, uh, hey, I want to connect to you to player Y. Um, the easiest way to approach that would be to send this message and store it in your backend database somehow and let player Y to pull it when, when it's needed. But in order to get, for example, one second latency, you would need to constantly pull your database uh, every second. And multiply that uh, by the number of players playing your game and you put a serious load on your database just to achieve that. So, in my opinion, it's not the solution. So how to, uh, how to get there? Uh, yeah, periodical pulling will kill your backend. You can soften the blow by sacrificing user experience because you could increase the, um, increase the time between pulls, but then you would get less responsiveness. So the alternative is there are technologies that will let uh, your back, uh, your client be connected to your backend and receive push notifications. Um, for example, one is server-side events, and this is what we use for Outriders, but you can also use WebSockets or, or SignalR. So now player Y is only registering in your backend that it's waiting on messages. Then if you send a message from X to Y, your backend receives that message, process, it's processing it right away and sending it immediately to Y. So Y receives message almost immediately without putting too much load on your database. Okay, we've covered signaling. So now it's time for cross-platform uh, friends. But it's, it seems easy at first glance, but it's, it's really more complicated than it seems. So, again, let's imagine the scenario of two platforms, right? Players X and Y on different platforms, on platform A and B. Traditionally, you can have in-game friends from within only the platform you are playing on. So, player X can only be friends with player Z, and player Y can only be friends with player W. Mm, how we can change that? The obvious solution would be to add the centralized database where you store the uh, friends from the other platform. And to make things simpler, you just uh, store every friend in your database and only sync those from, from uh, respective platforms. 
Okay, but but uh, what actually to store in that database? Can you store personal data? Probably you can't because there are platform policies, uh, there are G GDPR laws, etc. Can you store platform's internal ID? Yeah, you can, but most often you can't display it. It doesn't make any sense to players, and it's internal for a reason. So it's, it's hard for you to identify offline players that aren't playing your game. Can you store the display ID? In theory, you can, but players have rights to change it, right? So you would need to somehow detect that the player on the other platform has changed the display ID while your game was down and update it somehow. So for outwriters, we stored internal ID of the platforms, but we shown only online players in terms they were playing our, our game. This, this let us ask uh, the game on the other side to provide us the correct display ID. I think the hybrid of storing internal ID and display ID could also work, but then you would need to somehow reliably update this information and then show it to players. Okay, so that's basically cross-platform friends. Matchmaking. Matchmaking is pretty obvious, but there's one problem. You can't plan to use platform owners matchmaking, so, because it won't work across the boundaries, right? So, there are a few external providers you could use. We used PlayFab, but there are others. What else? I'd recommend you to implement join codes if you plan to have crossplay. Uh, the, the, the idea is simple. Um, you're just basically generating a code on the back end. This code is uh, associated with your internal ID and player receives that code. When player uh, sends that code with other means, for example, text or email or something to the other side, then the person on the other side can use that code to identify you and the system can uh, associate you both together as friends. Uh, there's always this trade-off or of the, the length of the join code versus uh, the expiration time, so I would recommend to keep the join codes short because uh, the, longer short, uh, the longer codes, the, the less useful they are uh, and people will, won't use them if they are pretty long. And last but not least, the voice chat. Uh, um, you can't rely on platform systems, so you can't say, um, hey, we recommend you to, to use just platforms voice chat because players expect uh, voice chat to work as long as they're in the same party. So, uh, and implementing the voice chat yourself is extremely uh, complicated because of the CVAA Act uh, of US law uh, that requires you to uh, provide speech to text transcription in, uh, if you have voice chat implemented. Uh, it's, extre it's extremely complicated to implement the speech to text transition, so again, I would recommend to pick something, pick something out there. Mm. I would recommend to use PlayFab or Vivox. You could use Epic Online Services, but unfortunately, as, as of today, Epic doesn't have uh, mm, speech to text transcription. So if you used Epic Online Services, you would need to hook you, yourself to speech to text in order to pass this law. Okay, that concludes the technological layer. Now we can move to the favorite thing of all the developers, certification. So how does multi-platform certification look like? There is a point in time when you think your game is good enough to be certified, right? You're sending this version to platform A as a RC0 candidate, and you are doing the same with platform B, right? Uh, and depending on certification windows, both of those certifications might happen in parallel. Certification teams will try to break your game, 
and platform A couldn't break your game. So this is a success. So far, so good. But things get interesting when platform B feedback is fail, and you can't convince them otherwise. You, you need to implement the feedback no matter what. So you are implementing the feedback. You have platform B's RC1. You are res rescheduling the certification. After the certification says it's success, uh, you think you can ship the game, right? Yeah, not so fast. Let's first test if the platform B uh, gold is compatible with platform A gold build. And it turns out that it, it isn't compatible because you implemented some feature or, or some feedback and now those two can't talk to each other. Okay, now what? You could redo the process for A. You could re-implement all those changes for you did for platform B and platform A and hope that it will regain the compatibility. But the certification windows are often busy and you will have a deadline. And when you redo the process for A, so you re-implement those changes, you need to recertify again, right? right? And even if you think that you can squeeze in and uh, certify those changes for those two platforms, it's, it's unrealistic to think that uh, the things will go so smoothly across, for example, I don't know, seven platforms or something, whatever number you will pick. So it is not a sustainable solution. So what to do then? You need to somehow manage the compatibility of your builds. Basically, your game needs to know if it can talk to the version um, on, the other, uh, on the other platform, right? But you can't hard code that information because you only learn that A is incompatible with B after A was certified. Yeah, so basically you can't keep a list of comp compatible versions in the build. So you need another feature. Uh, we used something we called matchmaking buckets, but with time it gained value, so we renamed it to compatibility buckets. Um, generally, the idea is that during login, uh, getting your build ID, you are getting uh, your bucket name from the backend. Uh, and your game can, talk, can only talk to games with, in the same uh, compati uh, compatibility bucket, and that includes join codes, matchmaking, etc. With that, we could keep, for example, A and B platform in one compatibility, compatibility bucket and C and D in the second compatibility bucket, and after we, we updated C and D, we could put them back together uh, without too much of a hassle. Okay. So basically that concludes my talk. So uh, please pay attention right now because uh, I know that some of those things might, left, might be soon left from your head, but I would like you to remember those few things. This is a list of my recommendations for you if you want to implement crossplay. Uh, cross Plan the feature early. Don't do our mistakes to add platform on the last mile, right? It's, it's very hard. It might change your design and flip the table, so please don't do it. This is a pretty obvious mantra, but, but it seems like mm, you needed to know the platform set early because platforms seems like similar, but they really aren't, especially in the matchmaking, uh, connectivity, friends area. You need to work with the design and platform vendors early in, on, in order to get the, uh, the acceptable design. You, you probably don't have the gravity to convince platforms to do differently. If they think that if they have some different plan uh, with the crossplay feature, they might just not allow it for you. And negotiating deals, it's hard. So, Pick a provider for a feature whether, wherever it's possible. Implementing cross-platform features is very hard, so if there's something available, use it, but first, verify it. Just 
just because someone advertises the feature is cross-platform, it doesn't mean it fulfills all the, um, all the laws and policies you are required to fulfill. So, and ultimately you are responsible for, for your product. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And we're hiring, by the way, so if you are interested, please go here and give us a shout. And we have some, probably, some time for Q&A. No questions? Go back, right? Might take time. <laughs> Probably not the way to go. Okay. You can ask your question right now if you want. Okay. Uh, so, can you repeat the question? Because I. Uh, 